turned around as soon as I heard the noise. There, standing behind me, was a... a thing. About my height, with a face that was almost human, but was covered with hair. There were two giant claws with blood on them. I started backing away, but my foot caught in the vine and I went down. The thing came at me and I thought, Shane, you should have started believing in ghosts before it was too late. The New Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. Michael Shane, reckless, red-headed Irishman, is back again in his old haunts in New Orleans. This is your director, Bill Russo, inviting you to listen to another transcribed episode, which we call The Case of the Bayou Monster. Yes, sir? Oh, my name's Shane. I'm supposed to meet a Mrs. Forsythe here. Oh, yes, sir. Mrs. Forsythe is waiting for you over at that table. That's Mrs. Forsythe? Yes, sir. Hmm. Thanks. Hello. Michael Shane? Mm-hmm. Please sit down. I'm Amy Forsythe. Yeah, I know. Pleasant surprise. Hmm? I guess I was expecting someone older. Oh? Look, I don't quite understand why you wanted me to meet you here. I usually transact my business in my office. Yes, of course. Mr. Shane, I'm hiring you for an indefinite period. You're, you're hiring me? Look, Mrs. Forsyth, people usually tell me what they want me to do, and then I decide whether I take the job or not. Well, I'm sure you'll take it. You are? You sound like you were used to getting your own way. Mr. Shane, the Forsyths have been getting their own way for something like 200 years. Three cheers for the Forsyths. That's what's made us so powerful and so decadent. It's very interesting, but as an unpowerful, undecadent Shane, I still haven't heard any reason for you to be so sure you're hiring me. Fifty dollars a day, Mr. Shane. You're hiring me. That's better. Family plays bon chance is out in the bayou country. Bon chance? That means good luck. Yes. My great-great-grandfather had a very ironic sense of humor. The place has been atrociously bad luck for at least one member of each generation. Oh? But that's beside the point. What I want you to do, Mr. Shane, is come out to Bonchance. Stay there until you've found something or someone for me and remove it. Something or, or someone? I don't get it, Mrs. Forsyth. That's not surprising. Because what I want you to find and remove is a ghost, Mr. Shane. A ghost. <laughs> I've gotten a lot of strange assignments in my time. But when Mrs. Amy Forsythe hired me to run down a ghost at the ancestral mansion Bon Chance back in the swamp country, I set some kind of record for myself. Amy was sort of a strange girl. At first, you thought she was very pretty. But then you began to notice little things about her that weren't. Her mouth, for instance, cruel. Her nose a little too thin. Her eyes might have been just a shade farther apart. Yeah, she looked like the last of an old family on its way out. But that 50 a day she offered me spelled lots of good times for one Michael Shane, so I took the job. I was to drive to the landing and meet a boatman who'd take me to Bonchance that afternoon. But before I left, I dropped in to see Police Inspector Lefebvre. Hello, Shane. So what do I owe this, uh... uh honor's the word, Inspector. Honor. Oh, I, uh, just dropped by to tell you there aren't any dead bodies in my office today, Lefebvre. Well, things are slack all over. And to tell you I'm going ghost hunting. Come again? <laughs> no kidding. I've been hired to find a ghost at a place called Bon Chance back in the swamps. Shane, you're a nice boy. Why, Inspector? I wouldn't want to see anything happen to you. Huh? So why don't you just stay away from Bon Chance? Bon Chance? Yeah. Hey, look, what is this, Lefebvre? Don't tell me you believe in ghosts. No, I don't believe in ghosts, Shane. I've lived around this part of the country all my life. Been in the force here in New Orleans 17 years. I've seen a lot of strange things happen, but I don't believe in ghosts. And why all of... The whole Forsyth clan is a jinx outfit from way back. Jinx? What do you mean? Something happens in every generation. Something bad. You know, Inspector, the more you talk, the more interested I'm getting in this new job of mine. I'll send you a full report. Okay, Shane. Okay. I just hope you'll be alive to sign it. Yeah, that's my friend, Inspector Lefevre. Always there with a reassuring word. 
Well, three hours later, a little after sunset, I drove up to the landing where I was to meet the boatman who'd take me to Bonchance. He turned out to be a Cajun named Akil, a thin fellow with a long mustache. I got him a pirogue, a long, narrow boat, and Akil shoved off. He sent the boat skimming along at an amazing clip. And pretty soon, we were deep into the bayou. A pale moon wasn't doing a very good job of piercing the misty haze that hung over the swamp. What with the matted trees and vines overhead, it was like a tunnel. A noisy tunnel at that. Sounded like the soundtrack to a jungle movie. Uh, you've been with the Forsyth family long, Akil? Me. I worked for them long time, since little children. Oh? You ever hear anything about a ghost at Bonchance? Yes. It's Luke Garou here. Luke Garou? You call him werewolf, hmm? A werewolf? <laughs> Look, you don't actually believe what... Did you ever see this werewolf? I think, yes. What? It's a long time ago. Little boy me in Bayou. You actually saw it? I seen this thing. Tall with hair on face, long claws. I know it will get good look. My teeth start to chatter. I run like wind. Yeah, but how... I tell Mama Cecile what I seen. She say it's Luke Garuhi. Well, who's Mama Cecile? Old one who live in swamp, she. Hmm. Uh, we almost there? Yes. It's bon chance up ahead. See? Yeah. I see it. There it was, rearing up out of the swamp ahead of us. A rotting, gloomy mansion that sagged a little here and there, as if the ground below it was slowly sinking into the swamp. The whole place looked like an unburied corpse, and there was a smell of decay in the air. We tied up at the landing, and a servant waiting with a torch took me up to the house. The little breeze that had come up was pushing the flame back and forth, and in the flickering light, the whole place looked like something you might dream about after eating too much lobster. Amy Forsyth, two men, and a giant hound dog were waiting for me in the library. Quiet, dear. Quiet! Mr. Shane, I'd like you to meet my uncle, Edward Forsyth. Mr. Forsyth? How do you do, Mr. Shane? And this is my husband, Paul Forsyth. Mr. Forsyth again. Hello. And this is Dirk, my dog. Yeah. I thought it was a Shetland pony at first. <laughs> Dirk's been with the Forsyth since he was a pup. Lately, I've kept him with me. You know, I've made quite a discovery. Everybody around here seems to be named Forsyth. Amy and I are sort of third cousins, twice removed, I believe. Any more questions, Mr. Shane? Questions? Or am I free to go now? Huh? Paul, please. Yes, by all means, Paul. We mustn't upset dear Amy. That will be enough, Uncle Edward. We must wait here quietly, Paul, until Mr. Shane has finished questioning us. Then perhaps he will be kind enough to dismiss us. Hey, look, I'm afraid I don't get any of this. I what? must apologize for my husband and my uncle, Mr. Shane, for their lack of cordiality. That's one way of putting it. You see, I've told them why you're here, and they're not in sympathy with the purpose of your visit. Oh? There are some things, Mr. Shane, which are better left untouched. Uncle Edward feels this comes under the heading of skeletons in the family closet. I see. But he'll do nothing to hinder your investigation, will you, Uncle Edward? No, of course not, dear niece Amy. Anything you say. Don't you find this a refreshing change, Mr. Shane? The uncle obeying the niece? Well, I hadn't really thought much about it. Amazing what a difference money makes, isn't it? Money? Edward. Yes. You see, my dear niece controls the purse strings for what is left of us Forsyths. Something like half a million, isn't it, Amy? Her thoughtful father arranged it that way. Edward! Amy has been kind enough to put me on an allowance. So you see, I must always yield to her wishes. Unless I want the allowance cut off. I hardly think Mr. Shane is interested in our financial affairs. On the contrary, Amy, Mr. Shane has cause to be very interested. What do you mean? Why, uh, Amy may be kind enough to put you on an allowance, too. So I merely wanted to point out the danger of, uh, crossing her. Otherwise, she might... Well, uh, Paul, remember that time you decided to go on a spree in New Orleans? You were gone a week? Amy cut off your allowance for a month. Yes, I remember. Stop it! Shut up! Both of you. Mr. Shane, you will kindly ignore everything that's been said. Again, I apologize for my charming family. Uh, maybe we just better sort of start all over. Yes, as I say, Uncle Edward will not hinder your investigation. I'm sure Paul will not either. No, of course not. Although I do think it's a shame. What is? Spoiling a family legend like this. Paul is spending his abundant spare time these days writing a history of the Forsyth family, Mr. Shane. Quite a scholarly picture it is, too, is wading through the bales of family papers and records he's unearthed. Yes, he makes quite a figure of an author, doesn't he? See how he stands majestically by the fireplace, pipe in hand? That's his favorite pose nowadays. Thanks. Uh, 
Have you come across any mention of this ghost in your research, Mr. Forsythe? The Bon Chance werewolf? Oh, of course, Mr. Shane. According to the legend, he, or it, has made an appearance at least once each generation. It makes a fascinating story. That's why I'm sorry you're going to spoil it. You think there's nothing to it, huh? I think the people living in the bayou around here feel it their duty to keep the legend alive. So one of them faithfully reports seeing the werewolf every 15 years or so. Oh, your boatman, Akil, told me he thought he saw it years ago. Oh, of course. Akil has been with the family all his life. He feels it his duty to help keep the story going. If it's just a legend, Paul, perhaps with your brilliant mind you can explain the moaning we've been hearing lately. Moaning? Yes, Mr. Shane. An uncanny moan which seems to float through the house some nights. According to what everyone says, it's the werewolf moaning. Very simple, my dear. It could be that horrible animal of yours. You mean Dirk here? Is that what you think, Edward? It's entirely possible, Mr. Shane. Dreadful beast. Well, it's late, and I, for one, am going to bed. Good night, sweet relatives, and good night to you, Mr. Shane. Pleasant dreams. We all went to our respective rooms after that, and I turned in. I lay awake a few minutes thinking about what a charming little family I'd stumbled into. Amy, her husband Paul, and her uncle Edward. After a while, I guess I drifted off to sleep. Of course, I started dreaming. Of course, the dream was about the will. I dreamt he was here in the room with me, and I could hear him moaning. Then he came at me. I woke up on the floor in a cold sweat. Then I started sweating harder because I could still hear that moan. I pounded downstairs. The moan was everywhere in the house. Amy came running downstairs right behind me. Then we heard it from outside, the dog. We both ran out and down the path. The breeze was still swelling the mist around. And we stopped. There in the pale moonlight lay Amy's giant hound, Dirk. Dirk! Holy... Mr. Shane, look. Look at Dirk. Look. Yeah. His throat torn open as if by giant claws. In a moment, we'll return to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the Bayou Monster. It all started when Amy Forsythe hired me to come out to Bonchance, the ancestral mansion back in the bayous, and run down a supposed werewolf that had been haunting the place for a couple of hundred years. Of course, I was pretty unconvinced. Inspector Lefebvre's warning to stay away didn't register. But later that night, after I'd heard a very uncanny moaning, and after Amy and I had discovered her dog with his throat ripped open as if by claws, I wasn't so sure. The next morning, I remembered the boatman Akil telling me about Mama Cecile, the old woman who lived in the bayou. So I went to see her. It was a little shack almost hidden by moss and vines, and as I came up to it, I saw someone slipping away into the undergrowth. Akil! Akil! You... you call Rachid? Yeah. What are you doing here? Me, I come to visit Mama Cecile. Why? Now, Why? To tell her about Loup Garou, werewolf. What about it? Killed dog last night. He moaned like thousand devils. He, I hear I see dog dead. Me, I come to tell Mama Cecile. I tell her. Why'd you tell her? Mama Cecile, she always say, when werewolf around, come tell Mama Cecile. Okay, Akil, I'll talk to you later. I let go of him. He melted away into the bayou. I went over to the hut and knocked on the door. There was a grunt from inside, which I took for come in, so I pushed open the door. Inside, it was dark and smoky. But after my eyes got used to it, I could make out a woman sitting in front of a small fire. She could have been 60 or 90, with a withered face that still showed plenty of power. She had the longest fingernails I've ever seen. What do you want with Mama, Cecile? I want to talk to you about the werewolf. I know nothing... About werewolves. Come on, a kid told me you always wanted to know when anyone had seen it. Why? It's avenging spirit of my family. What, the werewolf? Yes. Now look, Mama Cecilia. Yes. Many, many years ago, before my great, great grandpapa was born, this land here was ours. Our family. Huh? 
old foresight man, steal it from us. Avenging spirit of us is werewolf. He killed one foresight each generation. Well, you don't expect me to... Buy. Last of foresight, now leave it. All souls. One day land will be mine. My last of my people. For years I live here in Bayou. I wait. Land will be mine soon. I wait. I somehow got the idea Mama Cecile meant exactly what she said. And the picture of that woman sitting in our hut just waiting for 50 years or so chilled me a little. I went back to Bonchance. Amy and her husband were in the library. She was squirming nervously in a chair, and he was in his favorite pose by the fireplace. And both of them looked slightly green around the gills. Mr. Shane, what do you propose to do about this horrible thing? Well, I'm not quite sure yet. But you've got to do something. We can't go on like this. Yeah, I know. Paul, you're sort of a family historian. There's an old woman back in the bayou named... Mama uh, Cecile. Yeah, yeah. She claims the first of the Forsyth sort of stole the land around here from her family. What? As a matter of fact, she's probably quite right. What, Paul, what Yes, you... I found an entry in old Josiah Forsyth's journal something over a hundred years ago. He practically admits it. Well, nice to know your ancestors were thieves. My dear, couldn't you tell? This is no time for your feeble attempts at humor, Paul. Mr. Shane. Now, uh, where's uh, Edward this morning? My dear uncle informed us the occurrence last night was more than his delicate nerves could stand. He said he was going to stay in New Orleans a couple of days. I see. Well, look, I'm going to wander around here a little today, just sort of looking around. I'll be back around sunset. Well, I should think so, Mr. Shane. Not one moment later. I wandered around the back country most of the afternoon. And then just about sundown, when I was walking through some pretty slushy ground on my way back to Bonchance, I spotted a rowboat a little way offshore among some trees. There was a guy sitting in that boat who looked awfully familiar. As soon as he saw me, he rode over to where I was standing. Hello, Shane. Well, well, Inspector Lefevre, what are you doing around here? Fishing? Yeah, sure. See? Just caught it. Some fish. Any smaller, you'd have to hold it with tweezers. The big ones haven't started biting yet. Look, Lefevre, if you had a whale in that boat, you couldn't convince me you came clear out here just to fish. Unless it was to fish for the bon chance werewolf. Still hunting ghosts, eh, Shane? It wasn't a ghost that tore that dog's throat open last night, or maybe you haven't heard about that. Yeah. Shane, like I told you before, you're monkeying with stuff that could backfire. A lot of things could happen to you in this bayou, all of them bad. Is this a word to the wise day for you, Inspector? You can call it that. Why don't you stick to something safe? Fishing, for instance. Like me. Sure. Like you. Look... When you're fishing, if you hook one that's too big for you, you can always break your line and let him go. Meaning I might not be able to, huh? Meaning fishing's a nice, safe sport. I'll tell you what. I'll sleep on it, Lefevre. Yeah, well, you do that. Just one thing, though. What's that? Be sure you wake up. I left Lefevre baiting a hook and went back to Bon Chance. Dinner that night was real jolly. Amy and Paul were about as cheerful as people in a dentist's waiting room. They spent most of the meal saying nasty things to each other and tossed in a few choice remarks about the absent Uncle Edward. We all turned in early, and I must have fallen asleep right away. But not for long. Suddenly, I was wide awake. Everything was very quiet, except for a faint noise downstairs. I slipped out of bed and reached for the light switch. No lights. I opened the door softly and eased into the hall. Amy's door was open, and even in the darkness, I could see her bed was unoccupied. Paul's door was open, too, and his bed was empty. I went downstairs as quietly as I could, and I heard that faint noise again, like somebody bumping into some furniture. It came from the library. I got to the door and stopped. I could see the dim outline of something coming toward me. I held my breath and waited. All right, just stay where you are now. Relax, relax. Inspector Lefebvre, I thought you were fishing. At this time of night? Don't be silly. Nobody home, huh? I don't know. The room's got empty all of a sudden. What's the matter with the lights? You got any other questions I can't answer? Uh, Look, there there should be some candles over on this table near the fireplace. Yeah, yeah, here's one. You got a match? Yeah. Yeah, that's better. Hey, hey, listen. What's that? A fever, that's the moan they say the werewolf makes. What? That sounds way too close for comfort. 
Hey, what's the big idea of blowing out the candle, Lefebvre? I didn't blow it out. Well, something did. You feel a draft or something? Well, a breeze was starting to blow up when I got here. Maybe the walls leak. Funny man. Oh, there's a damper on the fireplace somewhere. If I just... Oh, here it is. What happened to the moon? Well, what do you know? Here, light, light the candle again. Keep it away from the fireplace. Now, look. This damper on the side of the fireplace, I'll turn it like it was before. Yeah. When the damper's in that position and the breeze is blowing from a certain direction, the air passing through the narrow part of the chimney makes that wailing sound. That's your werewolf's moan. It's not my werewolf, Shane. So what does all this prove? A couple of things. Right now, we better find Amy and Paul in a hurry. All right. You take one direction from the house, I'll take the other. Okay. And if you find anything, yell. I will, Lefebvre. Believe me. I started out. In a couple of minutes, I was out of sight of the house. It was pretty sloshy going along here, and I had to take it slow. Every now and then, a damp hanging vine would slap me across the face. A couple of times, I slipped and went down. And then up ahead of me, I heard it. It was Amy. She was in a bad way. I tried to run. Finally, I managed to get onto drier ground. There was a faint trail in front of me, and I pounded along it. I rounded a bend, hurdled a fallen tree, and then I stopped. It wasn't a pretty sight. Amy was lying on the ground in front of me. And her throat looked like her dog's throat had looked. But Amy couldn't feel it anymore. She was dead. In a moment, we'll be back with a thrilling climax to tonight's Michael Shane adventure. I stood, looking down at Amy, lying there dead, hoping I'd never see a sight like that again. Then I heard a noise. I turned around. There, standing behind me, was a... a thing. About my height, with a face that was almost human, but was covered with hair. And there were two giant claws, and there was blood on them. I started backing away, but my foot caught in the vine, and I went down. The thing came at me, and I thought, Shane, you should have started believing in ghosts before it was too late. Then the thing dove at me, and one of those claws came whistling through the air at my throat. I got my arm up just in time, and the claw bit into my shoulder. Then I realized it was an iron claw. I got one fist loose and popped it into the thing's face a couple of times. Then I got both hands around its throat and squeezed. The other claw was coming down at me closer and closer. I, I squeezed harder, and then suddenly, suddenly the monster went limp. I... I pushed him off me. He was just getting slowly to my feet when the fever pounded up. You all right, Shane? Yeah. I guess so. Can't say as much for my friend here. He a big enough fish for you? Yeah. I used to dream about things that looked like that when I was a kid. I never thought I'd see one. Yeah, well, this one's human. That's a mask, and those are iron claws. Yeah. Pull the mask off him. Yeah. Well... You know him? Yeah. Yeah, I know him. It's Amy's husband, Paul Forsyth. Yeah, Paul Forsyth. This generation's edition of the Bon Chance Werewolf. An edition that Inspector Lefebvre promptly put out of circulation. I was happy to let him take over. Then later, Lefevre and I left Bonchance and started for home in his rowboat. And I, having lost the toss, was rowing. Some boy, Paul Forsythe, huh? Yeah. He told me he kept those props of his, the mask and the claws, hidden out in the bayou. Wonder how I got a hold of him in the first place. I think I know the answer to that. Paul spent a lot of time digging through old family papers. He was going to write a history of the family. Probably came across the secret there, where the mask and claws were hidden, how to work the damper on the chimney. Uh, that's probably it. I guess one member of each generation knew about the mask and claws. Probably used to put them on now and then to scare all the bio people. You know, Shane, the foresight certainly must have been a pleasant lot. Yeah. That'd be their idea of a joke, I guess. Only Paul decided to revive the legend for more practical purposes. He fill you in on the motive? Yeah. Money? Mostly. He would have gotten control of the half million Amy had. Add to that, he had a girl in New Orleans. Add to that, he hated Amy. That's funny. What's that? 
Oh, just that the legend of the Bonchance werewolf's been going on for over a hundred years. All there really was behind the legend was a mask, a pair of iron claws, and a howling chimney. And the fact that most of the people around here believed in it. Don't forget that. Yeah, I guess you're right. Well, I can see how you can get believing almost anything out in this bayou. I'll be glad to see the last of it. It gives me the creeps. Shh. What? Stop rowing. What's the matter? Shh. Hey, what are you reaching for, you gun? Now, now, look at the big one. Big what? Fish. I'm going to hook him. All the fever. Quiet, Shane. I told you I came out here to fish, didn't I? This is your director, Bill Russo, again. Our story is based on characters created by Brett Halliday and is written by Bob Reif. The music is composed and conducted by John Duffy. And Michael Shane is portrayed by Jeff Chandler. The New Adventures of Michael Shane is a Don W. Sharp production transcribed in Hollywood and distributed exclusively by the Broadcasters Guild. Yes, of course. Tell him no speak English. Will you be quiet? I will take no college stuff, and that's final. Oh, Mr. Shane says he'll be delighted to take the case. The Hastings Manufacturing Company and the Kayside Corporation present Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. <laughs> A detective without a murder case is like flapjacks without syrup. Yet, that is just the predicament of our friend Michael Shane. In fact, things are so dull that we find Michael and his blonde assistant, Phyllis Knight, not at the office, not at police headquarters, not at the morgue, but squirming uncomfortably in the seat of higher learning. In other words, the office of the president of Huxley College. Professor Brill is explaining the situation to our friends. Thanks, Mr. Shane. I decided to ask for your help because Phyllis Knight graduated from Huxley and is now, as I understand it, your uh, amanuensis. My... Oh, no, Professor. She's just my secretary. Amanuensis means secretary, my pet. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> yes, you're not quite so. You see, Mr. Shane, we don't want to take our problem to the town police. Uh, unfavorable publicity, you know. But something must be done about it immediately. It's affecting the morale of our girls. The girls? I thought this place was co-educational. It is, Mr. Shane. But our feminine students seem to be more affected by it. Oh, a bad rash of Frank Sinatra? Oh, no, no. That is no more than usual. <laughs> You'll understand after talking with the uh, victims. I have two of them waiting on the outer office. Uh, just a moment, please. <clears throat> oh, Miss Brown, uh, you stepping in. Yes, Professor. Uh, very good. Just step right in here, Miss Brown. <laughs> <laughs> this is Mr. Shane, Miss Brown. <laughs> How do you do? Hello. And Miss Knight, and Mr. Shane's associate and one of our former alumni. How do you do, Miss Brown? I should explain, Miss Brown, that Mr. Shane is a private investigator whom we have employed to solve the uh, embarrassments which have been occurring here recently. Uh, now, if you'll just uh, repeat your story. Uh, well, if, if you say so, Professor Brill, uh, it's a little embarrassing. Oh, well, go right ahead, Miss Brown. Oh, well, it... It happened last Monday night. I was in my room in the sorority, getting ready for bed. I was getting into bed when I heard a sound, like somebody giggling. Mm. And uh, a nickel, maybe? Oh, no, sir. More like a mad laugh. It came from the window. It was open, but there was a screen. Somebody was trying to pry it off. And then? <laughs> I screamed. That's the usual procedure, I believe. Uh, go on, Miss Brown. Well, he ran away. That's all. Do I understand, Professor Brill, that you brought us all the way down here just because of some peeping Tom? No, 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 no. You don't appreciate the situation, Mr. Shane. In the past week, I've had at least a dozen complaints similar to Miss Brown's. Oh, my. It's gotten so our girls never know when they're safe. Well, I don't think that's peculiar to Huxley College, Professor. Oh, really? Uh oh. 
Oh, yes, I see. Well, uh, Mr. Shane, I think you should hear the newest turn of events. Uh, Miss Brown, will you ask uh, Quincy Baldwin to step in here? It's all right if I lead, Professor? Oh, yes, of course, and thank you very much. Goodbye, Mr. Shane. Miss Knight, bye. Goodbye. Until last night, Mr. Shane, none of the boys had been involved. But now, uh, well, I'll let Quincy tell you. Oh, well, come right in, Quincy. Oh, thanks, sir. Hmm. Tall, blonde, and rugged. Uh, Mr. Shane, this is Quincy Baldwin, another of our students. Our most uh, brilliant student, I might say. Oh, well, I'm glad to meet you. How do you do, sir? And Miss Knight. Charmed, Miss Knight. Thank you. Quincy, Mr. Shane would like you to tell him your unfortunate experience of last night. Oh. Well, Mr. Shane, about 10 o'clock last night, I was coming home from a lecture. And about a block from my fraternity, a masked man jumped out from behind a hedge and... and yes? Well, he caught me on the head. I see. Just a friendly gesture or some sort of college hazy? Hardly, sir. The man had a gun. Oh. Um, any way for you to recognize him again? Oh, no, sir. He got away. I should add, Mr. Shane, that this individual has been sending anonymous notes to my office. He boasts of his activities and promises more serious things to come. Now, believe me, sir, if it doesn't stop soon, a mass hysteria will break out among the student body. I hope you catch him, sir. I'm willing to do anything I can to help. Yes, that's an idea, Quincy. Perhaps you should go along with Mr. Shane. You can acquaint him with the campus and all our activities. Be glad to, sir. Well, uh, for this afternoon, I'd like to work alone. If this peeping Tom performs only at night, well, uh, suppose Quincy, you meet us, say, about uh, 9 or 9.30. Well, um, could you make it 10, sir? Hmm? I, I have to attend a lecture tonight, and it's on the kinetic principles and thermal diffusion. Really? I was trying that sometime. Uh, mm, yes, yeah. Okay, okay, make it 10 o'clock. Uh, where will we meet? Well, at the clock tower. Uh, meanwhile, maybe this afternoon, Quincy can show me around. Huh? You know, bring me up to date on things. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, sugar. I'll want you. We've got to check those uh, anonymous notes. You said you wanted to work alone. I've changed my mind, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Tower clock is five minutes slow, according to my watch. Mm -hmm. Our good-looking friend should be here now. Oh, good-looking bookend, if you ask me. Oh, yeah. And since when do you go for blonde guys with curly hair? Will you look who's talking? You spent plenty of time wandering around the girls' gym this afternoon. Research, honey, research. <laughs> and it looks to me like this particular seat of learning has got quite a spread, baby. You know what I mean? I'll get it. Hey, here comes our blonde menace right now. Oh, hello there. Hello. Uh, sorry to be late. The lecture was wonderful. I wish you could have heard the professor on the separation of the isotopes. Oh, no. Have they separated again? Oh, yes, yes, yes. All over town. Mrs. Isotope couldn't stand his drinking. Oh, well, I know it was causing talk. <laughs> well, anyway, it was a good lecture. <laughs> you know, with all your enthusiasm, Quincy, I suspect there's a cute redhead at the desk in front of you. Oh, no, no, no. The feminine element doesn't fit into my program. Oh, really? Look, I, I may seem a little over-enthusiastic, but you see, my father used to teach here at Huxley. Psychology. So erudition is probably bred into the corpuscles, you might say. Well, guys have been shot for saying less. Well... <clears throat> Suppose we get started, huh? The uh, sorority houses are on Elm Street, aren't they? Yes, the street here to our right. Oh, uh, I'm blamed if I know where we start. Just ambling down sorority row, waiting for some gal to yelp isn't my idea of an investigation. Have you checked on the notes this individual has been writing? Yeah. Yeah, I did that this afternoon. The guy printed them with a pen. No dice. You know, this place hasn't changed a bit. Street's quiet as a grave at 10 o'clock. Um... May I make a suggestion, Mr. Shane? Yeah, shoot. Well, it might look better if you and Miss Knight were alone for a while. If you were to get in your car and park under a tree and... Well, you follow my train of thought. <laughs> well, I think I caught the uh, caboose, at least. In basic English, you mean smooching. <laughs> you know, you're improving, Quincy. That's the first sane idea we've had. Please. Oh, Mr. Shane. <laughs> Wait a minute. Uh, Mr. Shane. Isn't that Professor Brill? Yes, and running, too. Uh, oh, Mr. Shane, I... Oh, I, I, I thought I might miss you. Something terrible has happened. Just terrible. Yeah, what? At the sorority, one of the girls, her uh, husband murdered. Oh, 
what a dreadful, dreadful thing to happen. Mm-hmm. Dead about a half an hour. And a very neat job of strangling. What? What's that wand around her throat, Michael? Well, it looks like... Yeah, yeah, it is. The laces from a football. A football? Who found her? I did. You're one of the students living here? Yes. Jean Winters. I came to ask Agnes for my sewing kit. I forgot it when I moved out. You see, we lived together and... I couldn't stand it any longer. Oh? What was wrong? I'll tell you, Mr. Shane. As house mother of this sorority, I owe a duty to my other girls. I made Jean move to another room before she and Agnes drove the rest of us insane. Please, Mrs. Fuller. They were fighting always. Yesterday I caught them in here pulling hair and smashing things. Oh, boy trouble out there. I told Agnes I went out with Gil only once. Is that why Agnes slammed the door in Gil's face this afternoon? I saw that myself. Hey, wait, hold it. Who's, uh, Gil? Gil Packard, Mr. Shane. He's our star halfback and my roommate. He was Agnes's boyfriend. Tight little corporation, this. Mrs. Mrs. Fuller... During the past hour, did anybody hear any unusual sounds from this room? No, it's been very peaceful since yesterday. Oh, oh. Then the killer probably was somebody Agnes knew. That uh, window over there, any way of reaching it from the outside? No, there's a little porch. I suppose somebody could climb up it. But if you ask me, Mr. Shane, I think you won't have to look outside this room for the murderer. If you're talking about me, Mrs. Fuller, I'll tell you to my room. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. If you ladies don't mind, I'll run this circus. Michael, listen. Yeah. Outside that window. I'll see if I can get a look at him. Stop where you are. Who is it, Michael? Oh, darn it. He got away. I just saw his back. But, Mr. Shane, aren't you going after him? No, no, it's useless. He's got too much of a head start. Anyway, I got a hunch he's not the man we want. Dollars to donuts. It was the peeping Tom. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Well, children, I think that's all here for the while. Oh, say, Quincy, huh? have you any idea where I might find Gil Packard at the moment? Well, surely. He has to be in his room by 9 o'clock every night. He's in training. Okay, then let's take off. Our room is right down the hall here. Fine. I don't know your purpose, Mr. Shane, but I can tell you Gil has nothing to do with this affair. I didn't say he had, Quincy. I'd just like to get a list of Agnes's possible enemies. I can't rely too much on Miss Jean Winters. You might also check on the spat between Gil and Agnes. Uh, this is our room. Oh. Oh, hello, Quincy. Gil, this is Mr. Shane and Miss Knight. They want to see you about uh, something. Just a social call, Mr. Packard. Oh. Oh, say. You got quite a scratch on your cheek there. It's bleeding. Oh, uh, yeah. I was just changing the bandage. I got it in a scrimmage. Oh, uh, won't you have a chair, Miss? Knight. Thank you. By the way, Mr. Packard, wasn't it rather risky to break training tonight? How did you... Oh, so Agnes blabbed again, did she? Told her what would happen if the coach found out. Thinks it's so funny to make a guy jump through hoops. No. No, it wasn't Agnes, Mr. Packard. I happen to recognize the plaid coat you're wearing. I saw the back of it when you ran away from the sorority house a few minutes ago. That's how you got the scratch, isn't it? Uh, well, I, I fell off the porch. Uh, somebody yelled at me, and I, I got scared and ran. I wanted to talk to Aggie, and, well, I wasn't supposed to be out after 9 o'clock. I figured nobody would see me at her window. I'm afraid it's all my fault, Mr. Shane. I told Gil to go over there tonight and... Have it out with Agnes once and for all. Oh, that trouble over Gene Winters? No, over another guy, Red Burroughs. Aggie knows I'm crazy about her, and yet I'm... Say, what's all this pumping about anyway? Agnes has been murdered, Mr. Packard. Mur... What? She's dead? That's right. Oh, no. But it doesn't seem possible. But just this afternoon, Aggie and I... Mike, look. Under that bookcase. Mm -hmm. Now, Mr. Packard, did you go to see Agnes at any time earlier this evening? Uh, no. Can you prove it? I was with him at the lecture, Mr. Shane. Yes, and we came back here and Quince left. I sneaked out later. I see. Uh, by the way, is that your football under the bookcase there? Huh? Yes, it is. Mm-hmm. It's unlaced. Where are the strings? Well, I don't know. Was laced this afternoon. 
Michael, where are you going? It's a telephone. I think the police can take over from here. What? What do you mean? Well, for your information, Mr. Packard, Agnes Carter was strangled with a pair of football laces. Or didn't you know? Well, good morning. Oh, good morning, Mr. Shane. We'd like to see Professor Brill. Well, I think he's busy right now. He telephoned for us to come right over. Oh, then I'll tell him you're here. Uh, just a moment, please. All right. You know, Michael, I don't like this case. There's something fishy about it somewhere. Yeah. Fishy is an aquarium. It's too blame simple. Then you don't think Gil Packard did it? No. Oh, we had to arrest him. Circumstances were too strong. But, uh, you know who our man is. Who? Handsome face. That Quincy bird. What? Quiet. You can go right in. Oh, oh, thanks. Come on, baby. Ah, uh, Mr. Shane, Mr. Knight, I'm glad you could come. Quincy here's been pestering me for one solid half hour. Yes, Mr. Shane, you've got to clear Gill. He didn't do it. You know who did? Well, no, but I'm sure Gill is innocent. Why, I've roomed with him for two terms now, the most popular boy on the campus. He's a swell fella. He wouldn't do such a thing. And besides, I was with him most of the evening. But he did break training and wanted to lie about it. Oh, he was just scared. Oh, my, my, my. The whole thing is most regrettable, most regrettable. I anticipate a very unfavorable reaction among our regions and alumni. Well, Quincy, I don't see that there's much that can be done. Oh, Gil will be given a fair trial. Mr. And, uh... Shane, almost anybody could have killed Agnes. She had plenty of enemies. The girls didn't like her. The boys got two times. She had a Messalina complex. Is that bad? Psychological double talk, Michael. It means a lady wolf. Agnes oh. went for one boy after another. The minute she knew he was in love with her, she'd throw him over to show her power. Gil was just another one. Any of those boys might kill her, or one of the girls, Jean Winters, for instance. Anybody might. Uh, pardon me. Uh, Professor Brill, this special delivery letter just came. Oh, yes, yes, thank you, thank you. Oh, you need to wait. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Oh, excuse me while I see what this is. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, if uh, it's as you say, Quincy, everybody on the campus is in this. I, uh, I think I'll let the local police handle it. Uh, oh, my. Oh, this is frightful. Uh, what's wrong? Uh, Mr. Shin. Read this letter. Professor Brill, I told you you couldn't stop me, even from murder. Nobody can outwit me, least of all that wool brain detective you've hired. <clears throat> You'll be hearing from me again. Hmm. That's all. It's unsigned. Well... Now you'll believe me, Mr. Shane. Gill is innocent. Maybe not. Gill could have mailed this letter before we arrested him to make it look like the work of your peeping Tom. Well, what do you propose to do now, Mr. Shane? Uh, go home, Professor. Oh, what? Yep. Yeah, I don't feel like playing blind man's buff any longer. Eh? The local police can take over. But, Mr. Shane... I'm sorry. Perhaps I should remind you, Mr. Shane, your fee was dependent upon catching this uh, peeping Tom, who is now a murderer. That's okay, Professor. At least I can say I've been through a college. You coming through? Hmm? Oh, yes, yes. Oh, uh, oh, by the way, Professor. Uh, yes. Could you tell me who was the most popular girl on the campus? Uh, let me see. Oh, Claire Fisher won the last popularity contest. Uh, why? Oh, nothing. Nothing. Goodbye, gentlemen. Mike? Hmm? What are we stopping for? You leave something back at the hotel? Uh uh. Honey, have you seen the new Cary Grant movie? No. Well, you're going to. In fact, you're going to see it three times today. Are you kidding? I thought we were headed for the city. That's what I want everybody to think. Let's yeah. go. Come on, baby. The uh, theater's right across the street. Until nine o'clock tonight, it's you and me in the dark and cozy. <laughs> Pretty good, hmm? Pretty good. With Cary Grant. Oh, look, my dear Mr. Shane, do we have to keep walking around the same block all night? Mike, let's stop a minute. I tell you, it's going to happen. I feel it in my bones. Oh, I still say nobody's going to pull two murders two nights running. 
Besides, I just can't see how you figure a nice boy like that Quincy could yeah, possibly... you wait, sugar, you wait. If I guessed right, and I think I have, it's going to happen right across the street in that same sorority house. I see. You and the gent sat down over a cup of tea and decided it all. Hey, isn't that Quincy coming along the sidewalk? Mm-hmm. And Miss Jean Winters. Uh, carrying tennis rackets. Must have had a night game. Hello, Quincy. Oh. Oh, Mr. Shane, I thought you'd left. Well, uh, we were delayed. Just taking a last stroll around the place. Well, how are you tonight, Miss Winters? All right, thank you. Have a good game? Oh, all right. I don't like playing at night. She says she can't see the ball under the lights. I have enough trouble hitting it in the daylight. <laughs> I know what you mean. I have the same trouble. Oh? Do you play, Miss Knight? Oh, I used to a little. I don't get a chance very often now. <laughs> Come on, Prince, let's go. Uh, just a minute, Jean. Is there anything I can do, Mr. Shane? No. No, thanks. We're just uh, taking a last look at the campus. Listen, Quincy, if you're going to restring these rackets... All right, all right. Well, then, um, goodbye, Mr. Shane. Miss Knight, goodbye. Good night. Good night. All right, honey. This is it. What? Michael, are, are you in a trance, staring at the stars like that? Come on, baby. we got to get going. What? What's the matter? I think I know how Miss Claire Fisher is going to be killed if we don't get there first. There. That's Claire's room, the lighted window, third to the right. On the ground floor? Yeah. May I ask, Mr. Shane, how you knew which was her room? Or shouldn't I mention it? More research, honey. Hmm. I checked it before we left this afternoon. Now keep in the shadow of these bushes. We don't want anybody to spot us. How do you know Claire is going to be the one to be killed? Just a hunch, honey. Figuring it from his angle. Look. Look, our light just went out. Okay. Now, look. We've got to get across that stretch of lawn without being seen. Mm -hmm. If we muff this, it may be the end of Claire. You say when. All right. Now, aim for that big bush under the first window. Yeah. Then work along the building to her window. You all set? Yes. Okay, let's go. It's what? a cop. I got you covered. No funny. Shh, quiet, officer. Ah, it's almost two peeping towns. Eh? Listen, officer, please. You've got us wrong. I'm the detective, Michael Shane. Oh, yeah? He left town this afternoon. But wait a minute. You're leaving for the station right now. Michael, somebody's at Claire's window. Yes, come on. we got to get in there. Oh, no, you do Oh, but officer, look. Look, a girl's going to be killed. Oh, yeah? Ain't that interesting? Oh. Okay, you ask for it. Oh. Come on, Phil, quick. Yeah. Window. Hey, you! Come back! Now, you get that cop and come running. I'm going in this window. Oh, watch out, darling, please. All right, Quincy. Up with the hands. It's dark in here, Mr. Shane. You can't see me. But she'll feel me. Oh, why, you... Oh, you... Oh, you don't. No. No. You haven't got me yet, Mr. Shane. Oh. That's what you... Here. Here's a sample of my Sunday punch. Oh. All right, come on, open the door. Michael. Michael, are you all right? Yeah, yeah. I'll let you in. Wait a minute. Hey, what's going on here? Come on, turn on the Yes, yeah. Here we are, officer. Oh, oh. Oh, Michael, yeah. you're hurt. Oh, brother, did he give me a Swedish massage? And Claire. Oh, look. Oh, saints, you wasn't kidding me. Another murder? No, not quite. I can feel her heartbeat. Strangled. With, with what? Tennis strings, baby. Tennis strings. Uh, uh, uh. Well, officer, you'd better clamp the bracelets on Mr. Quincy Baldwin. Huxley's most brilliant student is coming, too. Yeah. Yeah, thanks to you, Mr. Shane. I am the most brilliant student. The rest are sheep, fools. Seems to me you have a rather extreme way of proving the point. The girls didn't like me. I was too brilliant. The boys were jealous of my brains, even Gil. <laughs> the beeping Tom. They reacted just as I wanted them to. 
I started it just as a game to watch the sheep react. An experiment in psychology. Experiment in murder, you mean? Ah, it was easy. And Gil was such a fish. I helped you, Mr. Shane. I even risked my neck. There was a thrill of danger. But you didn't catch me, Mr. Shane. You just blundered onto it, you stupid man. Well, hardly, Quincy. You see, you made a couple of slips. You were the only boy that the peeping Tom picked on. And then you were so helpful to us. You didn't come directly to meet us at the clock tower. You took a few minutes out to kill Agnes. Michael, how did you know you'd try to kill Claire tonight? His ego. You remember when I asked Professor Brill who was the most popular girl? Yes. Well, that was it. Gil, the most popular boy. Claire, the most popular girl. <laughs> you couldn't resist that, Quincy. <laughs> I still say you're stupid. Yeah? Well, it could be. But you'll be wearing the dunce cap, Quincy, when you sit in the gas chamber. Oh, oh what's that, honey? Another bill? No, my duck. Just a little check from Huxley College. Dr. B, remember? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Say, by the way, did you graduate from any other college? <laughs> Of course not. Are you sure? Yes. Oh, that's good. Why? Well, colleges give me an inferiority complex. That stuff about thermal diffusion and kinetic, what do you call them? <laughs> ah, that's no place for a dick. Oh, well, it's all right, Michael. I like you just the way you are. Oh, you do, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Besides, you're intelligent, and that's what counts in the long run. You wouldn't change me, hmm? Well, uh... Well, what? Well, you might take your feet off the desk. Huh? Oh. <laughs> Why, certainly, Miss Isotope. Why, thank you, Mr. Isotope. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Shane, Private Detective, stars Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. through the wind. I just held my breath and said a few appropriate words to any archangels that might be listening. I felt something bite into my neck. I thought, so long, Mike. It's been fun. The new Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. This is your director, Bill Russo, inviting you to listen to another transcribed episode with Michael Shane. That reckless, red-headed Irishman back at his old haunts in New Orleans. We call it The Case of the Hunted Bride. Michael Shane, the, the private detective. Yeah, yeah, have a chair. I'll be finished shaving in a second. Thank you. You always shave in your office? Yeah, usually. Oh, that, that's good enough. You know, it's a... What do you think about this, Razor? For years, it hummed Jeannie with the light brown hair. The last couple of days, just can't seem to carry it too. I had no intention of seeing you when I came to New Orleans. I just wanted to see the city again. Perhaps to capture some of the pleasant memories. You see, I grew up here. That's so? Yes. And I wanted to see it just once more. Before I die. Which should be sometime around 1990. Which will be tonight. What's wrong with waiting till 1990? It's, it's my husband, George. Yeah, yeah, it usually is. No, you don't understand, Mr. Shane. I love George. He's my whole life. Well, then why end it? Knowing what I do, I... I can't go on. I don't want to live. Yet, what if I'm wrong? What if none of it is true? I want you to find out the truth. 
Just what do you think is the truth, dear lady? That my husband, George, is a murderer. <laughs> In a moment, we'll return to Mike Shane and the case of the hunted bride. Her name was Grace Morris, Mrs. George Morrison to be exact. She lived in the capital city of a neighboring state and she was so madly in love with her husband she was about to drop dead. If that's that love they write those beautiful songs about, I'll stick to my electric razor. Anyway, I told her to go back home. And I'd take a run up and see her as soon as I cleared up a few things around the office. And that we'd soon find out whether her husband was a murderer or not. In either case, I was to get my usual 20 bucks a day. Lovable little me. As it turned out, I didn't arrive in her city until early the next evening. I registered in a little hotel and then I telephoned her. Phone seemed to ring forever. And just when I was about to hang up. Hello? Mrs. Morrison? Hello? Mr. Mr. Shane. Hey. Hey, what's wrong? Hey, Mrs. Morrison. Hello? Hello? Twenty minutes later, a taxi let me out in front of a small bungalow. A guy was standing on the front porch, fumbling in his coat pocket. He heard me coming and spun around. What do you want? The Morrisons live here. What if they do? Oh, I just talked to Mrs. Morrison on the phone. She sounded like she was in trouble. What is this? Another one of their tricks? Whose tricks? Come on, get this door open. I'm warning you, if you try you anything... You may be dying in there. Will you open this door? Dying? Step on it. Hey, hey what are you shaking for? Well, I, uh... Hey, hey, give me that key. They've done anything to Grace. Grace! Grace, where are you? <laughs> Wait! Yes! <laughs> We found her on the floor in the hall with the telephone receiver still in her hand. The guy who turned out to be her husband carried her to a couch. I headed for the gas heater, shut off the gas, and started opening windows. When I got back to the living room, Grace was coming out of the fire. You're going to be all right, sweetheart. You're going to be okay. You better call a doctor, Mr. Morrison. She looks okay. Call a doctor. But... But what? If we can work it without a doctor... What's the matter? Don't you trust anybody? Look, mister, I don't know who no, you are. let's not start that again. See if you got any spiritual ammonia in the house. I think we have. All right, put a spoonful in the glass of water and make it snappy. All right. I'll get it right away. Hey, Morrison, don't close the front door. We need air in here. There's plenty of air coming through the windows. I'll get the medicine now. Friendliest man in town. George. Huh. George. Why, it wasn't you. George. Just... Couldn't have been you. Huh. George. You just take it easy, Mr. Morrison. Mr. Shane. Yeah. Well, that was kind of foolish, sweetheart. What do you mean? I'm the old-fashioned type. In my book, turning on the gas is foolish. But I didn't turn on the gas. What? No. I guess I dozed off. The phone woke me up and the house was full of gas. I, I didn't realize how bad until I answered the phone and everything started blacking out. And who did turn on the gas? Uh, I don't know. You think it was your husband, don't you? I don't know. Well, I don't think so. Not the way he acted when he came in here. Oh, Mr. Shane, I don't know what to think anymore. What makes you believe he's killed anybody? I'll talk to you later. No, while he's still upstairs. No, Mr. Shane. Come on, come on. The telegrams. That's what started it. Telegrams? The first one came six months ago. George had been out of work for so long, and he was desperate. As soon as he got the telegram, he went away without saying a word came back two days later with $250. Well, that doesn't mean anything. He, he wasn't the same, George. He began having terrible nightmares. He'd wake up screaming he didn't want to kill. And that's not all that happened. Someone's Wait, trying... Sh How are you feeling now, Grace? Better, George. I don't know what happened, George. It's okay. Okay, we'll talk about it later. Here, take a drink of this. They've done this. Who's they, Morris? Huh? Oh, nothing. Come on, Grace. I'll take care of you. He carried her upstairs, and the way they looked at each other, I wanted to whip out a violin and play gypsy music. What was going on here? 
Well, I lit a cigarette and wandered through the house, trying to make sense out of what Grace had told me. Trying to understand how that fitted in with the hemstitched God bless our happy home that hung over the sofa. Then the phone started ringing. Hello? So you got home in time to save your wife. All righty, we'll try again. What? How does it feel wondering when it's going to happen? Wondering if it's going to be you or your wife. Joe Blake didn't have to wonder, did he? Joe Blake? Wait a minute. Who is this? This is Mike Shane. Now, Hello? Hello? Put the phone down, Shane. Yeah, but, but I look. said put the phone down. Sure. Some woman. She sounded like... I know how she sounded. Hey, who's Joe Blake? It's getting late, Shane. You're so subtle, Mr. Morris. Who's Joe Blake? Good night, Mr. Shane. Before I go, can I ask you one final question, Mr. Morrison? Well? Who's Joe Blake? You ask a silly question, you get a silly answer. I heard the lock click behind me. Then the lights went out inside the house. It was a cold, black night. A couple of blocks away, I saw a lighted street, and I heard a streetcar. I started walking toward it, and then... Then I stopped. Not a sound. Not a... Sound was light. Might even have been a twig falling, only twigs don't wear shoes. The sound of the streetcar was louder now, but so were the footsteps. I'm a nervous guy. I put a cigarette in my mouth and struck a match, giving him a chance to pass me. I flicked the match away and watched it make an arc of flame. Before it could complete the arc, a bigger flame exploded in my head. No! I don't know how long it lasted. It was like spending the summer in a cement mixer. The pain didn't mean anything after a while, and I stopped trying to crawl away. All right, Ralph, that's enough. I said that's enough! Suddenly, everything stopped. Then I heard a nice, friendly sound. A gun getting ready for action. Turn the flash on him, Ralph. You can see him all right, Ruthie. I want to see him better than all right. I want to watch his face when he gets it. Ruthie, somebody might see us. Go on, get it over with. I said turn the flash on him. All right, all right. They had the lights on Joey when he died. All right, now you got your light. Hey, wait. Huh? This guy ain't Morrison. No. No, he isn't. How do you like that? Now, punk! Oh! Punk! Oh! I guess eventually Ralph's foot started hurting him. Anyhow, he stopped kicking, and they left. For a long time, I lay there snuggling up to a couple of rusty garbage cans. The moth-eaten tomcat came up and stared at me for a long time, but he figured I was too big to eat, so he moved on, too. Outside of that, I was left all to myself, at peace among the melon rinds. It wasn't all wasted, though. I was beginning to fit things together. It sure looked now like husband George had killed Joe Blake. Finally, I was able to get to my feet and find a taxi and get back to my hotel. As I walked through the lobby of my hotel, somebody climbed out of an overstuffed chair and started toward me. It was George Morrison. I've been waiting for you, Shane. That's too bad. What happened to your face? I ran into some friends of yours, Morrison. I want to see you upstairs. I hope that's a first aid kit you're holding in your pocket. Upstairs, Shane. All right, what do you want? Grace finally admitted what you really were, Shane. Oh, people have been calling me that for years. We don't need any private detectives around here. Start packing. You're going back to New Orleans. But I just got here. Start packing. Suppose I don't. You'll find out you were wrong about what I got in my pocket. Okay. Yeah, this suitcase sure gets a beating. There's a train leaving here at midnight. I've already made your reservation. Oh, that's mighty friendly of What's the matter? Someone in the fire escape. Take a dive. Now. I took a dive to the floor myself, knocking over the lamp, plunging the room into darkness. Half a dozen bullets smashed through the window. I just held my breath and said a few appropriate words to any archangels who might be listening. I felt the splinter of glass bite into my neck. I thought, so long, Mike. 
It's been fun. In a moment, we'll return to Mike Shane and the case of the hunted bride. Life was getting complicated again. Here I leave for peace and quiet of New Orleans to come to this town because Grace Morrison had decided her husband George was a murderer. And everything that had happened since my arrival had convinced me that the lady was so right. Now I was nibbling the rug on my hotel room floor while someone on the fire escape kept pumping bullets through the glass at George and me. Finally, I realized that the shooting had stopped. Then I heard footsteps down the fire escape. I raced to the window just as some guy reached the yard below. At the edge of the yard, a girl huddled against a fence, trying to keep out of range of the street lamp. She was wasting her time, though. Even from where I stood, I recognized her as Ruthie, the little sweetheart I'd met in the alley earlier in the evening. As I watched, the guy on the fire escape joined her. He turned out to be Ralph, the happy-go-lucky chap who tried to drop-kick my head into the Gulf of Mexico. They hurried away. Then I remembered George Morrison. Oh, what's the matter with you? Yeah, let me get the light on. Where are you hit, Morrison? In the shoulder. Yeah, yeah, let's draw the gun. What a good it did you. I didn't get a chance. A time killer like you it doesn't look too good. What are you going to do? Call the doctor. No. What have you got against doctors? You know, some of those guys are pretty talented. Shane, put the phone down, please. Operator. Operator. Shane, I beg you. I don't care about myself, but for my wife's sake. What do you mean? We get a doctor, he'll have to report it to the police. Everything will come out in the open. You know, I think I'd like that. Well, Grace wouldn't understand. Never be the same with us again. Now, please, Shane, give me a break. It's been tough enough. Why are those two gunners trying to kill you? Because they don't understand. Because they're blaming me for something I couldn't help. The killing Joe Blake. Did you kill him? Shane, you don't understand. Just answer me. Now, listen, you... Answer me. Did you kill Joe Blake? Yes, but you... Shane. Who's there? Shane, if you'll let me explain, you'll understand everything. All right. Stay here in the bedroom. Huh? What is it? Some of the guests report hearing shots. They say they think they came from your suite, Mr. Shane. My suite? Well, man, I was just taking a nap. <sighs> nice mattresses you got in this hotel. You didn't hear any shots? Oh, when I sleep, I don't hear nothing. Yeah? Now, how come you heard my knock? Yeah, that's right. You know, science has a lot of things to explain. Uh, shots didn't come from your bedroom. No, no. Well, all right. Sorry to have disturbed you, Mr. Shane. No, oh, it's okay, officer. Well, come around any time at all. Okay, now, George, start to... Hey, George. It wasn't any George. It was only a little trail of blood leading to the window. For the second time that night, somebody clattering down the fire escape. Leave it to a house stick to knock on the right door at the wrong time. After that, I did the only intelligent thing I'd done all day. I went to sleep. Early the next morning, I called Grace Morrison. She told me that George had come home late with his arm all banged up. Said he'd bumped into something. Then I went over to the police department. Being as coy as possible, I tried to find out if the cops were looking for George Morrison or a reasonable facsimile. They weren't. I went to the public library and got out all the old newspaper files. Now, I didn't find Morrison's name, but Joe Blake's name was scattered through the crime news like confetti. A cheap little hoodlum who'd done everything in the books. One picture showed him and Ruthie smiling at each other across a nightclub table. Ruthie looked better in those days. The last item said Joe was being sought in connection with a gangland murder. That was six months ago. There were no more papers. The librarian told me the other issues hadn't been bound yet, but she'd get them for me. I couldn't wait. Something was clicking in my brain. I left the library and headed for the corner drugstore. I found a phone booth. Dialed the Times Express. I knew a guy on the crime beat. Pete? Yeah, hiya, kid. Long time no see. Oh, it's Mike Shane. 
Yeah. Hey, uh, hey, Pete, can you give me a little information? Yeah. Ever hear of a guy named Joe Blake? Yeah. Yeah, I thought so. Oh, tell me, what finally happened to Joe? Yeah, comes the dawn. And the guy who pulled it? Yeah, I know it's supposed to be confidential, but... Well, was his name George Morrison? Yeah. Hey, Pete, tell me something, will you? Where do I go to donate my head to the fat drive? <laughs> I'll explain later. You know, right now I gotta make another call, quick. Shame, you know, we're passing out brains. You must have been out to uh, uh, Just a minute, Mac. I'll be right out. Hey, will you stop pounding up? A... Oh. I looked out to see who was making like a woodpecker on the glass, and I found myself looking into the little pink eyes of Ruthie's friend, Ralph. He motioned me to come out of the booth. Well, at the moment, there wasn't any place else to go. Come on, Mr. Shane. Sure, but where? Back to your hotel room. Why? You got company. Uh, not interested. Get interested real fast. I got a gun right on your spine. So we went back to my hotel room. He waited in the hallway till I unlocked the door and closed it behind me. Then I heard him going back down the hall. I stood for a moment in the darkness. Then I saw the glowing cigarette. I snapped on the light. It was Ruthie making herself very comfortable on the sofa. She sat up, smoothing her dress down with one hand and holding a gun in the other. Nice couch. Nice room. Mine. I know. That's why I came. I'm only paying for a single. They'll have to raise the rent. Would you mind? Yeah. You see, I can never be myself with a girl when she's holding a gun. I want you to do something for me, Michael. Sure. Coach me, Ruthie. Get on the phone. I'm going to give you a number to call. Swell. If a man answers, I'll hang up, huh? I want you to call Brighton 4506. Brighton 45... That's George Morrison's number. Uh I don't think I want to, Ruthie, honey. It's a shame, Michael. And I'm going to have to kill you. Go on, get on that phone. Brighton 4506. Yeah. Operator. Uh, Brighton 4506. 4506, thank you. What do you want me to say? I want you to tell George Morrison to come over and see you right away. Tell him it's very urgent. As the phone rang, I glanced out the window. Down on the sidewalk, I saw Ralph leaning against the lamppost and reading a paper. I guess it was then that the idea came to me. It wasn't great, but so what? I had about as much chance as a guy buying a ticket on the Irish sweepstakes, only if I lost, I couldn't just tear up the ticket and try again next year. Hello? Oh, hello, Grace. This is Mike Shane. Oh, Mr. Shane, I'm so glad you called. I'd like to speak to your husband, George. He's on his way over to see you at the hotel. I don't know what for. What? Yes, he... Oh, fine. Well? You're in luck, Ruthie. Morrison's on his way over here now. Isn't that nice, Mike? You must have gone for Joe Blake in a big way. We were so right for each other, Joe and I. When that happens, you don't want to lose it. Where are you going? Open this window. It's stuffy in here. Sit down. You get nervous, Mike. Me fresh out of bromance. I said sit down. But I didn't sit down right away. Now the plan had to work. There was nothing else. I looked down at Ralph again. While I watched, he looked up. I sat down on the windowsill, lit a cigarette. Ruth was thinking about Joe Blake. You could tell it by looking at her eyes or lips. She didn't even notice me. I signaled to Ralph with my head for him to come up. He dropped the newspaper and looked confused, but he didn't move. No, the plan was no good. I started walking again. I told you, sit down, Mike. Okay, Ruthie, but I've seen it work in a lot of bad pictures. What are you talking about? Nothing. nothing. You get it. Okay. Yeah? Let me talk to Ruth. Oh, you better tell her that yourself. I told you. Let Hello? Uh, hello? Uh, what's going on out there? I'm coming up. Hmm, he hung up. Who was that? It was your friend Ralph. What did he say? Uh, George Morrison just came into the lobby. He's on his way upstairs. All right. 
sit down in that chair. Funny about love, isn't it, Ruthie? When it's right, you're singing in the rain. When it's wrong... There was nothing wrong with Joe and me. The only good thing that ever happened to me. Morrison had to destroy it. It wasn't Morrison. He just did what he was told. Did what he was told? Ruth, there's only a few seconds left. This is the last chance you're ever going to have in all this world. Give me that gun. No. Open the door for Morrison and then duck. No. Hurry up. Suppose it's your boy, Ralph. Oh, are you kidding? Open that door, Shane, or you'll never open another one. No, Ruthie. All right, Mike. In a moment, we'll be back with a thrilling climax to tonight's Michael Shane adventure. first shot, I ducked fast. Then I realized that she wasn't shooting at me. She was shooting through the door. And even before the smoke cleared away, a trickle of red began slipping in from under the door like a calling card. (laughs) She started for the door, chuckling to herself, like she'd suddenly gotten the tagline of a joke that had been bothering her for weeks. Then she opened the door and saw her pal Ralphie crumpled in the hall. She stopped laughing. She stood in the doorway, her head thrown back like she was going to sing grand opera. Only all that came out was one piercing, crazy scream. Yeah. yeah. It was all over. All the way around. I called Grace Morrison from the railroad station. I only had a couple of minutes, so I told her to her fast. I guess a little too fast. But I, I don't understand, Mr. Shane. You say I was wrong about George? Yeah, completely wrong. Those telegrams. Well, I haven't time to tell you everything, Mrs. Morrison. Just take my word for it. Those jobs he's been going on, they're so legal, it hurts. You know, sometimes I think a lot of marriages would be better off if they changed that love, honor, and obey routine to just love, honor, and trust. You know what I mean, Grace? Yeah. That's just about the whole story. Except for one little footnote printed in small type and strictly between us boys. What I told Grace was partly the truth. Those jobs George Morrison goes on are perfectly legal. But her one big fear is absolutely correct. Every time George gets one of those telegrams, he does kill a man, just as he killed Joe Blake. Still, if George doesn't want her to know, well, then I guess that's his business. Because, you see, George Morrison is the official state prison executioner. Yeah. The guy who pulls the switch. Michael Shane is written for radio by Larry Marcus from characters created by Brett Halliday. The music is composed and conducted by John Duffy and Michael Shane is portrayed by Jeff Chandler. The Adventures of Michael Shane is a Don Sharp production transcribed in Hollywood and distributed exclusively by the Broadcasters Guild. Next week, you'll hear Michael Shane in another suspense thriller. It's a story you'll long remember, and one I will never forget. Think yourself out of this one. Jasper will have that door down in just another second. There'll be nothing between you and his sort of shotgun but air. Think fast, Shane, because... The New Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. This is your director, Bill Russo, inviting you to listen to Michael Shane, that reckless, red-headed Irishman, back at his old haunts in New Orleans another transcribed episode. We call it The Case of the Phantom Gun. Yes? Oh, Mr. Shane, come on in. I wasn't expecting anybody. I want to be a minute. I just dropped by to tell you I've finished your job. You... You found out? Yep. Well, is 
do No, Mrs. Kinney, your husband isn't seeing another woman on the night she stays away from home. Oh, thank you, Mr. Shane. I just... What are you doing? I suggest you keep him home nights. Mr. Shane, what do you mean? Look, you hired me to find out if he's running around with another woman. Well, I found out. He isn't. Now, Mrs. Kinney, if you don't mind, I'll... Well, the way you're evading it, I... Well, you just can't walk out on me. If Dick is in some sort of trouble, I... Oh, I should always... Oh, my God, just... Look, uh, I didn't want your case in the first place, but you looked like a good kid, and I didn't like the idea of some guy pushing you around. Well, I... I don't understand. I've only been on the case three days, Mrs. Kinney. But from the very beginning, I've been getting phone calls from a character who's been warning me they'd find my head in a basket if I didn't lay off. Well, what could Dick be doing that would possibly... This morning. This morning, I couldn't get into my office with the stuff piled knee-high all over the place. Now, my furniture isn't exactly Chippendale, but it does have a sentimental value. And as for my files, they look like the morning after Mardi Gras. Your office was ransacked? Yeah, it looked more like the Ringling Brothers had used it as a detention room for naughty elephants. Well, certainly Dick had nothing to do with that. I'm not on any other case, Mrs. Kinney, and the gal who cleans up doesn't know any elephants. But I, I just don't understand. If Dick really is in trouble, why Look, you... can you understand me? Keep Dickie at home. But why? Why, Mr. Shane? Uh, all right. I'll tell you. And then it's your problem. Your husband has picked up an unsavory playmate. He's up to his clavicle in some very hot blackmail. And if I'm any judge, his clavicle is about to be chopped off. <laughs> In a moment, we'll return to the adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the Phantom Gun. You want a recipe for trouble? Take one part Shane, add a pretty young thing in trouble up to her ears through no fault of her own, mix well in a solution of tears, and you have a guy who let his emotions sway his good judgment. Something I do as often as a police commissioner treats me to a steak dinner. Now, Phyllis Kinney had hired me to find out if her husband was too timely. He wasn't, but he'd gotten himself mixed up with a character named Jasper. This Jasper was following his usual routine, getting close to his blackmail victim by working for him. In this case, he was the gardener at the Duval estate. And that's how Dick Kinney got mixed up with him. Dick was the Duval chauffeur. What made it pretty clear something was in the air was what happened after I'd stuck my nose in there just briefly. I got threatening phone calls, and a cyclone hit my office. Typical Jasper stunts. Anyway, I agreed to try talking some horse sense into young Dick Kinney before I bowed out of the case. It was getting dark when I pulled up outside the ancestral grounds of the Duval estate. I walked up the gravel driveway toward the house. Couldn't see a car anywhere in front, but there were lights on in the house, so chances were Dick was around back. Hello there. Uh, oh, hello. I haven't seen you before, have I? Mm. Mm, yourself, you'd remember if you had. Nice. Everything nice. Even the hair. Nice and red. You wouldn't be Mrs. Duval, would you? You read the society page. No, this was on the front page. Oh, that. Wasn't that nasty of me? 62 marrying 22, that kind of thing. I'm glad I'm 22. Come here. Yeah. Kind of impulsive, aren't you? I don't believe in stifling inhibition. It's unhealthy, Mr. Shane. Did you come here to see my husband? No, I just want to work with Dick Kinney, your chauffeur. Dick? Oh. He's pretty, too. He's around back somewhere, probably in the garage. Uh, got to stick around a while? No. Nope. Oh. Too bad. I'll see you again, Mr. Shane. Goodbye. She ran off like the young animal she was. Disappeared into the house. When I got around to the back of the house, I saw a light burning in the four-car garage and walked in. Somebody in coveralls was working on a town and country. He must have heard me come in because he pulled his head out of the motor and looked up. A blonde, wavy hair, blue eyes, and a weak mouth matched the picture on Phyllis Kinney's mantle. I started to say, you're Dick Kinney, aren't... When I saw Kinney's eyes get wide, I wheeled around, I caught a glimpse of an upraised arm, and then... Oh. The roof fell in, plowed me under. And then I smelled gasoline. It was one big ache, all over. I opened my eyes just in time to see the heel of a shoe come down to my face. And then it was nothing for a while. This 
smell of dust and blood. Leather and blood and gasoline and blood crept back into my nose. I opened my eyes again. It was pitch dark. The roaring in my head blended with the low hum of the motor. I was on the floor of a car. We were driving somewhere. I jounced around like I was on a mechanical horse and out of time with the bucking. Then the car stopped. The door was open. I was yanked out by my ankles and my head bounced as it hit the ground. I waited for something to happen. It did. I didn't feel any new pains. I was lying in the grass and it was cold with a little dew on it. Maybe the shots weren't for me. You were told, Shane. You were told and you didn't behave. Now you're in the soup, but good. Jasper, I recognize your voice anyway. Would you, Shane? Maybe there'll be bells in your ears tomorrow, Shane. Maybe you won't hear so good. You're making a mistake, Jasper. You're getting me interested. You don't shut up. It felt like little taps. Till I tasted shoe leather in my mouth. Blood again. Then I didn't taste or smell or think anymore. The moon was gone and I was cold. My face felt stiff and every bone in my body hurt. I got to my feet and looked around. It was pretty dark. I thought about my nice warm apartment. I thought it cheered me up a little. Then I saw him. It was the kid, Dick Kinney. He was lying on his stomach, face down. He wasn't breathing. I wondered briefly why I was still alive. Only it was too much of an effort. I wanted to lick my wounds and go to bed and sleep off the nightmare I'd just gone through. I kept telling myself as I started home, call headquarters, report the murder. But I don't think I did. Do a favor and get kicked in the teeth. I was so stiff the next morning, it took me five minutes to ease myself out of bed. I hobbled into my car and drove downtown, then hobbled up to my 10 by 14 office. I picked up a package the mailman had left with some circulars and bills and went inside. The cleaning woman had managed to make some sort of order out of the place. I eased myself into my chair, tossed the circulars and bills into the wastebasket, and turned to the package. It bore a New Orleans postmark, but no return address. I tore it open. It grinned up at me and seemed to say, Boy, are you stupid, Shane. It was a Colt 38, nice and clean and just oiled. I reached for the lower left-hand drawer of my desk, but I knew I was wasting my time. This was my gun. Yeah, empty. I hadn't checked it when I found my office torn apart. I thought, Shane, you're losing your grip. What's the angle? Not being knocked off last night, and then this. What's the build-up for? Well, I didn't have to wait for an answer. Hi, uh, Shane. Hello, Lieutenant. What happened to your face? I got a nervous barber. You want to take a little trip? No, I'm not up to it. Force yourself. And uh, that gun will take that away. What's up, Fletcher? A tip. And what? A kid was found shot to death this morning. Dick Kinney. Do you know him? Yeah, I heard of him. I had it in mind to call and report it. Yeah. Let's have a gun. Uh-huh. 38. Kinney was shot with a 38. Well, there were 38s and 38. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's go. This tip was pretty definite. <laughs> thing was going too fast for me. Maybe I was wrong all along. Jasper wasn't that kind of an operator. He hadn't messed with murder before, as far as I knew. Maybe I'd stepped into something. That, that 38. Okay, Shane, let's talk. Did you test the gun? Yeah. Dick Kenny was killed with it. And I told you somebody swiped it from me. Yeah, yeah, you told me. But you didn't report it when it was stolen. I didn't know it was stolen. You didn't do better than that, Shane. Look, Lieutenant, I got it in the mail this morning. You said you were going to report the murder. You were with Kenny last night about 9 o'clock. I told you how it was. The marks on your face don't lie, Shane. But neither does ballistics. Two slugs and Kenny match with slugs from your gun. And the gun was nice and clean and just oiled. But I tell you, it was in the mail. It came in the first delivery. All right, Shane. Let's go back to your office and take a look at that wrapper. Yeah, yeah, sure. Now you're using your head, Lieutenant. Thanks. Okay, Lieutenant, I threw the wrapper right into the wastebasket here now. Oh, no. What? The cleaning woman must have emptied it out. 
Oh, now, okay, Shane. I think we've reached the end of this little... Oh, wait, wait. We can try outside. Maybe they haven't picked up the trash yet. You uh, know that's against the law, littering the street like that. Yeah, yeah. Bend down and help me go through this stuff here. It's a brown wrapper. Okay. I don't know what this will prove anyway. All it can do is establish you getting a package this morning. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Yeah, let's see. Okay, Lieutenant, take a look at the postmark. And that's it. All in, 3 p.m., April 12th. Well, that's yesterday afternoon, all right? Yeah. The package with my gun in it was mailed yesterday afternoon at 3 o'clock, and I got it this morning at a quarter to nine. You know, Shane, ballistics is like fingerprints. No two of them alike. Then you made a mistake. I didn't make a mistake. Maybe you did. It just doesn't add up. It couldn't have been my gun that killed Kenny. The gun was in the United States mail at the time he was shot. That's what you say. How do I know your gun was in that package? But I'm telling you... All I know is that in the history of the police department, ballistics has never been wrong. You admit being with him when he was killed, your gun killed him. There's only one answer, Shane, and you're it. In a moment, we'll return to the adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the Phantom Gun. I was in a spot and I talked fast. I'd taken a little case and it got away from me. Phyllis Kinney wondered whether her husband was spending his nights with other women after he got through with his chores as chauffeur for the Duvals. And because as I could use the fee, I looked into it. I found out he'd gotten chummy with a character named Jasper, who worked on the Duval estate as God. But Jasper's real trade was blackmail. I went to warn young Kinney to lay off and wound up with a headache. The kid was knocked off in an open spot on the bank of the Mississippi, and my gun apparently was a murder weapon. Only I didn't have the gun at the time. It was in the United States mails. Another item that kept my fat head in the fire was that I was along on the junket, albeit semi-conscious. Lieutenant Fletcher of the New Orleans homicide detail had a point. Look, Shane, the bullets that killed young Kenny came from your gun. You can't shake that. You say the gun came through the mail this morning and that it was in the mail since yesterday afternoon. I admit it doesn't add up, but Ballistics I'm... don't lie. You gonna book me? I'm considering it. What'll that get you? Look, I've got an idea. You can tell me your idea. Well, it's speculation. That's all it is. Now. We speculate fine downtown. Okay, Fletcher. If that's the way it is, I'm clamming up. We've been too easy on you guys. All we get is a swift... Trip. I don't know what you're complaining about. All I want to do is follow a trailer to wrap the whole thing up for you. All right, Shane. This is against my better judgment, but you've got just eight hours to find something. Thanks, Lieutenant. Just don't try to leave town. I might as well tell you, we're going right ahead, fitting your neck for a noose. <laughs> One thing I knew. One thing I was sure. That gun was in the mail when Kinney was shot. Like the lieutenant said, ballistics don't lie. No two boars make the same marks on a bullet. It's one in a hundred billion. It just doesn't happen. Whoever figured this out was a smart cookie. The first thing I wanted to do was speak to old man Duval. Yes, Mr. Shane? Mr. Duval? That's right. What can I do for you? It's what I can do for you. Oh, Who's putting a bite on you? I beg your pardon? Did you know your chauffeur, Dick Kinney, was shot last night? Yes. The police been here? I don't see what business that is of yours. Well, I got my fingers burnt. I was taken along for the ride. Oh. And that reference to, uh, to, uh... Blackmail. You're a private detective. That's right. I don't understand your connection. I was checking up on Dick Kinney. For what? Something else. It, uh... Doesn't fit in with your problem. Now, Mr. Shane, I'm rather busy. You're not too busy, Mr. Duval. Dick Kinney was blackmailing you, and Dick Kinney was killed last night. Go on, Mr. Shane. You want to tell me about it? Tell you? Tell you what? What the blackmail was about. It seems to me you've made a lot of suppositions. I don't know why you got your information, but it doesn't resemble anything I am aware of. <laughs> okay, Mr. Duval, you've got a right to your own mistakes. Good day, Mr. Shane. Oh, uh, where's your wife? Good day, Mr. Shane. Shane, you're a whiz-bang, you are. And Armand Duval is charming. And Judith, his sprightly wife, is ugly. And Lieutenant is full of milk and honey, and the character Jasper is sweetness and light. And you, Shane, are the brilliant, the distinguished man about town. Detective par excellence. Yeah, here you've been scouting the setup for four days. You had a seat on the 50-yard line. Even had your own head used as a football, and you still don't know the score. Oh, yeah, you're a shot. Now all you have to do is wait behind the potted petunias until the suspect plants his hoof print in the low. Well, as I left the Duval Castle and started toward the back of the house to pay my respects to Jasper, 
Judith popped out from behind a weeping willow. You aren't leaving without uh, seeing me, Michael, were you? Well, leaving wasn't my idea. Your husband... Oh, yes. Yeah. Come on, Michael. There's a bench behind this willow tree. I'd like you to uh, know me better. That sounds like a worthy project. What's happened to you? Your face looks it like... It came out second best in a tussle with a toe of your garden in size 11. Size but... 10 and a half, Shane. Ah. Behind me again, huh? That's all right. Lift them. Jasper, what are you doing? Just checking, Mrs. Duvall. <clears throat> uh, no gun, Shane? No gun. All the odds are with you again, Jasper. <laughs> yeah, I've been getting an idea, a swell idea. Yeah, you've had lots of them lately. Things are breaking my way for a change. Jasper, put that gun away. Ah, uh, uh, Mrs. Duvall, this is the payoff. We're going to have an audience with the boss. Come on, both of you. Well, where'd you get that museum piece, Jasper? You like it? Just a shotgun. A little sawed off. Covers lots more territory that way. Let's go. What is this, Jasper? <laughs> little idea, sir. Everything was going so smooth and nice, I thought it's a pity if anything should happen. And then I thought this idea, I thought. And it's a pet. You, you, you got a gun? Yeah. It's so now, Mrs. Duvall. I think you're making a mistake, Jasper. Mistake, mistake. I ain't made one yet, and I've been in the business a long time. I said, sit down. I refuse to have you. Uh, <laughs> Jasper, you... Here we are, Shane. Hey, you're, you're real brave with a gun. Judith. She's unconscious. That jabbering was getting on my nerves. What do you intend to do? <laughs> it's a perfect setup. Shane is going to take the rap. For what? For Kenny's murder, Shane. It's like you're going to take the rap for Duvall's. Uh, you're going to kill me? Sure. You paid off Kenny five grand yesterday. That's chicken feed. Yeah. Kenny was your go-between. That's why you bumped him. That's right, Shane. I don't like to think I got a split with anybody. Now, wait a minute, Jasper. We, we, we can come to terms, I'm sure. Uh -huh. This is too perfect. No. No, don't! <laughs> Are you crazy? Your mind, Shane, this is an easy way for me to take care of you. You got careless just one second too long. Besides, you made a mistake. My gun is at headquarters. What's this one, ain't? I knocked the gun out of his hand and it went skittering across the floor. But he was a lot closer to it than I was and on his way for it already. I thought he who fights and runs away and I slammed the door behind me and started for the front. I got lost or something, wound up in the kitchen. I went through it and out onto the rear veranda. I knew if I started to cross the lawn, I wouldn't have time to get to cover. I went back into the house through French windows with Jasper panning along behind me. Through the library and a big double-width staircase that led up to the top floor. I took it three at a time. Jasper was just rounding the first bend behind me when I reached the top. It splendid, the beautiful wall paneling, but I didn't stop to survey the damage. I turned right and disappeared into the master bedroom at the end of the hall, just as another shot spurred me on. The room was done up in purple and rose. I guess it was very pretty under different circumstances. There was a door at the far end, and I scooted into it and threw it shut behind me, and then I turned the lock. Bathroom. I didn't even have time to look for an aspirin tablet in the medicine chest when the hammering started. I said to myself, all right, Shane, keep your head. You got to think yourself out of this one. Because on the other side of that door, Jasper's waiting for you. And the way that door is splintering up now, it doesn't look as if the wood is as stout as you're craving to keep on living. Gotcha, Shane! Gotcha! He'd splintered out the middle panel. Now his hand filled the hole and the gun filled his hand. Any second... <laughs> didn't feel anything. Maybe you never do. Maybe it was all over. Then the fingers of Jasper's hand got limp and the gun fell onto the tile floor. I opened the door. It was Judith DeVal. She stood in the center of the room and a thin thread of dried blood was on her chin. And the gun in her hand was pointed at Jasper, curled up on the floor. <laughs> In a moment, we'll be back with the thrilling climax to tonight's Michael Shane adventure. Well, the bullets in Armand Duval came from your gun also, Shane. That's what I thought, Lieutenant. But your gun's been in my desk all afternoon. Just like last night when Dick Kinney was shot. My gun was in the mail. You got a theory? Sure. Well, I think you killed Duval. Huh? 
Now, you slay me, Shane. <laughs> Did you inspect that sawed-off shotgun? Yeah, the boys are going over it now. Why? And I told you my office was ransacked and my gun was stolen. What was to prevent Jasper from firing a half a dozen bullets into some pillows, cleaning the gun, and sending it back to me? Nothing if he wanted to. Sure he'd want to. If he figured on putting those bullets in a gadget that would fit into the chamber of the shotgun and hold the bullets, yeah. then he could fire them through a much larger bore than my thirty eight. Yeah, hey, that would work, wouldn't it? The bore of a shotgun is so large that it wouldn't mark up the bullet. Yeah, and would leave the original rifling marks from my gun. The only reason Jasper didn't finish me off last night was because he figured I'd take the rap for Dick Kinney's murder. Yeah, that makes sense, too. I wouldn't have had a close shave this afternoon if I'd ever learned to keep my big mouth shut. I told Jasper my gun was in police headquarters after he killed DeVal. Then he realized what I should have thought of, that I couldn't be framed for DeVal's killing through my gun. That's why he went after me. And hey, where are you going? I got a little unfinished business. I'll be back. It was pretty simple when you knew the background. Jasper got a job as a gardener because he wanted to be close to his blackmail victim, Duval. He'd got Dick Kinney to front for him and then killed the boy so he wouldn't have to split. It all tied together that way. All except one little item. I was going to find out about that. Judith was waiting for me in the Duval library. Mike. Oh, Mike. Now, before we settle down and get comfortable, sweetheart, I got a little confession. What do I care what you want to confess? Oh, Mike, it's going to be wonderful. Just you and me. Now, this confession's about you. All right, what? What is it? I thought for one solid three-minute period you were true blue and a yard wide. Hmm? When you shot Jasper. Oh, it wasn't so much to save my life, sweetheart, as it was to get rid of him. Tell me, did Jasper pick you or did you pick Jasper? Mike, what are you talking that about? That gun trick. It's way over Jasper's head. He could never think of a thing like that. Oh, let's not talk about Jasper. And why would Jasper kill your husband if he's the one who was being blackmailed? Was he, Mike? No, dice, baby. What are you thinking? It's pretty clear, Judith. You put Jasper up to getting money from your husband. And Jasper saw a wonderful opportunity. He didn't have to nibble at Duval. He wanted half of the money all at once. As DeVal's widow, you get the money, don't you? Mike. Maybe he'd even bleed you to death for the other half, too. He was sitting pretty until everything fell into place for you. Mike, listen. There are wonderful things from now on. I've got money. We can have all the good things. We can enjoy them, darling, together. Yeah. Let's go, baby. Where? Where to, Mike? Police headquarters. This is where I came in. I always meet the right woman at the wrong time. <laughs> I figured that tied everything up, but not quite. It turned out that the blackmail angle had to do with Duval not having a final divorce from his first wife when he married Judith. Judith was the only one who knew it. She contacted Jasper and worked him in on the deal. Very cute, because when that came out, Judith lost her right to Duval's millions. But then, what could she spend money on where she was going? The New Adventures of Michael Shane is a Don W. Sharp production, transcribed in Hollywood and distributed exclusively by the Broadcasters Guild. Look, doll girl, I've got to know where it goes. Last night, someone ran me down. Later on, they killed an old man who tried to tell me something. My nerves are like radar, and they're sending out all kinds of danger signals. I'm on somebody's list. Whose list, doll girl? Come on, give. <laughs> The New Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. Michael Shane, reckless, red-headed Irishman, back in his old haunts in New Orleans. Ready, as always, to risk his neck for law, order, and an occasional dollar. Listen now as we bring you The New Adventures of Michael Shane. Hello. Michael Shane, Private Detective. Speaking. Mr. Shane, I have a job for you. But I can't pay you very much. Keep talking. I'm listening. My name is Marina Lau. I want you to come over to 1612 Wentworth Street. I meet you on the porch. On the porch? Yes, this is why I call you. My father has locked all the doors and windows. He's in the house, sitting in the dark, waiting. Waiting for what? For death, Mr. Shane. <laughs> No, 
Now we return to New Orleans and a new adventure with Michael Shane. <laughs> I was on my way across New Orleans to see Marina LaRue, whose papa was waiting for death. 1612 Wentworth Street was a couple of minutes by cab in ordinary times, but these were not ordinary times, so it was taking me a half hour to walk it. Yeah, yeah, this had been a bad month for little Mike. Police headquarters had suspended my license for 60 days for being a stunk. But even stunks have stomachs and creditors. That last buck in my wallet was so lonely it was getting psychoneurotic. So, license or no license, I wasn't letting Marina LaRue get away. And just like she said, she was waiting on the porch, and she was some baby doll. Creole from way back and round and ripe like a cantaloupe busting its seams. Only I'd been living on shredded wheat and canned milk for so long, all Marina LaRue meant to me then was ham and eggs and pork chops and maybe pie a la mode. Mr. Shane. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. And half out of my mind. I don't want to call the police if nothing is really wrong. Hey, hey, slow down, slow down, you. Your father's inside the house? Yes. He has been in there for the last eight days, just sitting in his room in the dark. Like I said, waiting for death. What's the matter? Is he sick? No. He's as healthy as you are. I. That's why I don't understand. Tonight, he won't even let me in the house. He has locked all the doors and the windows. I, I don't know what to think. Well, I think we ought to tap a brick against one of those windows and have a talk with Papa. Yes. Yeah, but first I ought to tell you that I... I break windows and talk to papas who wait for death for something more than the sheer joy of it. For something like 20 bucks a day. You, uh, you understand that, of course. I told you I'd pay you. Okay. I always like to begin business on a friendly basis. Now, oh, where's that brick? I broke the window, reached in and unlocked it, and then slid over the sill. The house was as black as a mug of G.I. coffee. I found a light switch and clicked it back and forth, but nothing happened. And I let the girl in through the front door. Come on in. What happened to the lights? I don't know. And where is Papa? Yeah. Papa! Papa! I started lighting matches and we wandered through the house. Papa, where are you? A single flare of light cast crazy shadows against the walls and the ceiling. Papa! You got the screwy feeling that the house itself is alive and watching you. Except for our footsteps, there wasn't a sound. Papa, where are you? Oh, my error. Yeah, yeah, there was a sound, all right, coming from the next room down the hall. I felt a nerve deep down inside me start jangling like a burglar alarm. Papa! I knew that sound like I know my heartbeat. We were at the door of the room. I struck another match, and the girl saw. Papa! No. No, Papa! No, Papa! No. He was hanging like a pig in a butcher shop, tied to the chandelier. His head lolled on his shoulder, and his eyes stared up at a nothing hall. Then suddenly, the girl's sobbing ended as though somebody had clamped a hand over her mouth. When she spoke, she sounded like a stranger. Strike another match. A little close to you. Wasn't one look enough? Strike the match. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Funny, Mark. Looks like a brand or something. A coiled snake. I should have known. I should have known that's why he was so frightened. That is who he was waiting for. And go inside. Hey, kid, snap out of it. Hey, what's wrong with you? What are you talking about? Who's Corel? I, I didn't say... I didn't... I didn't hey, say hey, I... hey, hey, hey! Call the police. Tell them my father committed suicide. And then go away. I did what the lady said. I called the cops, collected my 20 bucks, and beat it. Because if the police found me working without a license, they might send me to bed without supper. And with 20 bucks, I was once again a man of distinction. So I took a cab downtown. On the way, I debated whether to sample Antoine's elegant crawfish or Galatoire's savory bouillabaisse. And I settled for Charlie's hash and beer. Charlie was an ancient moth-eaten character who kept a basement bar on Beale Street just so he'd have somebody to talk to. And there weren't many customers tonight. He stayed close to me, polishing the mahogany and looking annoyed. New Orleans. How quaint. Huh? Yeah, that's what they said. How quaint. What are you talking about, Charlie? Sure, I'm talking about six of them. Came down a while back from Peoria, they said. Just looking, they said. How quaint. All right, quaint pour me they... another one, Charlie. Yeah, okay, okay, Mike. Uh, quaint, they think this is. I should have told them how my place used to be. 
But the cockfights we had right there in the center of the floor by candlelight. And the 12 ladies from Natchez doing the can-can. Peoria. Charlie. Huh? Did you ever hear of anyone named Anthony Carell? Charlie, I'm talking to you. I heard you, Sheen. Well? You better stick to looking through hotel transoms and forget Anthony Carell. Why? Because it's something out of the past. Something that hasn't got any place in this world. What are you talking about? You see, according to the story, there's something special about Anthony Carell. Special? Yeah. He ain't like you and me, Shane. You see, Anthony Carell ain't never gonna die. That tickled me. Oh. I finished my drink, waved goodbye to old Charlie, yelled something about getting Carell's formula and putting Perona out of business, and then I was on my way. The air was better outside, and I decided to walk. It was a nice, quiet street. Great place to start a cemetery. As it turned out, I was just a kid to start one. I didn't hear the car behind me. All I saw was the cab on the next corner. The cab driver was leaning against the open door, waiting for me. I stepped off the curb, and a couple of heads... Hey, then I was rolling on cobblestones, watching a red tail light disappear in the distance. Next thing, the, the cab driver was bending over me. You okay, Pally? Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess so. Hey, take me home, will you? That sure was close. No, no, I, I just got careless crossing the street. Careless? <laughs> I was watching, Pally. That car followed you for maybe two blocks, waiting to get a chance at you. Huh? Yeah. Somebody in this town don't like you very much, Pally. The cabbie drove Pally home. Between my evening of hilarity and my nosedive in the gutter, I felt kind of rocky. As soon as I got in the room, I flopped down in bed and bid the world good night. But the world wasn't finished with me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Listen to me, boy. Something funny is going on. Yeah, yeah, funny. They're trying to scare me. But old Charlie's been around too long to scare. Ah, uh, good for old Charlie. Well, you come on over now. I'll tell you what they're up to, boy. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, come sure. Come on over right away. Okay, okay. You know where I bunk? In the room behind the bar. Just knock on the front door. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Get here as quick as you can. Sure, sure. Sure, Charlie. Uh, sure. The last thing I saw before I fell asleep again was the luminous green dial on my bedside clock. 3.47. It said 10.20 when I saw it again. The room was lousy with sunshine. I was brushing my teeth and trying to avoid my reflection in the mirror when I remember Charlie calling me. I found the phone number of his joint in the book and I called him. Only it wasn't Charlie who answered I want to speak to Charlie. Who is it? Uh, just let me talk to Charlie. Sorry, Mr. Charlie isn't here. Where is he? They took him to the morgue an hour ago. He's dead. Now, back to New Orleans, to the new adventures of Michael Shane. In the beginning, it hadn't made much sense. Marina LaRue calling me to break into her father's house. Him hanging from the chandelier with a snake brand on his forehead. And now, old Charlie's dead. Well, I, I went down to the morgue. The attendant took me to the basement of where Charlie was on his table. Lieutenant Burns of headquarters was just taking a peek. Nasty, a redhead. Yeah. Yeah, necks of bum sheep for butcher man. What's that on his forehead? Mm. Looks like a brand. Like a coiled snake. I probably banged his head. It's nothing. Now you want to bet, Lieutenant? Say, look, Shane, what are you doing around here? You're not forgetting that your license is suspended. A uh, guy can get in here without a license. Look at Charlie. All he had was a license to sell bad booze. You're not doing any work for anybody? No. No, I'm just keeping in training. Come on, be a good boy, redhead. You've only got a couple of weeks to go. Then it'll be legal for you to start bothering us. Burns, tell me about Anthony Carell. Who? Sometimes called the, uh, the deathless one. Oh, my back. Don't tell me that's going around again. Well, what about him? 
Oh, that's what I love about this town. No matter how modern it may look on the outside, underneath it's still a jungle. Still dancing the voodoo drums. Voodoo? Yeah, every so often some scared sucker comes in and whispers in our ears that Anthony Carell is still alive and terrifying the countryside. When we ask him for one teeny little bit of proof, the little sucker vanishes in a puff of smoke. Anthony Carell. Oh, redhead, you can do better than that. Yeah, when I got outside on Jackson Street, it did seem kind of silly. What was so silly about that car trying to run me down last night? What was so silly about Charlie under a white sheet in the basement of that morgue? Oh, I had enough questions in my head to start a quiz show, but not enough answers to win a yo-yo. I knew a good place to ask questions, though. And I had to start asking questions fast. Something was happening, something big, and it was happening to me. I took a cab out to the Brownstone House on Wentworth Street, where all this began. Come on, you're going to have to open up sometime, baby doll. Ah. Please, go away, Mr. Shane. In a little while, Marina, honey. Please, I'm in mourning. Have some respect. Sure, I'll take off my hat. Inside. What do you want? Why are you so scared? I'm not scared. Tell that little nerve in your cheek. It's twitching overtime. Look, I want to know about Anthony Carell. No, please, no. Yes, please, yes. So, Shane, I was rather glad when I saw you come out this day. Yeah? Yes, really I was. I had trouble forgetting you, my dear. Oh, no, no, girl, turn off the warm water. I'd love to, but I can't. How oh, about Anthony Carell? Why do you bother with something that does not concern you? That's just it, dog girl. It concerns me clear up to here. Last night, somebody tried to run me down. Later on, they killed an old man who wanted to tell me something. Look, I've been in this business a long time. My nerves are like radar, and they're sending out all kinds of danger signals. I'm on somebody's list. Oh, I'm not one of those story detectives, dog girl. I've got to know what I'm fighting. I cannot help you. You've got to. No. Okay. Mind if I use the phone? Who are you calling? The Daily Bulletin. I got a pal working in the city room. I'm going to tell him Marina LaRue of 1612 Wentworth Street says Anthony Carell was responsible for the death of her father. Huh? Bulletin? Let me speak to Fraser in the city room. Don't give me the phone. No. Oh, you can't do this. They're killing me. I'm fighting for my own neck, honey. Hello. Hello, Fraser. This is Mike Shane. Hey, I think I got a story I for you. I tell you what. Goodbye, Fraser. I tell you, when you go out, try to do something about it, the way men have done for a hundred years. And if they find you at all, they find branded into your flesh, they call it snake. The mask of Anthony Carell. Just as they have found it on all the others. Who is this guy, Anthony Carell? You have heard of Madame Lorette? Madame Lorette? Sure, wasn't she supposed to be some kind of big shot in a voodoo racket around New Orleans? She was the voodoo queen more than a century ago. Yeah. In the 1820s, she married another voodoo worshipper, a man already old. He comes to New Orleans from Haiti. He was the greatest of them all. His name was Anthony Kyle. And this guy who's causing all the trouble today, he's his descendant, huh? Descendant, you fool, don't you understand? It is the same man. But that couldn't be. Why do you think we're all in such terror of him? He cannot die. Do you know what that means? Hey, 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 he hey. cannot die. The food has been bought him. The house he was riding in had been shot at. Once the house he was staying in was dynamited. Men stood at every door with guns. In less than a week, the plotters were dying one by one. And on their foreheads, the snake brand of Anthony Kyle. That's crazy. That is the story, Mr. Shane. Believe it. Don't believe it as you wish. What does this big shot look like? No living man has ever seen his face. Down a picture. And who takes care of it? The Carroll clan, one generation after another. Today, there are only two left. One, two. They do Anthony Carroll's work. Collect his tribute. Juan and Philippe. Where do they live? I don't know. I don't know. I have told you everything I know. What else do you want, Mr. Shane? What else do you want? What else do I want? A little while ago, you said you had trouble forgetting me. Well? Come here, doll girl. I don't want you to forget it. After I left Marina, I went to the library and spent half the day looking up the old history books of New Orleans. Madame Lorette and Anthony Carell were in every one. And every book agreed that Madame had died in 1845. There was no mention of Anthony Carell ever having died at all. I called an old guy I knew over at the Bureau of Records. 
I told him I was looking for the death certificate of one Anthony Carell. He laughed over the phone, asked me if I was falling for that old story. But three hours later, he called me back. Yeah? Jane, this is the Bureau of Records. Well? You were right. There is no death certificate for Anthony Carell. I had a couple of drinks after that. Then I started walking the streets. My head throbbed. Felt like a guy trapped in a nightmare, trying with all his might to wake up out of it. Around midnight, I found a small park near Jackson Square and sat down on a bench trying to think of an answer. May I sit down, Mr. Shane? Huh? Oh, yeah, sure. Hey, how come you know my name? Oh, you are a very famous man, Mr. Shane. Known particularly for your tenacity. Cigarette? Thanks. Well, what do you want? Mr. Shane, it's very unfortunate that you saw fit to interest yourself in Anthony Carrera. Oh? Why? Because now I must kill you. I felt a bullet smash against me. But at first there was so little pain, that same crazy feeling of maybe it's a dream came back. I lunged for the guy trying to get hold of his gun hand. Like wrestling with an octopus, he was soft and wet-skinned, and a neat little fella, he even wore cologne. It was slipping out of my reach, I jumped up and started running. I said the first prayer that came to my mind, Catholic, Hebrew, Episcopalian, who cared? I saw a row of shrubbery had dived in. And that bullet had been real all right. My side was beginning to ache like a whole mouthful of sore teeth. My friend with the gun came so close to the brush, I could smell his sweet, stinking cologne. I remembered a couple of other prayers. Something must have worked. A siren started sobbing the blues far off, and the guy beat it. He climbed into a little black coupe parked at the curb. Pulled away, but he was playing it very safe. There was a long stoplight at the corner, and he waited for every second of it. A nice, law-abiding, perfumed young man. There was a parking lot half a block down the street. I ran for it. As I ducked in, I saw the light on the corner change. The black coupe down Canal Street. I hopped into the first car and turned on the ignition. A sleepy-eyed attendant came out of a little shed, and I kicked the starter. Got to kick it, mister! Hey, come back! Come back! I wasn't so law-abiding. I went down side streets like somebody lit a fuse. Yeah, just like in the movies, except my, my side hurt, my shirt felt sticky and warm, and sick to my stomach. When I was sure no cops were following me, I cut back to Canal Street, and pretty soon I saw the black coupe again, still obeying all the laws. Now we're on the outskirts of town, along the wharves that reached out into the gulf. The black coupe picked up speed. I picked up speed. Oh, it was a long ride through little country roads that stretched through the bayous. Once I managed to slip my hand into my shirt. Made the happy discovery my wound felt a lot worse than it really was. Yeah, and I had another good break. In the dashboard compartment, I found a pint of bourbon that had hardly been touched. Oh, I touched it good. It was almost as fine as a blood transfusion. And then before I knew it, the black cooper turned into a driveway. I went on a few hundred yards, pulled up onto some trees, and turned the lights off. It was a battered, weather-beaten farmhouse, standing all by itself in the middle of nothing. The windows were boarded up. Everything about it said nobody home except the black coop. I snuck around the back. The screen door was open. I walked across the porch and almost knocked over a row of milk bottles. I tried the back door. The door was open. Oh, no, I wasn't having any. You didn't have to be a quiz kid to know what this setup was. I started back across the porch. I reached the screen door and then I stopped. The only sound in all the world was a mosquito buzzing like mad in the darkness. Hey, Shane, where are you going? Oh, I, I realized I'd said that out loud. And it giggled to myself. I rubbed my head. It, it was hot. A bullet hole. Maybe I was already getting delirious. Yeah. Now, but where was I going? Back to little New Orleans? For well, what? The cops wouldn't listen to me. To them, I was just a big-nosed redhead out for a quick buck. And my sweet-smelling friend had slipped up twice now. If I went back to town, he'd come after me again, and he was just about due for the jackpot. No. Well, there was no place to go except inside the house. I picked up one of the milk bottles. Me and my homogenized blackjack. I went back to the door. Pushed it open. Went into the kitchen. Everything dark. I could just make out some dishes on the sink. The place smelled of bad, greasy cooking. Then I found another door. Now I was in a short hallway that led to a flight of stairs. Not a sound at all. Oh, I'd even been glad to hear that mosquito. Stairs. Started up a step at a time. Slow. Easy. Slow. Easy. Then when I 
was close to the top, there was something about the darkness that looked wrong. Real close to me, I smelled sweet cologne. I spun around and started down the stairs fast, but it was all wasted. At the foot of the stairs, a cigarette glowed in the dark. I was boxed in real nice. The guy downstairs spoke first. So this is Mr. Shane Wong. Yes, this is him, Philip. Juan and Philippe. The brothers Carell. And where is old man Anthony? You have come for Anthony. Well, he is in the last room at the end of the hall, but I don't think you will reach him. I think you are going to die on those stairs. Keep coming up the steps, Mr. Shane. Yeah. Yeah, sure. How's this? On the I lunged at him. There was a swirl of cologne. I brought the milk bottle down hard and one crumpled on the floor. Nice as you please. Behind me, I heard Philippe coming up after me. I raced down the hall. I tried the first door. Yeah, locked. The second door. Oh, locked. The third door was unlocked. I opened it and slammed it shut behind me. I snapped the lock. Oh, friend Philippe was at the door breaking through. I did the first thing that came to my mind. I picked up a chair and smashed it through the window. And then I jumped into a corner as the door flung open. Philippe came into the room holding his gun. He headed straight to the broken window. He stood looking out of it into the darkness for a long time. Get away, Mr. Shane. And his back was to me. I started for him. My side was throbbing again. My throat was so dry you could have struck matches on it. Something must have warned Philippe. He started turning around. I brought the milk bottle down hard. <laughs> He staggered, fell to his knees, got up and started clawing at my legs. I went into a deep purple fog. When I came out of it, the leaf was very quiet. The milk bottle was broken into a thousand pieces. I, I sat down on a chair. I felt about as peppy as a Floridora girl. And then I remembered. Anthony Carell, the man who couldn't die, was down the hall. I went over to Philippe and dug around until I found his gun. He groaned a little bit, but that's ah. all. I went back out into the hall. The last room at the end of the hall. I started toward it. Then in front of the door, I saw one. I, I will not let you in this room. He wasn't able to stand up. He was on his knees in front of the door, and his mouth hung open as though he didn't have the strength to close it. For five generations, he has been our strength. With him, we've been able to rule everyone. I will not let you destroy him. And then I saw the gun in his hand. I saw him try to raise it. I shot three times. He collapsed in the heat. Even while dying, he wasn't going to let me into that room. As I reached for the knob, with his last strength, Juan flung his arm up and wildly tried to block me. What was there in that room that a guy would die like this just to protect? I reached for the knob and raised my gun. I entered the room, slowly. Looked around. Then I realized why Juan and Philippe had tried so hard to keep me out of here. Then I realized why Anthony Carell would not die. Why he could not be killed. There was no Anthony Carell. The room was empty. Yeah. Yeah, that was the story of Anthony Carell. He lived and died in his own time just as any man. The Carell clan, knowing the power of fear, had made it appear that the old man was still alive and kicking. Oh, I wonder how many people go through life being afraid of empty rooms. Well, as soon as I got back to town that night, I went to the emergency hospital and had myself pasted together. Then I called on Marina LaRue. I told her all about Anthony Carell. When I finished, she didn't say a word. Just came over and looked at me a long time, and she kissed me. After a while, I began to realize that trip to the hospital was wasted. Moreno was so much better than penicillin. Suddenly, I realized I was all alone backstage. And I got the same feeling you get just before a storm breaks. I turned and started toward Christina's dressing room. Then I heard the shot and the scream. And as I started running, I had a strong hunch I'd just lost a client. The 
New Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. Michael Shane, reckless, red-headed Irishman, is back again in his old haunts in New Orleans. This is your director, Bill Russo, inviting you to listen to another transcribed episode, which we call The Case of the Left-Handed Fan. For you, son. Where's Christina Bancroft's dressing room? Now, son, that's something a lot of people would like to know. Now look, Pop, you don't see a bouquet in my hand, do you? She sent for me on business. Oh. Well, that make you Mike Shane, maybe. Quaint way of putting it, but it's a general idea. Hey, second door down the hall on your left, Miss Shane. Thanks. Hey, it's just we gotta be careful. A lot of people always try and see Miss Bancroft. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I forgot to tell you, Miss Bancroft hasn't come in yet. She... Well, fine. Well, just go on in, rest yourself. She ought to be here any minute. Oh, okay. Ooh, quite a place. Mm, nice. Oh, so that's Christina Bancroft. Some picture. Oh, there you are, Mr. Shane. I'm so sorry to have kept you waiting. Please forgive me. You know how these interviews are. They stretch on and on and on until you think you will simply uh, go out uh, of I... your mind. But I'm so glad you're here now. We've almost half an hour until curtain. This thing has me so petrified. I haven't slept for a solid look, week. Just look uh, at these circles under my eyes. Oh, they're ghastly, aren't they? Now, maybe we get all this straightened out. It's been such uh, a strain. Yeah, such yeah, a yeah, strain. And the worst part of it is the unknown element. If it were only something out in the open, it would be different. But it's the not knowing that's been tearing me to pieces. I... What's the matter? Huh? Mr. Shane, why are you looking at me like that? Why, uh, well, you're not exactly ugly, you know, Miss Bancroft. Oh, did you expect I would be? Uh, no, it's just that I, well, I'll skip it. All right, Mr. Shane, will you take the case? You must. I simply can't. Now, wait a minute. Don't I... start that again. Hmm? Look, can't we go through this thing slowly and calmly? You're, you're not on stage now. You're just talking to poor little me, Mike Shane, and you're leaving me way behind. How about a little less razzle-dazzle? Okay. Huh? Just Okay. Yeah, that, that's what I thought you said. I, uh, I get wound up sometimes. You certainly do, Miss Bancroft. Mike, I'm scared. I really am. Yeah, I'm just finding it a little tough to adjust to the new rate of speed. Well, I've adjusted now, so you're scared. What of? I don't know. You don't know? Now, look. I, I want to hire you for three days for protection, Mike. Why three days? The play ends its New Orleans run in three days. After that, I'm... Going away for a while, alone. And I'm not going to tell anyone where. I'll be all right then. So I want you to protect me for the next three days. Just a minute. How am I supposed to protect you if I don't know what I'm protecting you from? Now, what is it? Someone. I don't know who. And I certainly don't know why. But whoever it is, he's trying very hard to kill me. <laughs> In a moment, we'll return to the new adventures of Mike Shane and the case of the left-handed fan. Well, one thing about my job, you meet such interesting people, like Christina Bancroft, the actress. I guess dazzling's as good as any other word for Christina. The girl is very, very beautiful and very, very hard to figure. One moment, she was quite the actress, talking a mile a minute with sparks flying and with gestures yet. The next moment, she was a sweet, scared girl, quietly asking me to protect her from an unknown killer. Well, at the time, the job of protecting Christina was the pleasantest prospect I'd had for weeks, so I didn't hesitate. After our interview, I stuck around in the wings watching the play. This Christina seemed to be knocking him dead. Finally, near the end of the show, a tall, thin guy with a streak of gray came over no, where I was standing. Me. Hello. You can't oh. mean it. I'm Hamilton it's John, the director. Way, I'm mine, Shane. How are you? Shane. Uh, enjoying the play? Yeah, it's quite a girl out there. Yes. Shane. Heard the name somewhere. You're a friend of Christina's? Not exactly. Huh? You say you directed the play, Mr. Tom? Yes, that's right. Maybe you can tell me then. Tell you what? What there is about her. Christina? Yeah. There's people out there in the audience. Look at them. Spellbound. I suppose you've known her quite a while. Yes, yes, quite a while. She's a great actress. 
You know, I somehow get the idea that in addition to being a director, you're sort of a fan of hers. Yes, Mr. Chang. I guess you might say I am a fan of hers. Next question? Sorry. Anyway, I'm sure this stocky chap coming toward us can tell you a lot more about Christina. Oh? Yes, you see, I'm only her director. He's her business manager. He sees her a lot more often. Naturally. Naturally. Hello, Frank. Ma'am. Now, this is Frank Harper, Mr. Shane. Frank, Mr. Shane. Hello. Shane? Michael Shane? Yeah. I've been trying to find out, very unsuccessfully, just what Mr. Shane is doing here. He's a private detective. So he said. Private detective? Yeah. Look, uh, I wasn't trying to be coy. I didn't want to say anything about it until I was sure Christina had told you. Well, she certainly didn't tell me anything. She, she said something to you, Harper? No, she said nothing, Shane. Oh, uh -huh. that's interesting. Oh, uh, uh, curtain. Absolutely the worst performance I've ever given in my life. Atrocious, simply atrocious. I'll never, never... Ham, how was I really? Why, you, uh... Well, you played a little differently tonight. More introspection and uh, something else. You seemed preoccupied. I didn't like it quite as well. Oh. Frank, what did you think? I thought it was good. Look, I suppose the three of you have met. I'm sorry, Mike. This is Ham Dunn, the greatest director there is. Yeah, yeah, we've all met. Uh, Christina, is something the matter? Matter? What do you mean? Mr. Shane is a private detective. Miss Bancroft, some people to see. Yes. Uh, look, Cam, it's nothing really. I, I don't want you, uh, Frank, to worry about it. I just want Mike to sort of do a little work for me. Uh, I'll tell you all about it later. I I've got to Ms. go now. Miss Bancroft. Yes, I'm coming. Uh, Christina, I, um, I thought maybe we could all, uh, well, all of us could have supper at our nose this evening. Oh, I'm sorry, Ham. I wanted to talk to Mike about some things, but some other time real soon. Uh, all right, Christina. Uh, Frank, you don't mind, do you? No. I've got some business to take care of anyway. Business? I'll see you tomorrow. Christina went over to the stage door and left the three of us standing in the wings. The looks that Dunn and Harper were tossing in my direction, it didn't take my customarily brilliant powers of deduction to tell me that I was about as welcome as a bumblebee in a phone booth. So I went back to Christina's dressing room and waited for her there. Pretty soon she came charging in and the sparks were flying again. Mike, you can see what this thing is doing to me. That atrocious performance of mine tonight. It was just that I was completely terrified. I thought anything All right, all right. Let's get out of overdrive, huh? But don't you in... see... Who is it? Lyle's Miss Bancroft. Oh, all right, Bob. Bring them in, please. Just set them down there. Is there a Yes, sir. Yeah, it is. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Looks like some florist made enough on that sand or a tire. Quite up to your standard tonight, my dear, but superb as usual. Everett. Of course, he'd notice. Oh, Everett? What does he expect perfection every night? Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Everett Leverett. Everett Leverett? What is that? A word game or somebody's name? Everett's my number one admirer. Follows the show everywhere, goes to each performance, and follows every night. Each performance? Doesn't he have anything else to do? Apparently not. Well, uh, I mean. Oh, skip it. Look, let, let's get back to this unknown guy who wants to kill you. Oh, Mike, you don't know what it's like to walk back and forth on that stage and think that maybe someone beyond those footlights whose face is only a blur is waiting, just waiting for a chance Yeah, to... yeah, now look, do me a favor, will you, Miss Bancroft? What? Just sit back and relax for a minute. Let me talk. Yes. Now, you called me down here to ask me to protect you from someone you say is trying to kill you. You don't know who or why. Now, what I want to know is what gave you the idea. Have you any evidence that someone's oh, out to... Oh, yes, I have my several things. All right, let's have them. Well, there was a telephone call a couple of days ago. A man, he told me then what he was going to do. Anyone around when you got the call? Well, I don't remember. Then there was a note yesterday threatening me. Where is it? I, I threw it away. Why? Then, because I didn't take it seriously. Then this morning I came down. He was walking backstage. A sandbag dropped. Just missed me. Anyone else around then? Well, I don't think so. That's then enough. I have been lots of times. That's but... enough. You're lying to me. Yes. Yes, I'm lying to you. This isn't an unknown crank who's after you. No, it isn't. You know who's trying to kill you and why. Now, let's have it. All right, Mike. They think I'm in love with Frank Harper, my business manager. They? Who's they? Ham Dunn and Everett. Your director and the man who sends you flowers. Well, are you in love with Harper? No. But they won't believe me. And they both told me that if they can't have me, nobody else will. I think they mean it, Mike. I think either one of them is perfectly capable and willing to... 
kill me or anyone else who stands in their way. In a moment, we'll return to the new adventures of Mike Shane and the case of the left-handed fan. Well, it all started when an actress named Christina Bancroft asked me to protect her for the three days she was going to be playing in New Orleans. Seems that her director, Hamilton Dunn, and a wealthy admirer of hers with the quaint name of Everett Leverett had both told her that if they couldn't have her, nobody else would either. Yeah, all in all, it looked like just the kind of setup where somebody was apt to wind up dead. My job was to see that it wasn't Christina. The next day was Sunday, and bright and early in the morning, I was knocking on the door of Everett Leverett's hotel suite. He was a thin, elegant-looking gent, just about as well-groomed as a guy can be and still not be running in the derby. You say you're a friend of Christina's, Mr. Shane. That in itself is sufficient credential here, but uh, what precisely is the intent of your visit? I came to talk a little about Christina and about you. Two highly compatible subjects of conversation. Yeah. You know, I don't get you at all. Why... The usual question, why do I follow Christina around from city to city? Oh, that's it. Because I have found in Christina the one thing that all men seek, Mr. Shane. What's that? What indeed? The perfect foil for oneself. Uh, yeah. I don't get what's in it for you, though, all this traipsing around. Let us say that my life is not without its occasional satisfactions, Mr. Shane. Oh? All men love Christina. My distinction is that of them all, I alone understand her. Really understand her. She knows this. What do you mean, understand her? Well, for contrast, let's consider someone who obviously does not understand her. That third director of hers, Hamilton Dunn. You don't think he rates an Oscar, huh? The man has a genius for misinterpretation. He consistently fails to apprehend Christina's character in all his direction. She's complex. He makes her simple. She's dangerous. He makes her harmless. She's basic. He makes her superficial. Sounds like you made quite a study of it, Mr. Everett. Leverett. Uh, Leverett. Did it ever occur to you that uh, Christina might someday get married or something like that? No. I've made Christina my career, Mr. Shane. It's inconceivable to me that any career I should undertake might ever end in failure. Well, about then I decided a whiff of fresh air was in order, so I left. I was beginning to see what Christina meant when she said Everett Leverett would stop at nothing. But thinking of Christina reminded me she was still locked up in her hotel room, so I went over. It was noon by then. The two of us went to Galatoire's for lunch. As we ate, I kept thinking of all the things Leverett had said about her. After we'd finished, I began to see some of what he meant. You know, you're a very interesting sort of person, Mike. I'll never forget how you kept telling me to talk slower and get out of the... Overdrive, you called it. You can be sort of hard to keep up with, Miss Bancroft. You sort of cut me down the way Frank... The way Frank does. He uh, sort of cut you down, huh? You like that? It's amusing. You know, speaking of interesting people, you're not exactly that dull type. As far as I've been able to find out, almost everyone who ever comes within 50 feet of you seems to be in love with you. Yes. It has to be that way. It does? Mm-hmm. Well, look, this may come as a surprise, but I guess I'm one of the few guys who doesn't happen to be in love with you, Miss Bancroft. No, you're not now. But if you were around me long, sooner or later, you would be my. You would be. And all of a sudden, there was something in her eyes that was clear and unblinking and sure, like a black panther closing in. I took her back to a hotel. It was Sunday, and there was no performance. Well, that night, I figured it might be a good chance to get around to Frank Harper. But I was a little late. Just as I got to his hotel, I saw him come out the door, look up and down the street, then get into his car and drive away. He looked like a man with something special on his mind, so I followed him. He drove across town to St. Charles Avenue and along get a few blocks to an apartment house. I stopped a little way down the street. Harper got out of his car and went inside. First, I didn't notice the long black convertible that had eased to a stop across the street. In a few minutes, Harper came out again. There was a blonde with him. A very smooth-looking article, I might add. They got in his car and drove off. 
I got out of mine and started across the street toward the black convertible, but it was already pulling away in the opposite direction. Hey! Hey, wait a minute! Hey! Too late. The convertible had jumped away from the curb like a startled kangaroo. They couldn't see who was in it. The next day, Christina stayed in her room all day. And that night, I took her to the theater for the last performance of the play. It was also my last night on the job, and I wasn't sorry. After the show, I was standing near the stage door when a long black convertible eased into the alley. Yeah, the same convertible I'd seen the night before. And who got out was my old friend Everett Leverett. Where's Christina? Over there, talking to Dunn. Oh, yes, Dunn. Everett? Good evening, my dear. Are you ready? Have it on, Terry. Sorry, I won't be able to make it this evening, I'm afraid. I see. Frank and I have some business affairs to discuss. I see. But uh, maybe I could call you later, hmm? That will be fine. Good evening, Mr. Shane. Christina and Frank Harper started for her dressing room. I wandered around the wings for a few minutes, doing nothing in particular. Then it hit me that things were awfully quiet all of a sudden. I looked around. Hamilton Dunn was nowhere in sight. Neither was anyone else. I was all alone backstage. I suddenly got the feeling you get just before a storm breaks. I turned and started toward Christina's dressing room. Then I heard the shot and the scream. As I started running, I had a strong hunch I just lost a client. I pounded down the hall into her dressing room, then I stopped. Christina was crouched over in one corner, whimpering. But Frank Harper lay face down on the floor, dead, with a bullet hole in his back. Christina. Christina, what happened? Come on, stop it. Stop it. Tell me what happened. Frank and I were talking. I saw the door of the next room open a little. Yeah. Handle the gun. And Frank saw it, too. He jumped in front of me and the gun fired. Whoever it was dropped the gun and closed the door. Yeah, I see the gun. I'll leave it right there for the police. And there's a door leading outside from this room, huh? Yes. Oh, my. my. All right, stop it. Don't you understand? Frank got the bullet that was intended for me. In a moment, we'll be back with the thrilling climax to tonight's Michael Shane adventure. Well, right from the start, the setup had spelled murder. I had to admit I wasn't expecting Frank Harper would collect the bullet that was earmarked for Christina. I called police headquarters, and Inspector Lefebvre's boys were swarming all over the place ten minutes later. By the time they'd left, Christine had recovered a little, but she still looked pretty dazed. Well, look, you don't feel like talking, but I've got a couple of questions. Go ahead, Mike. I got a hunch you held something back from the cops a few minutes ago, right? Right. Let's have it. All right, I said I couldn't see the killer's face. That's true. But I did see his hand, holding the gun in the doorway. On the little finger of that hand, I... Could see a ring. A ring? What kind? I couldn't tell. He's dead, Mike. Frank's dead. Yeah, that's the point. It was almost you. So there was a ring on the little finger. Which hand? It was the left hand. Left hand. Right, thanks, Christina. It's a big help. Yeah, about then, it looked very much like this was going to be about the shortest investigation on record. When the police told me a little later what they'd found out so far about the gun, I was more convinced than ever. I went over to see Hamilton Dunn, the director. When I told the cop outside his door that Inspector Lefevre had okayed me, which was almost true, I got in. What if it was my gun? It was stolen a few days ago, and I reported the theft. Could have faked that. Shane, I didn't do it. Now, why would I try to kill Christina? I'm in love with her. That's uh, quite a ring you have there. Ring? Yeah, on your little finger. Well, it was just a signet ring, nothing special. Why? Oh, skip it. You got a light? Light? Oh, certainly. Light here somewhere. Oh, here it is. Thank you. Very much. The signet ring was on the little finger of the same hand he'd used to work the lighter. His right hand. So Dunn was in the clear. And in my book, that left just one guy to see. Everett Leverett. I must say, I'm glad to see you, Mr. Shane. It's been very dull sitting here in my suite. 
I can't go anywhere. That plain clothes chap out in the hall has some sort of ridiculous order. You know, that's uh, an interesting ring you're wearing. Oh, yes, isn't it? A rather foolish but grateful woman gave me that almost a year ago. Yeah. Now, look, I want you to write down everything you did this evening. Oh, not again. I've already... Here's done. a pencil. Do you know you're being awfully old school about this? Right. Oh, very well. That's enough. Well, I've just started. It's okay. You've already told me everything I wanted to know. Well, there it was. The ring he was wearing was on the little finger of the same hand he'd started to write with. His left hand. So Everett was the boy. I went downstairs into a phone booth and called Inspector Lefevre. Shane, Inspector. Look, I got your boy pegged for you. He... What? Huh? Oh, wait, wait. What's that about the gun? You... You sure? I see. What? Oh, no, no. Skip it. Doesn't matter now. I went outside. A light rain had started falling. I suddenly felt old tired, a little sick. I went back to the theater. Christina was still sitting in her dressing room. When she turned toward me, her eyes were hollow and lifeless. She seemed to be looking past me. Hello, Christina. Hello, Mike. It's all over. Wound up. It is? Yeah. You found out who killed Frank? You killed him, Christina. Yes, I killed him, Mike. You you said you saw a ring on the killer's left hand. But the police told me just a couple of minutes ago there were no fingerprints on the gun. So the killer couldn't have been holding it in his bare hand. You lied to me. Yes, I was lying. You couldn't have seen that ring. I'm glad you found out. You you found out about Frank's blonde girlfriend. That was you in the black convertible. You, you borrowed it from Everett. You were checking up on Frank. I knew. Yeah, you you knew all about the girlfriend. You couldn't stand a thought of that, of anyone not loving you. Particularly the man, the man you love, Christina. That's why you killed him. I killed him. I loved him. I killed him. It's different than I thought it would be. The black cave. I'm all alone. Christina... I did it because I didn't think I could stand as loving someone else. But I could have. I could have because I loved him. I wish he was still alive. Now you think of that. Now. Why couldn't you? There, there's a policeman waiting for you outside the door, Christina. There is? I mustn't keep him waiting, must I? I guess not. Thank you, Mike. Thank me. Goodbye, Mike. So long, Christina. She opened the door and went out. I could hear the cop leading her away. I sat there for a long while, staring at the slanting rain which drummed against the window. I thought about Christina... Or what she'd said to me once. If I'd been around her very long, I'd have fallen in love with her, she said. I was glad I hadn't been around her any more than I had. Because she just might have had a point. Yes, she was very beautiful. Very strange. <laughs> This is your director, Bill Russo, again. Our story is based on characters created by Brett Halliday. The music is composed and conducted by John Duffy, and Michael Shane is portrayed by Jeff Chandler. The New Adventures of Michael Shane is a Don W. Sharp production, transcribed in Hollywood and distributed exclusively by the Broadcasters Guild. Next week, you'll hear Michael Shane in another thrilling adventure from mysterious and colorful New Orleans. A 
I eased into the alley and waited. Pretty soon, a side door opened, and out came Helen. Just as I got to her, I heard a noise behind me. I started to turn around, but too late. A king-sized comet exploded over my right ear, and the ground came up and hit me in the face. <laughs> The New Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. Michael Shane, reckless, red-headed Irishman, back again in his old haunts in New Orleans. This is your director, Bill Russo, inviting you to listen to another transcribed episode, which we call The Case of the Gray-Eyed Blonde. Maybe Trinidad. Yep. And then, yeah, where's that folder on the Virgin Islands? Oh, yeah. Here. Yeah. Yep. Uh, come in. And then maybe Havana on the way back. Sloppy Joes. Girls. And... Well. Hello. Michael Shane? Mm-hmm. Hello, Mike. Oh? Helen. Helen. Uh, sit down. Thanks. From the looks of all those travel folders on your desk, I'd say you were planning a trip. No, I was just taking a poor man's vacation. Reading travel folders? Well, probably almost as much fun as actually taking the trips. I doubt it. Is uh, something the matter? Matter? You've been looking at me sort of... Oh, uh, I've never seen gray eyes like that before. Oh. Make quite a dent. Gray eyes, red lips. You, uh, come to talk about trips? In a way, short ones. Oh, cigarette? Thanks. Well, I have a match. Thanks. Uh, trips? Yeah. You run errands, Mike? Errands? Depends what kind. Well, I made a mistake quite a while ago, Mike. Big mistake. I've been paying for it ever since. Regularly. Blackmail. Mm-hmm. One more payment, the account's closed for good. So? So, I want you to make that last payment for me. Tonight. Uh, just for my own information, Helen, you're not by any chance asking me I'm to... I'm not asking you to kill anyone, Mike. That's good to know. No, this is all on the up and up. Here are two envelopes. The instructions are in this one. Instructions? Yeah, where and how you're to meet the, uh, man you're to meet. Uh-huh. When you do meet him, you hand him this other envelope. In return, he'll give you a small package. You bring that back to your office, I pick it up here. Uh, how would I go about getting in touch with you if anything went wrong? Well, I don't expect anything will, but in case of emergency, try my hotel. The Donna. Uh, you know, I just remembered a charge I might have to make in this particular case. Oh, what is it? It might be for you to have dinner with me or something. Dinner or something might be arranged, Mike. You'll take the job? Sure, why not? I'll pay you $100. I'm sure you'll earn every penny of it. In a moment, we'll return to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the gray-eyed blonde. <laughs> those gray eyes of Helen's, I don't know. At the time, there was something awfully compelling about them. Plus everything else about her, from her honey-colored hair to her alligator sling pumps. Plus, of course, the fact that I'd just gotten my license reinstated a couple of weeks before, and that hundred she was offering looked like a lot of good living for a change. So when she asked me to take the job of making a blackmail payment for her, I said yes. After she left, I opened the instruction envelope and read them over carefully. They were so thorough, I knew whoever this guy was, he wanted to be awfully sure he had the right party. I arrived at the indicated corner of Barrack Street ten minutes before midnight, ten minutes early. The street was deserted except for a little red and white peanut wagon that a small olive-skinned gent was pushing down the street toward me. 
When he got to me, he stopped. A peanut, senor? Uh, no, thanks. They are fresh, senor. You're working kind of late, aren't you? Si, senor. These peanuts, senor, they are the best. Uh, tell me, you uh, seen anyone around here in the last ten minutes? A man? Oh, you are looking for someone? Yeah, in a way. Then perhaps while you wait, senor, some peanuts. Uh, no, no, not now. Thanks. He gave me a very unhappy stare and then shrugged his shoulders and pushed his cart around the corner and out of sight. I started walking down the deserted street. My footsteps echoed on the pavement. It was darker than I thought it would be. No streetlights in this section. I kept trying to look over my shoulder, but I couldn't see anything. I knew that somewhere in that block, somebody was supposed to tap me on the shoulder, and I was wishing he'd hurry up and get it over. I was almost at the end of the block now. Still, nothing had happened. The building ahead of me on the corner was getting some work done on it. They had the front boarded up and had a boardwalk in place of the sidewalk. The street side of the boardwalk was boarded up, too. It was like a tunnel. I took a few steps into the pitch black tunnel and stopped. Something started bothering me. For a moment, I couldn't figure out what it was, but then I got it. Somebody was in that boarded tunnel with me. Before I could do or say anything, a hand slid across my mouth and I could feel the muzzle of an automatic against the side of my neck. Brilliant boy that I am, I got the idea that mum was a word. Then the hand left my mouth and slid down and started going through my pockets. Pretty soon it came to the envelope I was supposed to deliver. It patted the envelope and slipped it back into my pocket. Well, that I didn't get at all. Then the gun pressed a little harder onto my neck. I suddenly knew that his finger was tightening on the trigger. I dove for the ground, the gun went off. Red hot poker seared the top of my head and then blackness. After what seemed like about a month, blackness started to fade. It faded still more, started turning to white. I knew I was in a hospital. Then I spotted some bars across the windows, and I got a strong hunch it was the receiving ward of the prison hospital. I tried to open my eyes more, which was pretty hard to do, because my head at this point felt like two little men were playing ping pong with a hunk of hot lead. But I did manage to see someone bending over me. It was Police Inspector Lefevre. Not going to die after all, hmm? What odds could I get? You were lucky. This got creased. That's lucky. Looks like you had a little argument with your sidekick. Pretty one-sided argument. Look, Inspector, maybe you wouldn't mind telling me what this is all about, huh? That's funny, Shane. I was just going to ask you that. Uh Huh? Mr. Graber, will you step in here now, please? Yes, Inspector. Mr. Graber, I want you to take a good look at this man. He the one? I can't be sure. He might be. It might be what? Look, I'm the one that got shot in the head, if that's... Just what you... a minute, Shane. I'm going to tell you something you might possibly already know. At this point, what I know is just a drop in the bucket of what I don't know. Mr. Frank Graber here is a vice president of the South Atlantic Exporting Syndicate. Ever hear of him? Yeah, yeah, they shipped to Cuba, South America, lots of places. I did some work for them last year. Yeah, I know. Well, what's that got to do with... Coming to that. The day before yesterday, there was an unusually large deposit to be made. So large that Mr. Graber here himself started out with it. Something like uh, 60000 wasn't it, Mr. Graber? 62 In $1,000 bills. Yeah. Well, Mr. Graber never... Suppose you tell him what happened, Graber. Well, I went out the back door of the office building, and it wasn't until I opened my car door that I saw the man sitting inside. Had his hand up to the side of his face so that I couldn't get a clear look at it. But in the other hand was a gun. He forced me to drive down near the river, made me get out of the car and go into an abandoned warehouse. There he hit me over the head with his gun and took the money. That's too bad. But outside of welcoming you to the battered heads club, I still don't see what... That guy could have been you, Shane. What do you mean? We found one of those thousand-dollar bills in an envelope. In your pocket. About then, a lot of things started making sense. Why that guy in the dark wanted to be sure the envelope was in my pocket before he tried to kill me. Yeah, it looked like somebody was very interested in having me found dead with some of that robbery dough on me. Thus getting me elected as chief suspect. But I knew it was going to be a tough story to sell the inspector. 
He ushered Graber out of the room and then came back and stood beside the bed, slowly shaking his head. Oh, I don't get it, Shane. Not three weeks ago, you were telling everybody what a good boy you were going to be if you could just get your license back. So they give you your license back, so here you are, right in the middle of something that smells to high heaven. Look, Inspector, I'm going to give it to you straight. It was a frame. No sale, Shane. Believe me, it's the truth. A girl named Helen... Yeah. Oh, I know it sounds phony, but it happened. She gave me a song and dance about hiring me to make a blackmail payment for her. But what she really wanted, she and her boyfriend, I guess, was to have me found dead with some of this dough on me, thereby taking the heat off. Uh -huh. I suppose you can back up your story by producing this girl. I can try. Still not buying. Look, Inspector, I've always cooperated with you. Yeah, well, that's the only reason I'm even listening to you. So now I need a break, a big one. You can give it to me. The only thing I can give you is time. And not much of that. How much? Oh, my next way out. I know that. You're not exactly alone, though. Well, it's 7 a.m. I'll give you until 10 o'clock tonight. Huh? Tonight? Have a heart. That doesn't give me... I said 10 o'clock tonight. Make it midnight, then. 10. Okay, 10 o'clock tonight. And Shane. Yeah? That's it. One way or another. Funny thing about the inspector... He always meant just exactly what he said. So I had something like 15 hours to find one woman in a city as big as New Orleans. A beautiful woman with gray eyes who had almost done a very neat job of fitting me for a coffin. I lost two of those 15 hours getting part of my strength back and talking the doctor into giving me my pants. The only thing I had to go on was what Helen had told me about reaching her at the Hotel Donna. The desk clerk there remembered her just as soon as I mentioned the gray eyes. Oh, yes, sure. Let's see. Helen Collier she was registered under. Not bad. No, not bad at all. Uh, was registered? Yes, checked out first thing this morning. About six, I guess it was. No forwarding address, huh? No, asked her, but she said none. Well, thanks anyway. Might ask one of the cab drivers out front. Yeah, I'm going to. Thanks. <laughs> It didn't take me long to find out that none of the three cab drivers in front of the Hotel Donna could have taken Helen, because none of them came on until 7. But I did get the address of the driver who worked nights there, and 10 minutes later, I was pounding on his door. Yeah, 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 come here. What do you want? Are you Joe, the cab driver? Yeah, why? You have a fare this morning about 6? You woke me up to ask me that, beat it. Hey, hey. come on, Joe, open up. Look at friend. I don't know who you are, and it's just the way I want to keep it. Now, suppose you... I'm not leaving until I get an answer from you. A girl about 5'4", gray eyes at the Hotel Donna. Where'd you take her? I don't know what you're talking about now. Beat it. Get your foot out of the door. Okay, we'll go inside. Hey, 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 what's... The... Now, look. The more you talk, the more I'm convinced you did take her somewhere. Now, open up. I've been through too much on account of that great... Look, I, I don't know what you're talking about. If you're trying to cover for her, you're making an awful big mistake, Joe. A mistake that could put you behind bars. Uh, she paid you to keep your mouth shut, huh? Okay, here's ten to open it. Look, from a friend. Be smart. Keep out of this deal. It's too late, Joe. Here's the ten. Open up. I got more than that for promise. Look, I... I haven't got all day, and ten's all you get. Maybe that's too much. Maybe I could beat the answer out of you and save myself a ten spot. Uh, now, which just... is it going to be? Okay, okay. All right, now, you picked her up at the Hotel Donna at six this morning. Yeah. Where'd you take her? From a friend. Let me give you a tip. Don't hold your breath till you see her again. What do you mean? Where I took her was the airport. In a moment, we'll return to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the gray-eyed blonde. It all started when a gray-eyed blonde named Helen hired me to make a blackmail payment for her. Only I found out too late it was a frame. I got shot in the head and woke up and found myself accused of a $62,000 robbery and was given just 15 hours by Police Inspector Lefebvre to find Helen and clear myself. So far, all I'd found was she'd left the Hotel Donna at 6 that morning to go to the airport. Well, I was out there now talking to all the ticket clerks. Finally, I found one who remembered her. Oh, yes, uh, surely. Uh, those eyes of hers would be hard to forget. Well, which plane did she leave on, do you remember? Let's see, I... Uh, New York, 
No, that wasn't it. Oh, come uh, on, come on. Try to remember. Now, wait a minute. Oh, I, I remember now. Don't tell me it's that plane that's taking off out there. No, she didn't leave at all. What? No, I bought a ticket to Havana. Midnight plane. Tonight. Well, at least I knew she was still in New Orleans. Of course, finding would be something else again. And then I got an idea, a long shot maybe. But right now, the welcome mat was out for anything that would pass for a starting point. I went back to the Hotel Donna and over to the desk clerk. Yes? You uh, remember me? I was in here a couple of hours ago asking about that girl with... With the gray eyes, yes. You uh, really got it bad for her, huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sorry, but she hasn't come back, and I told you she didn't leave a forwarding address. I know. Look, uh, her room, has it been straightened up yet? Well, probably not. Cleaning girl's a little slow. We're thinking of letting her go at the uh, end. How about letting me in the room for a look around? Oh, now, wait a minute. Oh, why not? You've got it bad for the girl, and that's tough, but we can't have you traipsing through that room looking for her forwarding address. It's, uh, <clears throat> against the policy. Whose? Mine. Uh -huh. Okay, I'll make a deal. Deal? Yeah. Now, here's a five. Let's just say I'm engaging the room for a couple of hours as is. Oh, well, now, why didn't you say so in the first place? Here, I'll get the key. My only chance was that Helen wouldn't feel any reason to cover her tracks too carefully, since according to her plan, I was to have been long dead by now. I practically tore the room apart. Nothing. Then I thought of the wastebasket. There were two things in it, a piece of Kleenex with the imprint of a mouth and lipstick and a torn half of a paper match folder. Some printing on it. All I could make out were the first two letters R.A. and below was the word cocktails. The name of a bar. And possibly, just possibly, a hangout of Helen's where she might be passing time and keeping undercover until that midnight plane to Havana. Oh, but which bar was it? How many of them started with R.A.? My guess was quite a few. But it didn't matter how many. I had to try all of them. I went back to my office. That was a mistake. I dropped into my chair and propped my feet up on the desk. That was a big mistake. I figured I'd just rest a few minutes before I started out. That was a bigger mistake. I closed my eyes. That was my biggest mistake. When I opened my eyes again, I thought something had gone wrong with them. Everything was dark. And then I looked at my watch and almost went right up through the ceiling. Ten minutes to seven. I'd slept all afternoon. I had three hours left. I started out. The nearest bar on my list was a place with a quaint name of Rat Race. When I got there, things were already in high gear. I went in, and then I knew how the place got its name. The music was tailgate and loud, and it all came from five guys in the corner. A few couples were dancing, I guess you'd call it, on a floor about three sizes larger than a phone booth. And the bartender sat at the end of the bar near the musicians reading a paper. I had a tough time making myself heard. What'll it be, Mac? Uh, you happen to know a girl... What's that? I say to you... Uh, Can't hear you. A girl named Helen, gray eyes, five feet forty, you know her? Oh, yeah, lots of girls around. I don't know, I don't think so. I suppose you've been asking too much to hit the jackpot on the first nickel. Uh, talk louder, will you? Oh, skip it. I threaded my way through the dancers and the smoke and went out. One down, eight to go. I checked the rat race off my list, went to a place called Rady's in a pretty seamy neighborhood. It was a lot darker than the rat race here and a lot quieter. Hospitable, too. I'd hardly gotten inside before a furnace-eyed brunette sidled up. Hello. Hello. You looking for someone? Yeah, yeah. Here I am. Uh, no, no. The girl I'm looking for is named Helen. Gray eyes. Oh, no, 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 Helen. What's wrong with my eyes? They're brown. They're nice. Yeah, so I see. Would you like to dance? Have a drink? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, thanks, anyway. So I crossed off Rady's and kept going. And I kept drawing blanks. Rays, Ravaccinis, radio room. And it got to be after nine, and I could practically feel the inspector's official and heavy hand on my shoulder. My head was throbbing again, and I was getting weaker by the minute. So I guess I was none too steady as I walked down the street. And then as I passed a little red and white peanut wagon parked at the curb, an olive-skinned little gent darted out in front of me. Hey, senor. Uh, oh, you again. Senor, is something wrong? You... Uh, no, no, just tired. Uh, here, senor, have some of my nice peanuts. Nice, fresh peanuts. No, thanks. 
Say, you kind of get around town, don't you? See, si, but, senor, they're the most delicious peanuts. They will help I you. don't want any peanuts, now. But I tell you, senor, they're fine peanuts. The best peanuts this side of Havana, senor. Can't you understand it? What about Havana? Senor, what have I done? What have I said to a friend? Please don't let me go. What'd you say about Havana? Nothing, senor, nothing, nothing. It's just a place where I was born, senor. Havana, my home, that is all, senor. You know anything about that midnight plane to Havana tonight? No, senor, I swear it. I know nothing about the midnight plane to Havana except I would like to be on it. Okay. Okay. I let go of him and he darted around to the other side of his wagon. I staggered on down the street. I still wasn't sure whether he'd been trying to tell me something or not. I didn't have time to figure it out. I had to keep going. Then I went to Raymond's, the next place on the list. It was a small place, no music. Only a couple of people at the bar, and the bartender was watching me very carefully. Hello. What can I do for you? You uh, happen to know a girl named Helen? Gray eyes? No. Uh Uh-uh. I see. You, You happen to have a light on you? Light? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I walked back to the door and went out. I was trying hard not to tremble. Because the trail had gotten hot, very hot. That bartender had been just a little too quick to say he didn't know Helen. If I needed any more proof, he'd given it to me. The matchbook he'd used to give me a light was the same kind as the fragment I was carrying in my pocket. Yeah, I knew I'd finally found the place... I went around the corner, eased into the alley, and waited. Pretty soon, a side door opened, and out came Helen. Hey! Hey, wait a minute! Well, hello, Mike. You really shouldn't have, you know. Found you? Mm Mm-hmm. Better look behind you. Oh, no. That's too old a gag to... moment, we'll be back with a thrilling climax to tonight's Michael Shane adventure. I guess the business of one thing canceling out another is true. That hit on the head sort of blotted out the throbbing of the wound. When I came to and found myself lying on the floor in a little room, my head was a lot better than I'd figured. Numb, I guess. I could hear voices... Two of them. Stupid things to do. I told you. And to suddenly they began alone. registering. I couldn't help it, Helen. I had to oh. see you. Well, it's a good thing I did too. Shane was almost ready to grab you when I hit him just now. It's all your fault, anyway. Why didn't you finish the job last night when you had him on the board? I walk? tried Wait to. Uh, oh, he's coming to. Yeah, yeah, I've come to. So, trustworthy vice president, Mr. Frank Graber, is the big boy of the deal. Now, you shut up, Shane. You might get an argument as to who the brains really was, Mike, but it doesn't matter now. Pretty neat. Grable walks off with the money and tells the police a fairy tale about being robbed. Then the two of you nominate me for the fall guy. Graber's supposed to kill me, so I'll be found with some of the dough and therefore become the chief suspect. Only Graber misses. Figured it all out, didn't you, Mike? Well, Frank, I guess there's only one thing to do. Yes. And I knew what that one thing was. I knew I had to think fast and act fast to prevent that one thing from happening. If I could just divert their attention from me long enough for a dive at the window or door. And then I thought of something. Something that might possibly take their minds off me for just a second. Come on, Frank, get it over with. I, uh, I suppose you've told Graber about that plane ticket, Helen. What? Uh, to Havana on the midnight plane. What ticket? Why, he doesn't know what he's saying, No, no, Frank. no, wait. What ticket? Don't you see? He's just trying to upset you. You bought a ticket you... on the midnight plane to Havana. Frank, I didn't... You were going to run out on me. Oh, don't be silly. You were going to take all that money and run out on That's me. That's not true. I told you I wasn't. I guess I knew all along, Helen. Only I just wouldn't face it. But I guess I knew all along. What are you talking about? I knew. All the time you were telling me you loved me. What? How we'd wait until the heat was off and then I'd retire on account of ill health. And no, we'd I take didn't... the money and go to South America and have a wonderful time. Frank... All the time you were telling me those things, what? I... I knew you didn't mean them. I knew it. I wanted to believe it. I wanted you're to. you're all wrong. You kept I meant... working on me. You finally got me to do this thing. Because you were like a disease. Well, you were in my blood. Not... Now you are going to run out on me. But I won't let you. No, Frank, that's not true. It's too bad. No. You won't get to use that ticket. Helen, my darling. Frank. 
Suddenly there was a gun in his hand. It was pointed at Helen. I could see she didn't believe it, but I did. I dove at him, and just as I hit him, the gun went off. Helen slowly sagged to the floor. I got hold of his wrist, but I was off balance, and he was bringing the gun slowly around toward me. And, and then, just as it got to me, I twisted as hard as I could, and we both went down, and the gun went off again. <laughs> then the gun dropped out of his hand. He just sort of crumpled over and lay still. I stared hard at the widening red stain on his coat, right over his heart. Well, I got a call through to the inspector right away, and he sort of took over from there. And that was just about that, with all the loose ends tied up one way or another. Oh, yeah, except one, that plane ticket to Havana, the one Helen had bought. Nobody seemed to know quite what to do with it. Because she'd bought it with her own money instead of the robbery dough. Of course, I had an idea what to do with it, but, well, I gave it up after a while. I, I guess the little peanut vendor needed it more than I did. Of course, I didn't just give it to him. It was strictly a business deal. Yeah, I traded him the ticket for his peanut wagon. So now, if the detective business ever gets too tough, well, I've always got a sideline. <laughs> This is your director, Bill Russo, again. Our story is based on characters created by Brett Halliday. The music is composed and conducted by John Duffy, and Michael Shane is portrayed by Jeff Chandler. The New Adventures of Michael Shane is a Don W. Sharp production, transcribed in Hollywood and distributed exclusively by the Broadcasters Guild. Next week, you'll hear Michael Shane in another thrilling adventure from the mysterious and colorful New Orleans. She closed my office door behind her, started walking slowly toward me. Her lips looked warm. Her eyes looked cool. Matter of fact, everything about her looked awfully good to me, except for one thing. That big black gun she was pointing at my belt buckle. The New Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. Michael Shane, reckless, red-headed Irishman, is back again in his old haunts in New Orleans. This is your director, Bill Russo, inviting you to listen to another transcribed episode, which we call The Case of the Wandering Fingerprints. Yeah, what'll it be, bud? Huh? Oh. Nothing. I'm just waiting for somebody. Nothing. Look, Mac, you're in a bar. People usually drink in bars. That's what we're in business for. Okay, okay. Give me a give me a bottle of pop. A what? A bottle of pop. That's what I thought you said. Look, Junior, do you mind? No. Uh -uh. Thanks. Mike Shane? Uh, yeah. I'm Ziegler. Bring your drink over to the table here. Okay. Been waiting long? No, oh, just a couple of minutes. Well, let's have it. You said on the phone they'd be doing it. They could be. Well, look, Ziegler, let's not play guessing games. What's your pitch? You and I are going to be partners, Shane. Partners? What do you mean? I've got a little proposition you are going to go for. You know, you sound awful sure of yourself. Oh, I am. Well, let's have it. All right. Know anything about electrolysis? Electrolysis? Look, I'm no chemical engineer. I am, sort of. Enough of one to have figured out this process. This pro Look, will you do me a favor? Start at the beginning. All right. I've got a process by which I can transfer fingerprints. You can what? Transfer fingerprints from one place to another. Any place. You're nuts. Am I? Can't be done. Uh, don't take any bets on that, Shane. <laughs> You'd have to pay off. Look, I tell you, it's impossible. It's simple. 
if you know how. So you dust the prints with a certain chemical powder. You follow me? You take a picture of them, then make an electrolytic plate from the negative. Then dip it in acid. Then you make a mold from liquid rubber. And there you are. Where? With a little rubber stamp of somebody's fingerprint. Look, uh, I don't know anything about this chemical double talk you're giving me, but the whole thing's impossible. You just can't... Like I say, don't take any bets. Now, here's where you figure. We're going to start a little fingerprint service. We, uh, we sign up various clients. They all pay an initiation fee, a large one, as a matter of fact. Uh, just a minute. What do these people get for signing up? Well, it's not so much what they get if they sign up. It's what they get if they don't. Yeah, that's what I thought. Their fingerprints turn up in the wrong place. Exactly. Beat it. Now, Shane, that's not a very wise attitude. If you think I'm going to be a front man for a blackmail racket... That's an ugly word, Shane, but that's more or less your job. To locate promising clients for me. I said beat it. You know, you're not being smart at all. Look, maybe you didn't hear me. I... All right, I'll give you a little time to think it over. But you'll come around. Yeah? Don't you take any bets on that. Oh, you'll come around, all right. Because, you see, you have no choice. And before very long, I think you'll see exactly what I mean. <laughs> In a moment, we'll return to Mike Shane and the case of the wandering fingerprint. Well, you run into all kinds, I guess. But that day, I'd hit the jackpot when a character named Ziegler told me to meet him in a bar and offered me the charming job of being a front man in a friendly little blackmail setup. I still didn't believe he could transfer fingerprints like he said, but he sure seemed convinced of it. I turned down his deal in a hurry. He implied I was making a large-sized mistake. Then, as I sat at the table watching him leave, I saw him stop at another table near the door. It was a cool-looking brunette sitting there, alone. Ziegler said something to her and jerked his head in my direction. The brunette favored me with a long, cold frown. Then Ziegler left, but the brunette kept dissecting me with her eyes. I got the hunch that she was in the deal some way with Ziegler. Finally, even though the expression on her face was pushing me back, it was just too much there for me to stay away from. So I picked up my glass and went over to her table. Hello. The answer is no. Well, what did I ask? What else would you call it? Look, maybe we'd better run through this again from the beginning. Why? Well, maybe we'll come out with a different answer. One that makes a little more sense. The answer will still be no, and that makes plenty of sense to me anyway. Good night, Mr. Shane. Well, I sat there with my mouth open while she walked out the door. And I was one puzzled guy. What that little conversation was all about was way beyond me. Either I'd missed a few key words here and there, or... else you know, the girl was passing up a great career as a mind reader. The bartender came over to the table about then and started picking up the glasses, so I left. It was still early, and I suddenly felt like doing a little of the town. So I called a redhead I know and asked her if she was busy. She wasn't, so we took in the town. The next morning, feeling chipper as a school kid on Saturday, I tripped down to my office, opened the door, picked up the mail on the floor, and started for my desk. Then I stopped. The chair behind my desk was rocking slowly back and forth, and it was occupied. Hello, Shane. Well, well, Inspector Lefebvre. Inspecting again? Sit down. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you uh, decided to move your headquarters here, or is this a social call? Wrong twice. Well, it's early at our shopping up. Now, let's see. What could it be this time? Murder? Maybe robbery? Robbery. Arson? Huh? Robbery. <laughs> Look, I, I was kidding. I wasn't. No, 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 wait a minute, Lefebvre. What goes? You know an old family named Chartier, Shane? I live in the quarter. Chartier? No, why? Sure. I said no. Haven't paid any social calls on him lately? Say, last night? Look, I told you I don't know him. Why would I be paying him a call? Just trying to give you a break, Shane, but you won't even go halfway. What are you talking about, Lafever? I'll tell you. Last night, the Chartier home was broken into. A bunch of jewelry was stolen. What's that got to do with me? I don't know yet. Maybe plenty. We found your fingerprints here. You... My fi... 
Oh, no. Oh, yes. Well, Inspector, there must be some mistake. My fingerprints couldn't have been there. Shane, fingerprints are sort of a hobby with us. There wasn't a mistake. They're your prints. How come? I, I, I don't know how come I... Oh, no, it couldn't be. You're pretty hard to convince. Oh, that's not what I meant. I, I meant... Oh, skip it. It'd sound like it was right out of a book. What would... Look, Lefevre, I, I didn't rob the Chartier home. Give me credit for more brains than that. I had given you credit, Shane. That's what puzzles me. Hey, hey, any idea what time the robbery took place? Between 12 and 1. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm awfully happy to hear that. Mm-hmm. Alibi? Yeah, I had a date with a redhead. Yeah. You happen to remember her name? Of course, she's a friend of mine. Patty Batterkirken. Patty Batterkirken. Now, Shane. Look, could I make up a name like that? You could. We'll check it. Yeah, I know you will, Inspector. And, uh, keep in touch, huh? Yeah, I know. Don't leave town. Mm -hmm. One more thing. What is it? How about a little shot of oil for your chair? Hmm? Well, as usual, the inspector left me with a lot of questions and no answers. Not even an answer about the squeaky chair. I sat there for quite a while trying to figure out another logical explanation. And I finally gave up. Because as far as I could see, there was only one answer. Ziegler was able to transfer fingerprints. And he'd taken this very quaint way of proving it to me. I spent a little while on a half-hearted search for a can of oil and gave up. I guess I must have been staring unhappily out the window for maybe 15 minutes when I heard a slight noise behind me. I turned around and looked up. There, standing beside my desk, was my friend Ziegler. Hello, Shane. You again. Me again. You, um... Uh, you had a visitor a little while ago, didn't you? Inspector Lefevre. So? What did he want, Shane? He just heard a new joke and had to run right down here and tell me. Ah, uh -uh. I think he wanted to tell you about that robbery at the Chartier place. And about your fingerprints being there. Hmm? Okay, okay. I don't know how you did it, but... It's very simple. I told you. My process. Yeah, yeah, your process. Look, you may not realize it, but I was just lucky enough to have an alibi for last night. If I hadn't... Oh, but I do realize it. I know you had an alibi. And that's just the way I wanted it. You what? Certainly. I didn't want you to get into trouble. This time... Look... I don't get it. But I don't want to get it. This little game you're playing, it's not going to work. I told you once, I'm not going to be front man for your blackmail pitch, and I still mean it. You know, you are hard to convince. Well, I guess I have no other alternative. What do you mean? Oh, just that I'd hate to have the same thing happen to you that happened to Al Metcalf. Metcalf? You have heard of Al Metcalf, haven't you? Yeah. Read about him in the papers. He's on trial for murder. That's right. Hey, wait a minute. Are you trying to tell I'm me that... I'm just pointing out that Al could have been a partner of mine. He had the same opportunity you have. But he was difficult about it. He turned me down. Cold. So? Yeah, they, they've got a case against him. It's three to two. He'll be found guilty. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. And it's interesting, isn't it, that most of the case against him is his fingerprints at the scene of the crime. You... you mean you deliberate... you... you planted them? I wouldn't want that to happen to you, Shane. So don't keep me waiting any longer. You won't exactly leave me much choice. Right. So you're my boy, Shane, from now on. And don't ever forget it. Inspector Lefevre's already had you on the carpet for robbery. Think of the fun he's going to have when he gets you for murder. In a moment, we'll return to Mike Shane and the case of the wandering fingerprints. Well, it all started when a character named Ziegler offered me a partnership in a fingerprint-planting blackmail corporation. I declined without thanks. So Ziegler promptly planted my fingerprints at the scene of a robbery, thereby bringing Inspector Lefevre into my office for an antisocial call. 
Inspector left after a few minutes to check my alibi, and then Ziegler dropped in. He told me he could, if necessary, plant my prints at the scene of a murder, like he said he'd already done with a guy named Al Metcalf, who, as a matter of fact, was facing a murder rap right now. Well, that sort of weakened my opposition. Ziegler pronounced me his boy. He told me to meet him that night in the same bar, and he'd give me my instructions then. After he left, I grabbed the phone and called Inspector Lefebvre. Homicide, Lefebvre. Shane, Inspector. Yeah. There is a Patty Batterkirk in Shane. Now, wait a minute. I... And you were with her last night. So you're in the clear on that robbery, I guess. Thanks. I don't get it at all. Say, incidentally, what's Patty so mad at you about? That's her? not what I called you about, Lefebvre. Look, you're holding a guy named Al Metcalf on a murder rap. You've been reading back issues. Metcalf's been our guest for weeks. Well, it's a bum rap, Inspector. Metcalf's innocent. Really, Shane? I tell you, he's innocent. Shane, I'll make you a little proposition. Yeah, yeah. You run your business, we'll do likewise. Look, I'm trying to tell you, Metcalf's fingerprints were planted at the scene of the murder. Yeah. Oh, I know it sounds phony, but it's the truth. It's a guy named Ziegler who can transfer fingerprints. He transferred mine to the scene of that robbery, and he framed Metcalf for this murder the same way. Shane, you're missing a real good bet. The pulp magazines are just crying for guys who can come up with stuff like that. Okay, okay, but I'm telling you, Lefebvre, Metcalf's innocent. And what's more, I'm going to prove it to you. All of which was easier said than done, of course. I went over to the library and spent an hour or so reading up on the Metcalf case in the papers. I copied down the names of most of the people involved. And then I started out. The first guy I tried was a pawnbroker. Sure, sure. No doubt about it. Metcalf's the guy who bought the gun from me. The gun that killed Joey Krause. I checked off the pawnbroker's name and went to see the woman who had been the dead man's landlady. I saw this Al Metcalf go into Mr. Krause's room that night, just about five minutes before the shot was fired. And Metcalf was the only visitor Mr. Krause had that night. The next guy I tried was a character named Dixon, who used to be a pal at Krause's. Motive? Sure, Metcalf had a motive. A girl named Bunny. She was Metcalf's girl. Then she got to running around with Krause. So, Metcalf knocked off Krause. But take my word for it. Don't go bothering Bunny, because she's my girl now. Yeah. All the answers were the same. Al Metcalf was guilty. He really had killed Joey Kraus. Well, about then, I got on the trail of a very interesting thought. Wild, but interesting. But also about then, my watch said 8 o'clock, and I was due at the bar to meet Ziegler. So I didn't have any more time for meditation. But I knew that somehow, some way, I had to find a weak spot in Ziegler. Something that'd give me a club, too. And then I thought of a gag that might just possibly give me that club. It was old, but it could work. Ziegler was sitting at his table waiting for me. As I walked over to him, I could see he didn't look very happy. Sit down, Shane. Yeah, thanks. You're late. A little. I don't like people to be late. What kept you? Look, in case you don't know it, I work for a living. What kept you, Shane? I was conducting a little investigation. Who for? Me, okay? Shane, you have quite a few things to learn about working for me. Your attitude, for one thing. It'll have to change. But we'll let that go for now. I've got a list of people I'm going to give to you. I want you to contact each of them and sign them up. You can start... Cigarette? Thanks. Here's a light. Help yourself. Thank you. Now. Oh, uh, just one thing. What is it? The girl. What girl? The brunette who was sitting over near the door the last time I talked to you here. Oh, you mean Susan. Do I? What about her? That's what I'm wondering, where she fits in. Well, let's just say that you and she and I will be sort of uh, in business together. I see. Why? Oh, well, just so after you left, I... I... Went over to her table. Well? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I thought we might make a little light conversation, but she wasn't having any. She can be difficult. Shane, all this talk about nothing in particular, I somehow get the impression you're trying to stall me. Now, that would be very foolish, Shane. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, Ziegler, I, I've been trying to stall, but it, it hasn't worked, so I'm not going to stall anymore. Okay, give me that list. I'll go to work. 
He grinned, gave me the list, and left. Yeah, I was right. I wasn't going to stall anymore. Because that stray thought I'd started working on before had come back. And what brought it back was my remembering I'd taken my drink over to Susan's table that time before. Yeah, I was pretty sure I had the answer now. But pretty sure wasn't sure enough. I scooped up my cigarette lighter and went down to police headquarters. I dropped the lighter off in one of the offices so that the boys could admire it. And then I went to see Inspector Lefebvre. Oh, that boy just loved to swing back and forth in desk chairs. He was at it again. Come down to tell me why Patty, what's her name, is mad at you, Shane? I came down to tell you I was wrong, Inspector. About Patty? No, about Al Metcalf. He's guilty, all right. Well, now, that's real good to know. Now, look. Metcalf's fingerprints were at the scene of the murder, huh? Where were they? Plastered all over the place. Yeah. Now, my fingerprints were at the scene of that robbery at the Chartier House. Mm -hmm. Where were they? Why? Believe me, Lefevre, I'm asking you the $64 question. Where were my prints? On a glass. Yeah. Thanks, Lefevre. No charge. Oh, are you leaving? Uh-huh. I got to see a girl named Susan. Need any help? No, this is sort of a private deal. Sure you don't need any help? Sure. Uh, there is one thing, though. What's that? A chair of yours could stand a shot of oil, too. <laughs> I walked out before he could think of an answer, but I had to hurry. I picked up my lighter and a few interesting facts with it and went back to my office. I sat there for a few minutes trying to figure out how I was going to find Susan. But I needn't have bothered. Because just about then, my office door opened. In came Susan. She closed the door behind her and started walking slowly toward me. Her lips looked warm and her eyes looked cool. Matter of fact, everything about her looked awfully good to me, except for one thing, that big black gun she was pointing at my belt buckle. Well. You just won't take no for an answer, will you, Shane? Let's not start that double talk again. I tried to tell you before it was no deal. Look, do you have to keep pointing that gun at me? And what's no deal? The setup with Ziegler. Set? Oh, I think I get it now. You don't like the idea of anyone else working with you and Ziegler, is that it? Well, look, Susan, I don't like You've the idea... You've got any... a great sense of humor, haven't humor? you? Humor? I don't think it's very funny. Neither do I. Look, maybe maybe I'm stupid, but none of this makes stay sense. Stay where you are. None of that little palaver we had the other night in the bar made sense either. I said stay where so you are. So you're working with Ziegler. I still don't see why... Oh, I'm working with Ziegler. That's a laugh. You're the one who... Hey, hey get back. Too I... late, sweetheart. You... Let go of me. Hey, hey. It's better that it was too big a gun for a lady to be carrying around anyway. Or aren't you, lady? Hey, no. No, not that. Now, now look, stop it. Stop it, will you? All right. That's better. Uh, now, let's get this thing straightened out. You're not working with Ziegler? Well, of course not. He he threatened to plant my fingerprints and implicate me in a murder. Well, I'll be... I... You too... Oh, sucker, me to sucker. You see, I... I could have been implicated, too. It, it was all innocent enough, but I could have been made to look bad. Yeah, we're both in the same boat. Matter of fact, it's sort of nice in here. You can let go of me now. But I still don't see how Ziegler could have gotten that glass with my prints. I thought you took it. Hey, wait a minute. And you can let go. Yeah, that bartender. Go. The one who was so anxious for me to buy a drink. He came over to our table and picked up the glasses right after you left. He gave it to Ziegler. He's our boy. Oh, Shane. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, I seem to have a hold of you. Uh, maybe... Uh, maybe we better wind up this Ziegler business, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, with an incentive like that, how could I lose? I charged over to the bar, but the bartender I was looking for was off duty. I got his address, though, and went over. Yeah, what's all... Oh, it's you. Yeah, it's me. You want to beat it, and I'm coming in. Hey, cut it out. What mind, you... Jim. Ziegler. Close the door, Jim. Okay. And Shane, back up against that wall over there. Well, looks like I hit the jackpot, Ziegler. Yes. And it's such a pity, too. Because this machine isn't going to pay off with anything except a slug. Uh, 
In a moment, we'll be back with a thrilling climax to tonight's Michael Shane adventure. Well, there I was. I'd figured out the whole deal, but at the moment it looked like there wasn't much future in being a genius. One look at the bartender and Ziegler showed me they didn't think so either. So you figured out my little scheme, eh, Shane? Yeah, lucky me. You know, I thought the mention of the Metcalf case was going to keep you in line. Oh, you pulled that one out of the headlines and tried to make me think you had something to do with it. It seemed to work for a while, anyway. Yeah, until I found out Metcalf really was guilty. We're wasting time, Ziegler. The rest wasn't too tough. I have to admit it was a pretty slick little scheme. Hmm, I thought so. Planting that glass with my prints, then making me think you'd transferred the prints from one place to another. Ziegler. Oh, uh, incidentally, you were so interested in the general subject of fingerprints, you got me interested in them, too. Yours. Mine? Uh Uh-huh. I got them off my cigarette lighter. Remember, you used it. Clever, clever. And the boys down at headquarters did a little checking for me. I found out a couple of cities are interested in you. Topeka, for one. A bunco charge there, I think. You're always a man for a fast deal, huh? You're very thorough, Shane. I admire it. But... All right, Jim. Yeah. Bartender picked up an empty bottle. Then he held it by the neck, swung it onto the side of the table, and broke it. That left him with a jagged stub in his hand. He started toward me with it. I I don't like broken glass, but there wasn't much I could do. I raised my arm in front of my face. Take care of him, Dykes. Well, Shane? <laughs> well, Inspector Lefever. How'd you know? When the boys reported to me that you'd brought in some fingerprints belonging to this guy, Ziegler, I thought maybe we'd better find out what was cooking. So we tailed you. Right into the oven. <laughs> Inspector, would you believe it if I told you I was awfully glad to see you? Yeah. Shane. Yeah? It's a good thing you didn't need any help. Huh? No comment. <laughs> Well, that was just about that. The fever told me I was in line for some 500 bucks from Topeka. The reward posted for Ziegler. So I was really on top, and I went busting back to my office to tell Susan to pick up where we left off. Susan. Huh. When I got there, she was gone. I waited, but she didn't come back. I'm still waiting. You know, somewhere along the line, that girl must have read the old fable about getting somebody else to pull hot chestnuts out of the fire for you. Not that I minded that so much, but at least she she might have flipped a few shells my way. Oh, well. There's always Patty Batter cooking, I guess. This is your director, Bill Russo, again. Our story is based on characters created by Brett Halliday. The music is composed and conducted by John Duffy, and Michael Shane is portrayed by Jeff Chandler. The New Adventures of Michael Shane is a Don W. Sharp production, transcribed in Hollywood and distributed exclusively by the Broadcasters Guild. Michael Shane, you must have some idea why Judge Thorman wants to see you. Honey, at 3 o'clock this afternoon, I received a letter signed by those men who head Judge Thorman's campaign committee. Mm -hmm. It told me literally nothing, darling, all of which I was warned to keep hush-hush. Oh, confidential stuff, huh? Mm Mm-hmm, very. I'm requested to appear at Judge Thorman's home at 7 o'clock tonight. I don't know why, darling. That's all the note had to say. No, it's about 4.15 now. Uh Uh-huh which means you must curb your curiosity for two hours and 45 minutes. Oh, then I'm going? Well, it's not your company I love, sugar. It's your shorthand. Well, I'm glad to know something about me attracts you. Michael, do you know Judge Thorman? No. Oh, well, then Judge Thorman must know you. Otherwise, why should he... Take it easy, will you, baby? Please, we'll know at 7 o'clock tonight. The Hastings Manufacturing Company and the Kayside Corporation present Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. (laughs) 
At approximately the same time, Shane and his blonde assistant, Phyllis Knight, are discussing the mysterious note summoning Shane to Judge Thorman's home at 7 o'clock. Mysterious events are shaping themselves in Judge Thorman's study. The judge is conversing with one of his committee men. Eating at the club tonight, Judge? Uh, as usual, but not until after the meeting. Uh, by the way, has this Michael Shane fellow been contacted? Yes, a note was sent asking to him to be here tonight at 7. Oh, good. He comes highly recommended. Yes. If I didn't know you were one of my best friends, I'd say you didn't particularly care whether we ever find out who's making these silly telephone threats against my life. I was just thinking of this Michael Shane fellow. I don't think he'll be much help. Oh, Inspector Coyle and Chief Randall assured me he was as capable an investigator as we No doubt. Find. I'm afraid Shane will be too late. What the devil are you... I made those calls, Judge. You? What sort of stupid joke is it? It's neither stupid nor a joke, my dear Judge. Do you remember Carlton Winters? Winters? Well, yes, Carlton Winters, a forger. I sentenced him 16 years ago, it was. What of it? You won't know my face, Judge. But look at the hatred in my eyes, and you'll see Carlton Winters. But you You've known me as your friend for 10 years. Yes, it's taken me 10 years to ready myself for this moment. These hands you felt so sorry about. I deliberately crippled them so that I could be that much surer of my revenge. This face. Yes. I see it now. You see the man you sent away for forgery. The man whose wife later divorced him and married Paul Redford. You took everything from me. You were guilty. That makes little difference. You enabled Paul Redford to take Estelle from me. I vowed I'd pay you off, remember? It'll be over quickly, Judge. Quickly. The suicide note is ready. I have your own gun. Suicide? Only to outward appearances, Judge. It'll really be murder. Get that gun away from my head, you fool. No, Judge. Not when I've waited ten years for this. <laughs> All right, let's go over the facts, Inspector. Uh, Phil, take notes, please. All right. And incidentally, I copied those statements from Detective Johnson's notes, Mike. Oh, fine, fine, thanks. Well, Inspector? Well, the judge's wife... Dead five years. The married couple acted as Judge Thorman's cook and body servant. It's the day off. I checked and they've been at the relative's home all day. Usually on Wednesdays, the judge had dinner at his club. Missed tonight. There was to be a meeting here at seven. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Something about tracing crank calls. Say, these uh, three men on the committee, there was uh, Thomas Charles Hart. Yes, he's a retired businessman from the East. Oh, Horace Epperly. Big construction man, Paul Redburn, ex-prosecutor. Incidentally, all three of their alibis aren't worthy of the name. Not one of them can prove where he was between four and five. Well, now, go easy there, Shane. They're all big men. It's suicide. Yeah, so the note says, but I still don't believe it. Uh, Mr. Epperly found the body, huh? Yeah, about 6.30. Came in when he found the door open. Open? Open or unlocked, Inspector? Oh, sorry, uh, unlocked. Oh, uh-huh. Now, look, Shane, let's not make a mystery out of this yet. The judge is big people, and I'm here only to make sure there was nothing funny. Well, that's excuse enough to look around. The gun has a corrugated handle, so that eliminates fingerprints, right? Right. But there are powder burns on the right temple, and the bullet rains slightly upward. That and the note stack up to suicide. Yeah, but that note, that note. How does it read again? Yeah, this <clears throat> note. Yeah, yeah. My guilt hangs heavy on my mind. I can no longer face my friend. Some years ago, I sent an innocent man to prison. Wait a second, Anna. Give me that line again, Inspector. Uh, uh, some years ago, I sent an innocent man okay, to prison. Okay, that's enough, that's enough. Handwriting been identified? Yeah, by heart, Napoleon and Redmond. You know, for a fellow of the judge's caliber, it's pretty dramatic stuff. You know, people hopped up to suicide are psychodramatic. What's that about putting the neurosis on paper? It makes bad reading, that's all. Oh, Inspector. Oh, come in, gentlemen. Thank you. Glad to find you still here. We've agreed this terrible thing must be kept quiet as long as possible. Gentlemen, this is Michael Shane and Miss Knight. Hart, Epperly, Red. How do you do? 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 Uh, About keeping this affair quiet, Inspector. Well, perhaps for a day or two. We haven't much chance to keep the facts covered up. Gentlemen, please, may I ask... uh, did any of you know about the judge's suicide desire? We've never discussed such a thing with any of us. But all the evidence points to suicide, Mr. Shane. Yes, if we can believe that note, but I'm not so sure. 
Then you're thinking it might have been murder? That's what we're going to find out. In the meantime, Inspector, I want to run out and have a little talk with Joey Teller. Yeah, good idea. Teller? Teller, isn't he the man with a remarkable memory? Yes, Mr. Redfern. And I want him to jog my memory. <laughs> Yes, yes, what do you want? This fella? Yes, who are you? A friend of Michael Shane. Michael Sh- oh, 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 come in. All right, take a chair. Sit down. Don't mind if I squat here in this locker. He's on the back. Not at all. I'll stand because I can only stay a moment. Uh, Mr. Shane suggested I see you. I want some information. Well, what do you want to know? Mr. Peller, do you recall a rather sensational case about 16 years ago? When Judge Thorman sentenced the forger, uh, a Carlton Winters. Let me see. Yep, yep, yep. Mm-hmm. Quiet enough, Lord. You can recollect that Winters second Judge Thorman life. Yes. And Redford, too. He was a prosecutor. Very good. Anything else, Mr. Peller? Anything. Uh, huh? Yes, I do. Never heard anything more about Winters, but I think he was killed, uh, Died in an accident in Chicago. And I'm thinking. Yes. Mm-hmm. About it. What, Mr. Peller? About three years after when he was sent up, his wife, Mr. Spell was her name, I think. But she divorced him, and believe it or not, she married Paul Redfern. Yes. And uh, Redfern retired from public office. You've been a big help, Mr. Peller. I've well, been glad to help Shane's friend. Anything else, Mr. Mr. Lane? You won't need a Peller. <laughs> What you doing with that knife? You know too much, Mr. Peller. If you are like most car owners these days, you're looking forward to the day when you can get a new car, and the chances are that day is still quite a long way off. Meanwhile, it is false economy for you to cheat yourself out of good car performance and to take chances on a serious breakdown. Just drive your car into a good repair shop and get a professional checkup. Your serviceman may find, for example, that your piston rings are worn out. But worn out rings alone are causing oil waste and the loss of pep and power. In this case, what you need is to replace your piston rings with Hastings piston rings. They stop oil pumping, check cylinder wear, restore engine performance. So whenever you need new rings, it will pay you to get Hastings Piston Rings. They're tough, but oh so gentle. Tough on oil pumping, gentle on cylinder walls. Now remember that name, Hastings Piston Rings. The best money you can spend on your car. Now back to Michael Shane, private detective. It seems that Shane had decided on a step in the right direction when he decided to have Joey Peller jog his memory. But it also seems somebody is just one step ahead of Shane. Shane and Phyllis Knight arrived at Peller's home only to find the man with the remarkable memory stretched out on the floor with very little of either life or memory left. Now at police hospital, a tense group waits at Joey Peller's bedside. How is he, Doctor? And there's a chance for Slim. He's coming out of it again. Keeps going in and out of a coma. Joey. Joey Pella. Joey, this is Mike Shane. Shane? Nice friends you got. What? Nice friends. Michael. Whoever tried to kill him must have used your name. Is that what happened, Joey? Mm -mm. No, no. Joey, take it easy. Listen. Do you remember anything about a Judge Thorman case? Yeah. That's what the guy wanted to know. Thorman, right from the prosecutor, said, Hold you. Call him up there. When he died, he called him. He said, He's at Thorman. Joey. Joey. Sorry, Inspector. He's gone out again. Oh, poor little guy. Stay with him, Johnson. Catch anything he mumbles, call me on it right away. Let the newspaper say Peller's dead. That'll protect him. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. It's a great night. 
A little over three hours, one dead, one well on the way. Look, Inspector, Mr. Hart, Eppley, and Redfern knew I was on my way to talk to Pella. They've got a few questions to answer. Well, I know what you mean, Shane, but they're big men, and we've got to be right. Yes, but... Well, now, look. We've got to get every police record on this Carlton Winters. Samples of his handwriting, his fingerprint record. According to Pella, the guy's dead. Well, let's check Chicago and make sure he's dead. Well, let's get on it right away. Well, you take that end of it, Inspector. I want to talk to Paul Redfern. I'll be at his home. What's the time? Uh, about ten, Paul. Gives us time to check up on our theory at Peller's place. Then get back to your home by eleven to meet the others. Well, just what is this theory you've got on Peller's death? I'm positive someone was interested in silencing Peller before the Shane fellow could get to him. Yes, but what do you expect to learn at Peller's place? Hey, wait a minute. What? How'd you find out Peller was killed? Uh, Shane got in touch with me. Oh. Well, who does he think is guilty? He thinks it's one of us. Us? Are you serious, Hart? Yes, Redford. And I'm also Carlton Winters. You? What did you say? I said I'm Carlton Winters. And I'm going to kill you. Kill me? Just keeping a promise I made you long ago in court. But Winters died in Chicago. No, he didn't. Steady up a wheel. Don't take your eyes off the road. Then you killed Jeff. Yes, I killed him. Now it's your turn to be a suicide. Then can you guess who follows you? You mean my wife? Yes, Redfern, Estelle. They'll get you. If they do, it'll be too late. How am I to die? Well, it's rather simple. The hairpin turn is up ahead. We'll soon be on it. You're going to drive straight through the guardrail and down into the canyon. You can't force me to do that. You'll have nothing to say about it, Redfern. You'll be dead before you take the plunge. I'll crash the car first. You thought of that too late. I'm ready now. I hit you. Now, hold the wheel steady. Steady. Get the door open. Now. Two hundred feet down. In flames. A fitting tribute to you, Mr. Redburn. I'm terribly worried, Mr. Shane. No, I wouldn't let it get you down, Mrs. Redfern. But, but he's always so punctual, so thoughtful. Naturally, he was quite upset when he came home with, with the terrible news of Judge Thorman's suicide. He left again, but he promised he'd be home no later than 10. 10.45 now, and he hasn't even called. But don't worry, Mrs. Redfern. I'm, I'm sure he'll be coming home any minute now. Uh, I hope so. But now I'm terribly nervous. Uh, Mrs. Redfern, I'd like to ask you several questions. Yes? Well, first, have you ever heard your husband speak of a man named Carlton Winters? Uh, Carlton Winters? Yes, Mrs. Redfern. Name seems to surprise you. Well, I'm not sure why, but it did surprise me. Winters was uh, prosecuted by your husband and sentenced by Judge Thorman about 16 years ago. Yes? Well, Winters was supposed to have died in Chicago. An accidental fire in a doctor's office. Yes, that's why I... I showed some surprise, I'm sure. I remember Paul telling me Winters had died in Chicago. Must have been rather important, Winters' death, I mean, for you to have remembered, Mrs. Redfern. It was important this night. You see, Carlton Winters had threatened the lives of Judge Thorman and my husband. I was glad to know the man was dead. And that's all you can tell us, Mrs. Redfern? That... That's all, Mr. Shane. May I ask if your questions concern only Judge Thorman's death? Well, <laughs> yes, they do. But Paul said the judge had committed suicide. The pattern has changed. We're not convinced of that now, and we need all the information we can get. So if you know something you feel Mr. Shane should know, please tell him, Mrs. Redford. I, uh, no. No, there's nothing more I can tell you. I'm going to be brutally frank, Mrs. Redford. You're withholding something. Mr. Shane, I... Oh, that's my door. Would you excuse me, please? Michael, do you really think she's holding back something? I'm positive she is, honey. Do you really think it's one of the three men? Well, I'd be a lot sure if I knew what the inspector found out about their alibis, about the handwriting. Any one of them could be our men. Which one? Mm, take your picture, sugar. I'll take you. And what would you do if I... Oh, Mrs. Redfern. Oh, it's a shame, it's right. 
There's Mr. Hart, Mr. Eckert. Yes. yes, we met earlier this evening. They are still here to meet Paul. They would have a meeting here at 11 o'clock. Oh? Why a meeting? Well, to discuss what should be done about the party policy now that Doug's form is dead. There's quite a bit to be settled. Mm hmm. Have uh, either of you gentlemen had a talk with Inspector Coyle since 10 o'clock tonight? No. Why, sir? Well, he wants to see you, both of you. There are new developments in the case. What developments? Well, you recall that I mentioned the foreman's home. I uh, I was going to have my memory jogged by Joey Teller. Oh, yes, yes. What about it? Well, you, Mr. Hart, and Mr. Eppley, plus Redfern, who isn't present at the moment, overheard my statement. Well, get to the point, Shane. What are you driving at? Murder, Mr. Hart. Joey Peller had his wonderful memory removed by a killer's surgery tonight. Are you insinuating that any one of us... Ah, keep your people... shirt on, Mr. Rappley. I insinuate nothing. I'm merely explaining why the inspector wants to talk with all of you and find out where you've all been hiding out this evening. Hiding out? I'm not hiding out. I'll go where I please, when I please. Could I fix you some coffee? It'll give me something to do. And, and perhaps by then Paul will be home. Yes, that's a splendid idea, and I'll help if I may. Well, please do. Come along. Oh. Now, look, gentlemen. Let's check these facts quickly while the ladies are fixing the coffee. Foreman is a suicide, which I still don't believe. Joey Peller is stabbed. Now, we have information that Carlton Winters might be our man if he hadn't died in Chicago some years ago. But we're getting samples of his handwriting and police records. Perhaps it may count up to something. But what good would anything be if Winters is dead? No good at all if he's dead. And I'm not convinced of that. Oh, no! Michael! Yes? Please, come quickly. What's wrong, Phil? Just come along, please, and alone. Right. Wait here, gentlemen, please. Michael, we, we started off through the hall of the kitchen, and here, right here on this hall table, was a note. Here's the note. Mrs. Redfin read it, and have you heard her reaction? Where's she now? She's sitting in the kitchen, just staring. Read the note, Michael, you'll understand. Estelle, darling, by the time you find this note, it will be too late to stop me. I tried to fight. Oh, no. Michael, this is terrible. She nodded yes when I asked her if this was her husband's handwriting. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Oh, I'll take that on this hall extension. Now, look, honey, go back to Mrs. Bedford and don't let anybody even try to talk to Hurry her. Hurry up, Mike. Okay. Hello? Oh, that you, Shane? Oh, oh, yes, Inspector. You want to talk to Paul Redford? And how I do? Better forget it. His car went over Cliff Road into the canyon in flames. What? He's on a slab in the mall. Oh, this is a fine mess now. His wife's hysterical. She just read his suicide note. Not another one. Yes, yes, and just as phony as the judges. Look, Inspector, look. Tell the coroner to go over the body very carefully. I'll be right there. Right. Hurry it up. Phil. Phil, can I see you a minute? Yes. Yes, I'll be right back. And listen fast. How do you make it stick? Redfin's dead. Oh. Oh, Oh, my. He meant that note. I don't know. I only know he's dead. He crashed his car. Now, I'm taking this note and sticking it at headquarters until we know as much as possible. But what about her? Honey, I want you to stay with her. Don't leave her for a minute, and don't tell her he's dead. I'll call you later, or I'll pick you up. All right. But I think you should know this, Michael. What? I'm positive that note wasn't on the hall table when we came in. Good work, honey. Good work. Our pigeon is in there in the drawing room. Are they staying here? Oh, no, no, sweetheart. No, I'm going to convince them to visit headquarters. Well, how did our guests take the stay here, Inspector? Unhappily. If they were jittery enough to be gentlemen about it, especially since they found out Redford is dead, they left about five minutes ago. Oh. How about Winter's old samples of handwriting? Check with uh, any of the ones on the signatures on my note? Yeah, I just got the dope on that. The man says there's no question about it. We need more, though, Michael. Yeah? Well, I think we can get it now. Oh, hello, Doc. Hi. Well, what's the verdict? Well, I almost missed it. Something very thin punctured Redfern's eardrum. Went right into the brain, like a long steel sliver. But, Doc, if it was a steel sliver, who got rid of it? You? No. I couldn't find the sliver, so I decided it was maybe like a hat pin. Yeah, he was still all right. He was plenty burned and cracked up. So would you be if you fell 200 feet in a flaming car, but he was very dead before he hit. No evidence of fire in the lungs, huh? Not a scorch. He wasn't beating or breathing when he cried. Then it's murder. You've got your verdict, Inspector. Autopsy. Uh, hello. Yes, come on. See you, Inspector. Mm -hmm. Morning, sir. Inspector Coyle speaking. Yeah, Johnson. What did he say? 
That's really something. Good work. Stay with him. So long. More from Pella? Plenty. A bombshell. Estelle Redfern divorced Carlton Winters after he went to the pen and married Paul Redfern. Uh Uh-oh. Oh, that's bad. Epperly and Hart have just been released, haven't they? Well, we couldn't hold them. Oh, that crazy woman withholding information. Inspector, she's in danger. At 2.30 in the morning? Look, if my guess is right, our man is on a killing spree. His schedule calls for crowding it all into one night. Yeah, could be. Woman, Pella, Redfern. And next, and logically, the woman who divorced him and married the man that prosecuted him. Look, let me get going ahead of you and your men. Call Phil and have her set it up like this. We'll we'll say the same. You can't always predict the outcome of a mystery story, but here's something you can predict with absolute certainty. You can predict that your car will start quickly no matter how cold the weather if it has caseite in the motor oil. It's a fact, folks. Caseite guarantees quick starting in winter weather or double your money back. And only a product that really gives satisfaction can afford to make that kind of an offer. Now, just think. No more sitting out in the cold, struggling with a motor that refuses to go. Caseite retards congealing of oil, lets your motor spin over rapidly and start. And it reduces startup wear on your engine. And it saves your battery. Garages, service stations, and car dealers everywhere sell Caseite. Only 65 cents a pint. Remember, Caseite guarantees quick starting in winter weather or double your money back. You can't lose. Get Caseite today and start every day. Now back to Michael Shane and the trap set for a revenge crazy killer. It's about 3.15 a.m. The huge Redfern mansion is wrapped in the eerie glow from a thin sliver of moon. In the shadows of the porch, two men move softly, furtively. Wait. I think it's right for us to snoop around Redfern's house like this, especially with Estelle so upset. Oh, relax, Ethelie. It's only decent to see that she's all right. After all, you yourself were worried about her while we were held at headquarters. Well, let's get it over and get out of here. Yeah, come on. Yeah, let's try these French windows. I still don't think this is a good idea. If we make a noise and waken her still, she'll be scared out of her wits. If we find she's all right, we'll go out as quietly as we can. No, come on. This window's unlocked. That's not so good. Oh. I'm beginning to believe that Shane fellow now. There's a killer loose, I believe. Shall I turn on this light? No lights. Keep it dark. Now that we're in, what do we do? First, uh, go through the entire downstairs. You take the east wing. I'll take this west side. Well, what are we looking for? We're making sure everything's all right. Check every door and window. See that they're locked. Go right through and I'll meet you in the back hall. That's simple enough. If everything's all right downstairs, we'll check the upstairs. Then leave. Oh, I... But I still don't like the idea. Take it easy. Don't fall over the furniture. I won't guarantee you. (laughs) Now, to get upstairs quickly and arrange for Estelle suicide while my perfect alibi searches downstairs... Estelle, we settle accounts. And again. And so ends this night. Who turned on those lights? Sorry, chum, the night has ended, and so are you. Shane! Yeah. We didn't find out until after you left police headquarters tonight that Estelle was once the wife of Carlton Winters. So we figured Estelle was next on the list. Oh, so you got it all figured out. You think we intended to let you get Estelle? Oh, no, no, no. We preferred to have you kill off that dressmaker's mannequin under the bed covers. Dressmaker's mannequin? Drop Shane, that I... knife. Drop that knife, I said. I'll kill you. I'll kill you. Drop it. I... Oh, easy, you crazy idiot. I don't want to shoot you. Stop it, Hart. I'll shoot you. Not until I... Oh, thanks, Inspector. Michael, 
Thanks. Michael. Oh. Michael, what's wrong? Not a thing, honey. Huh? Not a thing. Michael. Oh. He's hurt, Inspector. Easy, Phil. Easy now. He'll take care of it. <laughs> Back. Welcome home, darling. Uh, thanks. I never liked this office, but it sure looks awfully good now. I'll bet. The inspector left this report for you. Copy. Hmm? Well, Hart's deathbed confession, huh? Mm-hmm. Yep. That's all here. You know, we could have stopped Redfern's killing if we had all samples of Winter's uh, handwriting to match his signature on the note the committee sent to me. Oh, you couldn't do any more, Michael. Yeah, it only proves what I contend, darling. There's a flaw in every human being. I'd say Winter's or Hart was insanely perfect. <laughs> Almost, but not quite. You see, honey, when a man decides to change his identity, he must change everything, even his own handwriting. Well, now that you think the office looks good, you might say, um, Precious, you look good. Oh, well, Precious, you, you do look good. Very good. Thank you, Michael. You're welcome, darling. You know, Michael, you ought to get stabbed more often. <laughs> Michael Shane, Private Detective, stars Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis with Bill Johnstone as the inspector. Tonight's story was directed by Michael Raffetto, written by Alan Cameron, and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. The music was composed and played by Len Salvo. This is Charles Arlington speaking. started to turn, and I heard something come down over me. I tried to duck. I heard a ripping sound and blood running wildly down my arm. A knife. I tried to grab the arm. I couldn't reach it. The knife was coming down again. The New Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. This is your director, Bill Russo, inviting you to listen to another transcribed episode with Michael Shane, that reckless, red-headed Irishman, back in his old haunts in New Orleans. We call it The Case of the Bloodstained Pearl. Just snap a double lock for now, huh? And hope for the best. Hey, hey, where are you going? I want to look down the street. I'm sure they followed me. The crafty scheming lot will tell you that. Hey, who are you talking about, Pop? My friends, that's who. My dear, faithful friends. Peaceful friends. They bought me in oil, skin me alive, cut me to ribbons to find out the hiding. Hey, look, you better slow down. You're going to burn out a berry. Scallions, scallywags, cutthroats, licks, fiddles. And chicken inspectors. What are these friends of yours trying to find? None of your business. You just keep that nose of yours out of my affairs. Hey, 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 remember, you came to me. Oh, oh, yeah. 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 Oh, it's just all so infuriating. Makes my blood boil, I swear it does. Three dear friends. For six years we've shared the same little houseboat. Same skimpy fare. We've watched 2,000 sunsets. Yeah. We've talked 10,000 hours of the night away. And now, <clears throat> Mr. Shane, what are your rates for guarding a man's life and possessions? I kind of think I might be a little too rich for your blood, old timer. Oh, a little too rich for my blood. Well, now. We do indeed. Well, 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 Mr. Look, I, I suppose you've come to that remarkable decision just by looking at me. No, no, this coat, these patched pants, cardboard my shoes. I, Too rich for my blood, huh? Let's shed a tear for me, poor old man Pete. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings, feelings but I... Feelings? Why the feelings? I come here on business. My life's in peril. My possession's in jeopardy. Despite your outrageous rates, I'll pay out of my meager savings. And just what are these possessions you want me to protect? Wait, wait. Hey, hey leave those window shades alone. It's dark enough as it is in here. Stop with nothing. Absolutely nothing. Now, Mr. Shane, now this is what I want you to protect. Yeah? The contents of this little leather bag. 
Huh? Yes, yes, what this pitiful old man wants you to protect. Yes, oh. Mr. Shane, yes, this is what they killed me for. In the palm of my hand, I hold three pearls worth a million dollars. In a moment, we will return to Mike Shane and the case of the bloodstained pearls. It had started like any other day. A widow named Mrs. Coppolis had hired me to track down one of her boarders who'd run away with her copper samovar. And, I fear, the good widow's heart. A guy had called to ask my rates for getting divorce evidence against his blonde wife. And then an old man named Peters came in. The kind of old guy you might see in Jackson Square, sleeping on the grass with a newspaper over his face. Only this old man had a million dollars worth of the biggest pearls I'd ever seen in my whole life. <laughs> well, how do you like them, Mr. Shane? Well, you, you could use them for snowballs, Mr. Mm-hmm. Peters. Where'd you get them? I found them three weeks ago in Little Cove along the Mississippi. Not so many years ago, this part of the river was one of the favorite haunts of pirates. I can feet. This might have been part of his treasure. Lost in the sea, washed up by the tides. Yeah. Uh, give them back to me. Give them here. Give them here. You've held them long enough. Yeah, they're all yours, Pop. Hey, did you ever have them appraised by a jeweler? I wouldn't trust them out of my sight. Even my own friends would kill me for well, them. How do you know they're worth a million bucks? I've gone to the library. Looked up pearls in all the encyclopedias. I've compared them with the descriptions of the very finest. There is no comparison. <laughs> Mine are the most beautiful pearls of them all. And they take them from me. Imagine that, my own friends. Well, if you were smart, you'd sell them to a good jeweler and forget them. Never. I'll never sell them. What could anyone give me half so beautiful as these pearls themselves? Yeah, I bet you a million dollars all stacked up real neat is kind of beautiful. Besides, looking in an encyclopedia, what's that? Huh? For all you know, these pearls came out of a popcorn box, and you're all upset about nothing. Oh, you think so? You think so, eh? Nothing. Well, all right. Just go to a jeweler. I saw one down the street. Oh, yeah, Mr. Forrest. Mind you, I won't sell them no matter what the price. But let him look at them, Mr. Shane. Let him tell you what they're worth. <laughs> Well, Mr. Forrester? Well? Go oh, on, tell us, Mr. Shane, what they're worth. He thinks they might have come out of a, a, a what was it, a, a popcorn box. Tell him, go on, go on, tell him. I've never seen anything like them. Mm-hmm. They're priceless. Ah, you hear, Mr. Shane, you hear, you hear? Now, give them back to me. Give them here, give them here. Yes, of course. My beautiful little ladies. Now, Mr. Shane knows your worth, yes? Now, he won't box you. Well, what would you say they were worth, Mr. Forrester? Well, I wouldn't even try to give you an estimate, Mr. Shane. Uh, thanks, Mr. Forrester. Come on, Pop. Back to my office. Okay, Pop, have a seat. Uh, uh, now you take me seriously, Mr. Shane. These people who you think are trying to take the pearls I from you. I don't think. I know. They kill me for Yeah, them. yeah. All right. You say you live with them on a houseboat, huh? Yeah. Off Pier 22 on River Highway. And did you tell them about the pearls? No, of course not. But I know they're spying on me continually. Now, wait. And Excuse me. Uh, all right. Yeah? Mr. Shane, this is fast, I'm a jeweler. Yeah? I thought I'd better call you as soon as you got back to your office. Why? Is the old man still with you? Yeah. Then don't let Arnold's talking to you. What's that? You mean... They are paste, Mr. Shane. Nothing but paste. At the very most, they are worth five dollars. Well, how do you like that? Shane, I wish you'd hurry. I don't have all day. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks for calling. Goodbye. Now, Mr. Shane, now we can talk business. I've already gotten a business. But go on, Mr. Peters. So old man Peters hired me to protect his five dollars worth of imitation pearls. I overcame the real Shane long enough to tell him he could pay me at the end of the month, by which time I was sure he'd be out of my hair. He left the office and I forgot about it. Then, one night, he caught me in one of my less happy moods. The office rent was two weeks overdue, three of my checks had bounced, I was stretched out on my couch feeling jollier than words can say, and the phone started ringing. Yeah. It's Look, Peters, I wish you'd stop calling me. I can't really take you anyhow. Threatened for a day and 
You wish I'd stop calling. Oh, what is it now? I know who's been following me. I saw today for the first time. Look, this is not good. It's bad for you and it's bad for me. You you come up to my office. I'm going to break it to you, gently. Break what to me? You just come on up, Pop. Don't you want to hear who was following me? You'll tell me when you get here. We'll trade little secrets. Okay, Pop, okay. Do you always have to knock like that? Look, if you break the glass, you're going to have to hock all your pearls to pay for it. Come on in and... Hey, 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 hey Pop, what's wrong? <sighs> Old man Peters was dead before he hit the floor. I don't know how he ever lived to reach my office. There were four bullet holes in his back. As he fell, his left arm flung out wildly. His left fingers doubled into a fist. I bent down to see what was in that fist. It was his most priceless possession bag of phony pearls. Before calling the cops, I put the pearls in my pocket, because now I was going to make it my business to find out who'd killed the old man. After the cops finished questioning me, I really felt beat. I went home to my hotel room and arranged my weary bones around the lumps in the mattress and drifted off to sleep. Then I had to drift right back again. <sighs> yeah, 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 yeah. Hello. Yeah, Tompkins. Yeah, hey, watchman, down at the office building. Oh, oh, yeah. I thought I'd better call you. What happened? Uh, somebody broke in your office a while ago. Huh? When was this? Well, it must have been between my rounds. I heard something, I came and looked. Everything sure was torn to pieces. Fine, fine. I hope they didn't get anything of value, Mr. Shane. No. No, that's what makes it so wonderful to be poor. Good night. I hung up and started going back to sleep. Just before I made it, I suddenly started thinking about the little bag of phony pearls that was right now in the rear pocket of the pants hanging over my dresser. All of a sudden, I wasn't nearly as sleepy as I thought. I reached my cigarettes under my pillow, and then I heard the tiniest sound. Someone was trying to fit a key into my door. The tiny grating sound continued. A couple seconds more and the door would open. I started for my gun on the dresser. I heard the lock snap back. I ran for the dresser. Dog, I stumbled over a chair. I heard a quick movement in the hall. I grabbed the gun and raced to the door. The hall was empty. Nothing but closed doors with numbers on it. The only sound was a guy in one of the rooms whimpering in his sleep. A nice, peaceful scene. Five seconds ago, I'd been close enough to death to smell it. Who had it been? Who had old man Peter's been afraid of? That was an easy one. His three pals on the houseboat. I remember how I'd laughed to myself when he told me they'd kill him for the pearls. Funny thing, I wasn't laughing anymore. I had the pearls now. In a moment, we'll return to Mike Shane and the case of the bloodstained pearls. It all started when a little old guy named Peters came to my office with a wild story of three pearls worth a million dollars. Forrester, a jeweler, said they were worth five bucks at the outside. Yeah, they were paste. Anyhow, somebody thought enough of the pearls to kill the old man. Now I had them, and somebody was trying to kill me. The next morning when I went down to my battered old office, I found a telegram among the ruins. Would like to see you this evening regarding the death of our friend George Peters. There was an address. It was dark by the time we got there. The cab had worn out three maps and his smiling disposition. Five miles out of town, right in the middle of nothing. A rotting wooden pier sticking into the water maybe 20 feet. At the end of it, a battered old tug. That'll be 275. Okay, here you are. She was sorry I dragged you out this far. You ain't half so sorry as I am, friend. Oh, wait for me, will you? I'll be right back. Drop dead. Uh, hey, hey, wait. Hey. Wait. In the darkness, the lights of New Orleans seemed a thousand miles away. I started down the wooden pier. There were lights somewhere on the tug. There didn't seem to be anything living around here, except for mosquitoes. I hopped onto the tug and started looking for somebody. And I heard someone singing. I followed the sound. Found a stairway leading down into the hold of the ship. 
The old guys were sitting on orange crates near a big pot-bellied coal stove. The one who was singing looked like Moses must have looked. Complete with a flaming red beard. Hey, you Brown. Just hearing it makes me feel a little better. Uh, <clears throat> Who are you? What do you want? I'm Michael Shane. Shane. This is Shane Brown. Brown was just singing Paul Mr. Peter's favorite song. Old George never got tired of hearing it. What can we do for you, Mr. Shane? I got a wire asking me to come down here. I sent the wire, Mr. Shane. Hmm, what, where'd you come? Oh, my niece, Mr. Shane. Why'd you send for him, Eve? To hear his side of it. His side of it. Mr. Peter's died in your office, according to the papers, Mr. Shane. Well, that's right, Eve. Papers also say they can't seem to find a motive for the crime. It wasn't wrong. See, they found his wallet as well. That's all they found. Oh, is there something else to find, Mr. Bryant? You see, you see. Yeah. I think you better go, Mr. Shane. Yeah, well, I've got some questions to ask, too. Last it's night, somebody... Long, long trail of Hey, will you tell this guy to shut up? Get out, Mr. Shane. Get out of my sight! I can take a hint as well as the next guy. Besides, there was something in old Brown's eyes when he turned on me. Or maybe it was a crazy red beard. Anyhow, all of a sudden, I wanted to be in the open air again. With the cab gone, there was nothing between me and New Orleans but a long, long trail of winding, like the man said. I started hiking down the road. Must have walked two miles before I came to the gas station. It was all locked up for the night, but there was a phone booth outside. I called for a cab. And then as I hung up, I'd have sworn somebody was standing right behind me. I started to turn. <clears throat> I tried to duck. I heard a ripping sound, a knife. I, I tried to grab the arm. and Instead, my fingers closed around the blade. I, I felt the blade cutting into the flesh. There wasn't any pain, just a warm wetness. I, I couldn't reach the knife. I, I found his wrist with my teeth. I bit down hard. Oh, hard. Ah. That knife hit the ground. Then I grabbed for the guy. My fingers closed around a handful of hair. He, he tore himself free, ah. running off down the road. I just flopped down on the ground. After a while, I lit my cigarette lighter to take inventory of the wreckage. It was some mess. One hand looked like second-quality hamburger. The other hand was okay. It still held a fistful of hair. Red hair. Yeah, I'd just given Mr. Brown's beard a trim. The hard way. <laughs> The cab showed up about an hour later. Instead of going to the city, I headed back to Pier 22. I was just groggy enough and mad enough to want the rest of that red beard. I marched down the gangway again. This time, there was only Eve putting a coffee pot on the stove. She heard me and she turned. What? Mr. Shane. Where is he? I'm going to kill him. Where is he? You heard. Look at you. Oh, never mind that. Just tell me where I can get my hands on that bearded old goat. you got to let me help him out here. Sit down, please. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah better. Only for a minute, though. Let me get your coat off, man. Good heavens, Mr. Shane, just look at you. Yeah, nice old man, you're, Mr. Brown. Hey, hey, easy with the coat here. Oh. He'll take the arm right with you. Well, Mr. Brown didn't. Yeah, he sure did. I've got half his red beard to prove it. I was afraid something like this was going to happen. I don't know what to say. You better say it with mercurochrome and bandages. Yeah, I didn't think it was this bad myself. <laughs> I think they'll hold you till you can get to a doctor. Yeah, yeah. Regular Florence Nightingale, aren't you? I mean, I bet you Florence never wore blue jeans and a green sweater. You still look pretty weak, Mr. Sheen. I'll get you a cup of coffee. Yeah, good idea. Of course, I like my mama's way better. Huh? When I got hurt, she used to kiss it better. I'll get the coffee. I was talking about mama. How much sugar? You really got a one-track mind, Eve. Two lumps. Well, as long as you don't want to discuss Mama, let's get back to old man Brown. Where is he now? I don't know. I haven't seen him since you left. Here's your coffee. Thanks. That's good and hot. You know, I'm glad you're not in on this. In on what? This whole business. Peters, Pearls, Brown. I don't understand you. Oh, of course you don't understand. It takes a particular kind of woman to understand. Now, I've been in this racket so long, I can spot a wrong dame like that. That's remarkable. Oh, nothing remarkable about it, Eve. They'll they'll say something. Or look at you in a certain way. 
You get to know you. You get to feel. A drink of coffee. It's getting cold, Mr. Shannon. Yeah. Yeah, everything they do, the perfume they wear, the way they dress, everything's a promise. You fall for the promise and end up in the gutter. I understand people like that, honey. But you don't understand people like Mr. Brown, do you, Mr. Shannon? <laughs> What's there to understand? A bag of pearls explains Mr. everything. Mr. Brown, with his ferocious red beard. You know what he was? Milkman, as you called him. Yeah, he should have stayed there. Trapped in a dull, monotonous job. Year after year. Find a pension off so he could crawl into a corner and die. Yeah, I... My uncle and poor Mr. Peters, they're like that, too. Wasting the last precious years. But always dreaming of escape. He's hiding here, isn't he? Found that escape in his old house, brewed on the Mississippi. Brewed that had been in the hand to buy it. Yeah. It was worth it. Look, I, I, I don't feel so good. Can't imagine how happy these three old men were. Can't imagine how far they became of each other. Yeah. Something wrong, Mr. Shane? Sick. Stomach, what? Your faith in me was a little premature, Mr. Shane. I poisoned your coffee. I started for the gangway, and then the gangway subdivided like something under a microscope, and there were two gangways. Then there were four, and then there were gangways everywhere. I, I hung on to all the railings. Tried climbing all the stairs, and then barring my way was Eve's uncle, Mr. Johnson. Only it was a whole row of Mr. Johnsons, and they were all holding ancient guns. I remember rushing past, rushing through the cold air. I remember falling to my knees just as I heard all the ancient guns go off. Last thing I saw in all the world were the headlights of the taxi cab I'd told to wait. My last thought was how funny I... Uh, most taxi cabs had only two headlights, but this one had half a million. Well, he looks like he's coming out of it, Doc. Yes, he's a lucky boy. Jane, you must have cornered the market on four-leaf clovers. You had enough poison in you to... Take it easy, Mr. Shane. You're going to be all right. Hey, who's this Eve? Eve, talk about. Eve, double crossing, Dave. Oh! Ooh. The cab driver brought you here, gave us the address. Now, look, you go to sleep, kiddo. I'll pick him up. Oh, oh, wait for me. Uh, hand me my pants, Doc. Mr. Shane, I absolutely won't be responsible for what happened. Hand me my pants. Uh, after what I've taken from those three, I wouldn't miss a payoff if it took my last corpus. But, Mr. Shane... Will you hand me my pants? And... Inspector... Yeah? Since I'm the guy they ran through the meat grinder, would you let me finish it off my way? Well, what do you mean, Shane? On the way out to the house, Ford, I want to pick up a jeweler named Forrester. So we picked up Forrester. The poor guy was so scared to hear us pounding on his door at two in the morning, I thought he'd never live to make the houseboat. It was almost three when we got there, but Eve and Brown and Johnson were still up, sitting around the red-hot coal stove like they'd been expecting us right along. Eve jumped up as we clattered down the gangway. Mr. Shane, Mike, you all right? Yeah, yeah, that coffee, it was better than tonic. You ought to bottle it, Eve. You really have something there. Mr. Brown, your beard doesn't look quite so flowing tonight. Okay, Inspector, take over. I'm arresting all three of you on the charge of murder. Murder? murder. What? Before you take them away, I want to show them this. Yeah, kiddies, here's a bag of pearls. I had them on me all the time. Mike. Yeah, here's what you killed old man Peters no, for. Mike. Shut up. You and all that corny talk about friendship... The three old buddies sitting in the sun. Yeah, blood brothers, until one of them found a bag of pearls. Then it was his blood. Don't you say that. Oh, I'm not through, baby. I'm just full of surprises. Like they say in the minstrel show, honey, you ain't heard nothing yet. Here's what you killed old man Peters for. A million dollars worth of pearls. Mr. Forrester. Yes, Mr. Shane? Tell them what these pearls are really worth. Five a piece. They're not worth five dollars. You hear that? That's what you shot the old man in the back for, a bag of ponies. And here's where the ponies are going, right where poor old Peter should have thrown them in the first place. Right into the stove. Right into the fire. Oh, don't be the scene. Hey, Forrester, what's wrong? Oh, the fire will destroy them. You stupid fool, I've got to save them. Hey, hey, get away from the stove. Get away from the stove. Save them. You're burned. A million dollars. Ah! In a moment, we'll be back with the thrilling climax to tonight's Michael Shane adventure. 
Someone finally pulled Forrester's arm out of the heart. And while we waited for an ambulance, Forrester blubbered out the whole story. How he'd killed Peters for the pearls. How he'd come into the hallway of my hotel that night and would have killed me for them. How he'd have killed a thousand times for such wonders as those priceless jewels. Now I'd destroyed them. I didn't hear much of it. I just flopped down, let my head fall on my chest. All that had happened was finally catching up with me. And then as the inspector started up the gangway, I waved for him to come over. What is it, Shane? Here, Inspector. Give these to the museum or something. The pearls? Yeah, I don't understand. Well, the way Forrester acted when we picked him up tonight got me to wondering. I thought, why take a chance? So all I saw into the fire was the cloth bag. Shane, you know there are times when I almost wish you'd joined the force. Yeah. With all my other troubles, that's all I'd need. Okay, kid. See you around, Mike. Yeah. Yeah. Mike? Uh, hmm? Feeling better? Yeah. Feel beautiful. You thought we killed Mr. Peters for the pearls. Hmm. We thought you killed him for him. We love the old man so much. That's why we tried to kill you. You know, Eve, you can be arrested for that if I want to press charges, that is. You want to? Ah. At least it wasn't all wasted. At least I met you, Mike. Yeah. Yeah, big deal. Well, I better be going. I'm pretty beat. Must you go, Mike? Mm hmm. It's cold air. It's down morning. Cut right through you. And if I stay, what would you do to keep me warm? I'll make you a nice pie of coffee. Yeah. Good night, kid. <laughs> This is your director, Bill Russo. Michael Shane is written by Larry Marcus and based on characters created by Brett Halliday. Music is composed and conducted by John Duffy, and Michael Shane is portrayed by Jeff Chandler. The Adventures of Michael Shane is a Don Sharp production transcribed in Hollywood and distributed exclusively by the Broadcasters Guild. <laughs> Fourth bullet tore through the flesh on my left shoulder. There was nothing between him and me now except the tree. I stood there waiting. There were two more shots left in the gun. I caught the glint of the gun barrel in the moonlight, and then the granddaddy of all firecrackers blew up in my face. <laughs> New Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. This is your director, Bill Russo, inviting you to listen to Michael Shane, that reckless red-headed Irishman back at his old haunts in New Orleans, in another transcribed episode. We call it The Hate That Killed. <laughs> $3.87. Michael, you old capitalist, how do you do it? Mr. Uh, Shane, Mr. Oh. Shane, you've got to listen to me. You've got to help me. Uh, I do. Uh, oh, oh, Sanderson. Hey, you look better in your newspaper pictures. I thought I made it clear I wasn't interested in your case. But on the telephone, you wouldn't let me tell you what I want. I've got plenty of money. And... I'm not interested in your money either. Right on that door, it says Michael Shane, private detective, doesn't it? Well, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. It cost me two bits a letter, too. You said something about somebody wanting to kill you. Yeah. Well, why don't you take your troubles to the police? I can't. I don't have anything to tell them. You think I'm a crank, don't you? No, I think you're very charming, Mr. Sanderson. Just keep your voice down. I know. I know a weak, dissipated body and a mind that's crazy half the time. But if you lived one day, just one day, in the atmosphere I do, you'd be shaking just like me. I tell you, I tell you, death is in the air. Yeah, yeah, sure. What's the matter? That scare you? I suppose you like divorce cases, alimony, spying on women. I'll bet you like spying on women. Well, that's enough, Buster. Goodbye now. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, 
I tell you, I, I'm going to die. Not in my office. I'm busy. Beat it. You don't, you don't believe me. Look, look, just tell me one thing. Yeah? One thing. Why did the insurance company refuse to sell me any life insurance? From where I sit, you look like a mighty bad risk. No. No, I've had an examination from my personal physician. There's nothing wrong with me. That is a matter of opinion. They wouldn't tell me the real reason. That was just an out. All right, so what? Just find out, that's all. Just find out why they refused me. Well, it'll cost you 20 a day in expenses. Well, here's my address. You, yeah. You'll find three houses on the estate. Mine's on the uh, on the right of the big house. I know all about you, Sanderson, and your famous father. He died the other day, didn't he? Yes. Yes, he's dead. And he wasn't my father. Huh? He was my stepfather. That's why I used the name of Mark Sanderson. But his corruption lives on like... Like something rotten inside you that you can't get out. Like something in your blood and your heart. And you can't tear it out. Hey, that's cute. You ought to set it to music. Are you always this jittery? Why shouldn't I be jittery? I, uh... Do you, do you have some water? Water? You mean you drink water, too? Yes, sir. My, my medicine, my, my capsules, you know, my nerves. You'll find some water down the hall. You'll, you'll let me know tonight, huh? You'll find out? Yeah, yeah. But I got a pretty good hunch why they refused your policy. You do? Why? Why? Because they probably don't expect you to live very long, Mr. Sanderson. We'll return in a moment to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the hate that killed. was a fancy client, all right. Mark Sanderson, stepson of the late Gregory Larson. He was still young, maybe 30, but all his stepfather's filthy millions could never make a man out of him or give him anything decent out of life. He sat in my office, slobbering with fear, his eyes dull and empty. I don't need clients like that, but the insurance company angle intrigued me. Why had they refused Mark Sanderson's policy? Well, I turned toward my phone, feeling like a Hollywood agent doing his best for a client he didn't have much hope for, and dialed the life insurance company. I'm sorry. You'll have to speak to Miss Bennett. It was the old shovel round. Miss Bennett was maybe the 30th vice president in charge of bathtub accidents. We cannot give out that information, but if you speak to Mr. Forsythe, he's the branch manager. All I had to do was mention Mark Sanderson's name, and there'd be a long pause on the other end, and then... No, sir, we can't discuss our policy with you, Mr. Shane. The matter is closed. It is entirely within our own discretion whether or not we choose to insure Mr. Sanderson's life or anyone else's. No, I wasn't getting anywhere. Nobody was going to tell me the real reason they'd refused Mark Sanderson life insurance... I got Dave Sizenby on the phone. Dave used to be a private eye and then went to work as a detective for the insurance company. And he said he'd see what he could do. I waited about ten minutes and then... Shane speaking. Mike? Yeah, Dave. It's hush, hush. Hey, what's going on? You're beginning to make me think Sanderson really has something to worry about. I don't know. All I could tell you is that it might be a good idea to see a lawyer by the name of Almsby. Who? Almsby. O L M. S-B-Y, in the Lee building downtown. That's all? No, one more thing. You uh, didn't get the information from me. Philip Olmsby, attorney at law. The office was easily as old as Olmsby himself. About 70. Dried up like a prune. His voice was like parchment, dry as dust and ready to crack. You're a shrewd young man by the look of you. And if you have in your head the good sense to avoid unnecessary trouble, you will desist from inquiring into the affairs of the Larson family. Well, that's as pretty a turn threat as I've ever heard. It's excellent advice, Mr. Shane. As for your question, I am not at liberty to divulge any information. You mean to me? To you or anyone else. I realize Mark's hysteria has caused you some trouble. And as the family attorney, I'll be glad to pay. Smooth. I didn't think I was going to take this case, Mr. Olmsby, but you know, I'm getting more and more interested. Then you will get yourself more and more involved. Well, that's my business, Mr. Olmsby. Mr. Shane, you must anticipate a short life. 
could be, Mr. Olsby. At least a happy one. So long, Pop. <laughs> I found out a few things before I went out to the swamps where the old man had dug in after he retreated from the New Orleans reform movement. He'd built a large house for himself, a smaller one for his second wife and stepdaughter, and another for his stepson. He kept his cousin Agatha with him. Seems he separated from his immediate family, kept tight hold on them, but didn't want them too close. And he'd finally died two days ago after a long illness. I went down there to his little kingdom in the swamp and got a funny feeling. A little chill, even though it was a warm night. Little rolling wisps of fog. Night sounds that had a death knell in them. There were lights on downstairs in the old man's house, but I headed for young Mark Sanderson's place. It was dark, and I thought I'd mosey around the house to the back when... Somebody was playing hide-and-seek with me. Okay, Uh, take it easy. Who is it? Just a friend, pal. A word to the wise thing. All right, I'm listening. You're not wanted around here. Who doesn't want me? Nobody. Okay, I get the message. Why don't you guys ever listen? This is for your own good, pal. I don't want to have to use this blackjack. You made a mistake. Never tip your mitt. You asked for it, but... You moved pretty fast for a big guy, but not fast enough. All right, I got the blackjack now. Come on, get up. Yeah, now beat it. Shane, you surprised me. Must be something to it, after all. The bigger they are. Well, that was quite an exhibition. Oh, are they wearing revolvers with dinner dresses this year? Who are you? Mike Shane. There's a flagstone path here. Let's get around front, out of the shadows. You must be Celia, Mark's sister. But do you, uh, you have to keep pointing that gun at me? Yes, for a while. Well, anyhow, I'm glad to... Oh. Yes? Oh, my. What's the matter? Haven't you ever seen a woman before? Not very often like you. Is that really the color of your hair? My hair has been red since the day I was born. You've got... Nice shoulders. Oh, I like yours better. You're going to catch cold in that outfit. You have what so many men lack these days. A sense of virility and strength. Well, that comes from eating all my vegetables. What are you snooping around here for? I was looking for Mark. Oh. You're the detective he hired. Check. Now you do interest me. Who is the man you were fighting with? Don't you know? No, I don't, Mr... Shane, isn't it? That's right. Mark and Aunt Agatha and Mother are in the house. Oh? The reading of Stepfather's will tonight. Um, Mr. Elmsby, the lawyer. May I come along? Why not? Don't go in. They've already started. So what? I want to hear that will. Who's in there? They all are. I don't want to interrupt. I'll open the door a little. Quite a gathering. Yes. Mother, Aunt Agatha, Mom. Hold it on. I want to listen. All my property, real and personal, owned by me at the time of my death to that person from among my four heirs who outlives all others. Whether it be my cousin Agatha, my stepdaughter Celia... My dissolute stepson, Mark, or my neglectful wife, Margaret. Why do we do something like that all the time? These goods shall be bequeathed, therefore, only after the death of my last heir but one. And in the event my inheritor cannot by law inherit, then these goods shall pass to Philip Almsby or his heirs and decide. (laughs) That's it. Let's go in, Mr. Shane. Okay. Oh, we waited for you, Miss Celia. We didn't know where you were. Thank you, Mr. Elmsby. Mr. Shane, did you hear that? Did you hear? There's your answer, Mark. That's the reason your insurance was refused. Yes, he couldn't stop hating. It's so obvious, isn't it? Dear father wants us to kill one another off. Mother. <laughs> Poor mother. He couldn't leave you alone, could he? Even after he died. Oh, my mother, Mr. Shane. Mrs. Larson. 
and my Aunt Agatha, father's cousin. Yeah, apparently, Cousin Agatha was bored by the proceedings. Oh, and Agatha's always taking catnaps. Agatha, Agatha, wake up. Maud, stop shaking her. Oh, she doesn't want to wake up. I... <gasps> Aunt Agatha. She... She's not moving. She's... She's not breathing. For a very good reason. Your Aunt Agatha's taken her last catnap. She's dead. We'll return in a moment to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the hate that killed. I didn't want to take the case in the first place, but it was the insurance angle that got me. Why was Mark Sanderson's insurance refused? I couldn't get any information from the insurance company. I couldn't get it from the lawyer Olmsby either. But then I found out what it was all about. The insurance company must have got wind of the terms of the old man's will. <laughs> and what a will. Old Gregory Larson's wife and Mark and Celia and his cousin Agatha, all of them were heirs in a sort of ten little Indians routine. All his money to go to the last one to stay alive or to lawyer Olmsby. And the old man wanted them to kill each other off. It was that simple. I wanted a few words with my client, Mark, and I waited while Sergeant Lavery went through his routine with him and then decided to bust it up. I want protection. I'm a taxpayer. I don't care what you have to do. Put me in jail if you want to, now but slow I demand down, protection. slow down, Sanderson. You'll blow a gasket. Where do you fit in here, Shane? Well, like I told you, Sergeant, this is my client. I suppose now you're convinced someone is going to try to kill me, Shane? I had a talk with your sister, Celia, Mark. You didn't tell me you lived here a few days before your stepfather died. Celia and I came here just before he died. But it didn't mean anything. You heard his will. Yeah. Uh, Sergeant. What? Why don't you lock him up? Maybe jail is the safest place for him. Okay. Speak to Denton inside. Yes. Yes, I will. I will. All right, Shane. Your client's taken care of. You can go home now. No, I think I'll stick around, Sergeant. Why? You think there's going to be more killings? Well, now, Sergeant, don't you? I was curious about Margaret Lawson, Mark's mother. Why hadn't she been with her husband the last days of his life? Why had he called Mark and Celia, not her? The more time I spent in this atmosphere of death and hate, the more jittery I got. Margaret Lawson was sitting in her living room. A low fire crackled in the fireplace. That was the only light in the room. She sat erect in an old, creaky rocking chair by the fire, a light glinting on her dark brown eyes that were just a little too bright. When will it stop, Mr. Shane? As long as I can remember, it's been like this. The fear, the hate. Yeah. I don't remember anything else. It's never been normal. His hatred touched all of us. That horrible, sick man inside his house. Never going outside. But you felt him all the time. Well, you once thought enough of him to marry him. That was my mistake. He hated you more than the others. Yes. Mr. Shane. Yes? How did Agatha die? She was poisoned. What kind of poison? I don't know yet. What about Celia and Mark? What's going to happen to them? Uh, Mark, by his own request, is in jail or on his way. Jail? Yeah, he said he wanted protection. Oh, and Celia, she's the kind who can take care of herself. Hey, look, I'm getting the willies or something. Can't we have some more light in here? I... What's the matter? Mr. Shane. You know what? In all the years I've spent in this swamp land, I've, I've seemed to develop an extra sense What are you trying to say? There's someone in this room. I don't hear anyone. You weren't supposed to. Oh. What? Oh, the sucker for a left hook. My pal with a warning. Don't move, pal. Don't even blink your eyes. I got a gun. I'm not getting too close to you. Come back for a rematch? I, uh, I better answer the phone. You better not. You. Yes. Answer it. Hello? Yes, Sergeant. This is Mrs. Lawson. <gasps> What is it, Mrs. Lawson? Mark. Isn't it funny? I, I can hardly feel anything. It's, it's Mark. Poison? Yes. The same as Agatha. Where? In his car. He stopped to take a drink. 
There was poison in it. The same poison that killed Agatha. <laughs> all right, Shane, this is all very touching. Come on, let's go. No, wait, just I a minute. Let's go. I'm getting out of this place is giving me the creeps. Mrs. Larson, tell Celia about Mark. She's in danger. Tell her... That's just so you'll know it's loaded, Shane. I'm sorry to spoil your rug, lady. Well, Shane, I won't aim at the rug next time. He was smart. He kept me at arm's length. The way he handled me, you'd think I had the plague. He was so calm and so careful, I began to worry. Give me the nervous guys. Give me the guys who think they're tough. I can take care of myself with them. But this bird knew exactly what he was going to do. He acted like a trapper who'd caught a wildcat and was measuring him for the kill. We went down the hall and out the rear door. If I was going to do anything, it better be pretty quick. It had turned cold and the damp fog clung to my clothes, got into my nostrils. I took a little path that led into the swamp. Funny, I kept worrying about Celia, about protecting her, not about myself. It was all screwy, sort of detached, almost a dream sequence. Things were happening too fast and I couldn't stop them. All right, how much farther into this swamp, laddie? We're here. Okay. Uh, go stand up against that tree over there. Here? Right there. <laughs> it was a big, fat old cypress tree, and I loved it. He thought it was going to be like an execution without a blindfold, but you can tell about these punks. You can tell when their finger itches. Before he lifted his sights, I was around on the other side, and his bullets tore chest high into the big, fat tree trunk. <laughs> Maybe your feet are showing, Shane. <laughs> I got plenty of time. I got nothing but time. This is the most important thing I ever did in my life, and I'm going to do it right. Now, careful, Shane. I'm starting to come around. Oh, it was going to be a dilly. I ducked my head out and <laughs> pulled it back in. If I counted right, that made four and one in the house. Five. It was starting to edge around. It cut like a knife through the meat on my shoulder. It must have been just a nick because it only burnt. It didn't slug me. Six. He was still edging around, coming a little closer, but he still wasn't taking any chances on my jumping him. The nick, you Shane? <laughs> Watch it now. I'm gonna run. Which side, Shane? <laughs> that spun me around, caught my other arm. Bullet hit solid. I almost went down. Seven. <laughs> you counting them, Shane? I got a couple of more clips when this one's finished. Here I come again. Who wrote that story about the hunter who wasn't happy unless he was hunting a human being? He must have laughed like this punk. He must have been off his trolley. I caught a look at the weasel's face and then... <laughs> it was like the granddaddy of all fuses blowing out. I'd heard about people feeling the wind of a bullet, but this wasn't a wind. It was a gentle sigh, a little puff. He missed my nose by a 32nd of an inch. And that was eight. I dashed out after him. But he was on his way, fumbling with his gun, putting the new clip in while he ran. Only he wasn't watching where he was going. He tripped over a log. I pulled up short and I stared. There were several logs laid out in a rough circle, sort of protecting a patch of ground. Ground? A punk had tripped and gone in head first and started to sink. His body thrashed around. The head came up covered with what looked like oily mud. Only then I knew what it was. Quicksand. It didn't take 15 seconds. And he disappeared. Even if I wanted to help him, I couldn't. He came too fast. I looked and he was gone. A couple of big bubbles came up, slick and moldy. And then that was all. On the way back out to the house, my mind was wrestling with angles and... Worrying about Celia so hard, I almost forgot I had a slug in my shoulder. I could see a light on the second floor of Mrs. Larson's house. I prayed that that meant Celia was still alive. I ran to the front door and began pounding. Why, uh, Mr. Shane? Why all the commotion? Oh, you're still okay. Uh, how about your mother? She's fast asleep in her bed. Come on in. Here. Yeah. What's that? Oh, her cat must have followed me here. That's good luck, Mr. Shane. And all new all in superstition. Let her in. Yeah. Sit down. Now, what... Oh, Mr. Shane, you're bleeding. Yeah, I almost forgot. Here, let's get that jacket off. Okay. <laughs> Easy. Sorry. Yeah. Now, I'll just tear the shirt open. <laughs> you uh, heard about your brother? Yes. 
Mother told me. In a way, I, I think perhaps he's better off. He never was very happy. My stepfather saw to that. Oh. Sorry. I've got to clean it out, you know. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Celia, I'm going nuts trying to figure this thing out. Your stepfather hoped you'd kill each other off. He planned it that way. But you and your mother wouldn't bite on that kind of bait. Thank you. The only other answer is Holmesby. He gets everything if all of you are taken care of. I don't have anything on him. It, it won't gel. I'm afraid this will sting a little. <laughs> oh. There. It's all over until the doctor takes over. Here, have a little of this. It's from my dear departed stepfather's wine cellar. Napoleon Brandy, 1812. Ah, don't often get a whiff of anything that rare. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. That was clumsy of me. I'll pour you another. <laughs> Anyhow, that stray cat's going to have a good time. He likes Napoleon Brandy, too. Yes, he does, doesn't he? You know, I think I'll join you. I have a weakness for good brandy. Fine. I have a weakness for women who have a weakness for good brandy. <laughs> Here you are, Mr. Shane. I... Mike. Hey. You were right, Sid. That cat was good luck. He'll be stiff in another few minutes. What? Yeah, that brandy is spiked with enough poison to kill Gargantua. Where'd you get this brandy, Celia? Why, I... I think Mr. Elmsby gave it to me. Back in a moment with Mike Shane and the thrilling climax to our story. Thinking about Olmsby almost sent me off on a tangent. The big idea was slow in coming, but it paid off. The whole thing fell into place. It was kind of hard to see all at once. It it came out gradually. Celia, your mother didn't go into your stepfather's house before he died, did she? She hasn't been inside that house in 15 years, Mr. Shane. Oh, that's it. Now, well, it's so simple, so so very simple. Hey, hey, let me have that brandy bottle. I'm taking it down to headquarters for a little fingerprint job. I don't understand. I'll be back. Now, you probably don't know it, but you called me Mike a few seconds ago. That's enough of a start for me. But what about Mr. Elmsby? There's a payoff for him, too. Hard to believe, Shane. There's no other explanation, Sergeant. Olmsby was the only one who knew the exact terms of the will. He'd get everything if the family were all out of the way. Yeah, he had a good idea what would happen. And, and he decided to wait it out. That's why he hired that, that character to get rid of me. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Olmsby didn't want anybody to get in the way of the natural course of events. Yeah, an old man hates so much he can't let it die with him. He wasn't satisfied until he'd fixed it so his rotten touch reached out from the grave. It's still hard to believe, but you can't argue with fingerprints. Sure. There was only one answer. The fingerprints on the bottle of Napoleon brandy and the fingerprints on Mark's flask and Aunt Agatha's special milk bottle, they all matched. His plan was simple. He figured all the suspicion would rest on his wife after Agatha and Mark and Celia were dead. Yes, the fingerprints all matched. They were the fingerprints of Gregory Larson. He kept right on killing even after he was dead. There's a moral in all this somewhere. Something about evil turning on the evil door and paying him back. I, uh, I haven't quite figured it out yet, but Celia's a pretty clever girl. I think I'll show her how the other half of New Orleans lives. Take her to dinner tonight and uh, discuss it with gestures. This is your director, Bill Russo, again. Our story was based on characters created by Brett Halliday. Our music is composed and conducted by John Duffy... And Michael Shane is portrayed by Jeff Chandler. The New Adventures of Michael Shane is a Don W. Sharp production, transcribed in Hollywood and distributed exclusively by the Broadcasters Guild.
I spun around, and it was death with a long stick that whipped me across the face. Again and again, it crashed on my head, on my eyes, across my mouth. The strength leaked out of me, and I tripped headlong into a merry-go-round of huge black horses. And then I heard the door of the tomb slowly swinging shut. <laughs> The New Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. Michael Shane, reckless, red-headed Irishman, is back again in his old haunts in New Orleans. This is your director, Bill Russo, inviting you to listen to another transcribed episode, which we call The Case of the Purloined Corpse. Private detective? I guess you must have had that all figured out when you walked in here. Why the gun? He told me I'd need one. He told me with a man like you, it was the only way. Why, whatever gave him that idea? He said that was the only way I could persuade you to come with me. Well, he must be quite a boy. Which head was he talking out of? I don't like your humor, Mr. Shane. I didn't come here to be entertained. Sure. Sure, shall we go? You... You mean you'll come with me? Just like that? Uh-huh. Wherever you go, Dollface. Only I hate no. to be hurried. Don't. Yeah. Yeah, I don't like a little thing like a gun to stand between us. Now we can be cozy. You're very quick, aren't you? Yeah, the girls call me Swifty. Now let's play all over again. Where are we going? Who's he? And what does he want? Josiah De Lacy, and he wants you. Josiah, De... you mean that mummy with fifty million dollars? Mr. De Lacy and I are not that friendly. I only take care of him, not his bank balance. Hey, you can have your gun back. Josiah was right. You'll have to persuade me. Seems to me I remember hearing Josiah DeLacy hasn't got a dollar without a blood stain on it. He's in desperate trouble, Mr. Shane. Well, take a message back to him, Dollface. Tell him I'll make my usual contribution to his home for homeless girls, and then tell him I dropped dead. You don't understand. He's a very lonely and unhappy man. He needs your help. That's why he sent me. Every morning, the population in New Orleans turns breathlessly to the obituary column, hoping to find Josiah DeLacy's name there. What makes you think I'm different? <laughs> because your reputation says you can be bought. Mr. DeLacy will double your asking price. Well, you convince good, Miss, uh... West. Catherine West. Katie, huh? If you want it like that. Well, maybe later, Katie. Every minute I waste now costs me double time. What's on your boss's mind? Mr. DeLacy's son, Ezekiel, has been missing since yesterday. Why doesn't Josiah go to the Bureau of Missing Persons? They work for free. Because Ezekiel is dead. Huh? Not only that, Mr. Shane. Ezekiel has been buried for a week. In a moment, we'll return to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the purloined corpse. I was scraping time off my hands with a fingernail file when Katie West walked into my office. She was wearing an emerald green dress and a bright nickel revolver. On her, it looked like she'd just broken out of a sultan's dream. She told me Ezekiel DeLacy, son of Josiah DeLacy, had been kidnapped. But something silly had been added. Ezekiel had been dead for a week. And in the cab on our way to the DeLacy mansion on Royal Street, she didn't quit surprising me. Why are you looking at me like that? I got a feeling about you, Katie, and it doesn't quite gel. Where do you fit in? How'd you latch on to DeLacy? Oh, didn't I tell you? Mr. DeLacy hired me a week ago. He had an idea he needed a nurse. How old does a man have to be to stop getting ideas? Look, I'm no Florence Nightingale, Mr. Shane. I'm a common laborer just like you. I breathe better when I'm around $50 million. Yeah, I can inhale it from here. Uh, you can stop right here, driver. Here you are, son. Go buy yourself an annuity. The DeLacy mansion was one big shadow, not quite a mile wide. It could have housed an assembly line where they turned pixies into ghosts. We rode up to the solarium on one of those staircase elevators. The top floor, we faced a wall of transparent glass. Through it, I could see a dried-up, tiny little man with a head like an ivory mask. Only it was carved with so many lines and wrinkles, it could have been an ivory prune. His body was wrapped in a heavy, towel-like robe, and around his throat there were more towels. Through the glass roof and glass walls, a false light crashed in. The whole apartment was swimming in it. The figure of Josiah DeLacy sat in the middle like a grotesque plant swaying in an undersea world. Katie pushed a button, and the heavy glass door whished open, and I went in. Shut the 
door! Shut the door! What do you expect me to do? Seep in through the glass? That's like a drop in temperature. The minute fraction of a drop lessens my life span by a year. Oh, why don't you light up a furnace and live in that? I thrive on heat. It's my food and drink. Every particle of heat is like a fountain of youth to me. I soak it up. Soak it up. You're saying, aren't you? Yeah, Miss West said you needed me. I do. You disgust me, Mr. Sane. What? You might as well know that now, but I need your help. Well, let's everybody stop yelling help and tell me what this is all about. The body of my son Ezekiel was stolen from the family tomb in Cypress Grove Cemetery. You wouldn't understand what a desecration that is of our name, of our pride. And of your son. He must be returned. He must be. Well, now, don't shout, Joe. I haven't got him. Why would anyone want him anyhow? Was Ezekiel buried with a family loot? Fool. If that was so, would they send me this ransom note? Yeah, let's see it. $50,000. Bring the ransom money to the cemetery at 2.30 in the morning on... Well, it's this morning. Now, look, my advice is... No one asked for your advice. Here's $20,000. Take it to the tomb and pretend to leave. But you will watch and apprehend the criminals and bring them to me. Well, how do you know you can trust me with all this money? I don't. But if you should be so stupid as to run off with it, I assure you there's always room for one more in Cypress Grove Cemetery. I do believe you have a point there, Joe. Uh, just as a matter of curiosity, how old was your son? He was 70. And you outlived him. <laughs> Maybe he didn't understand about this heat thing. Well, I'll see what I can do to bring him back. It's a matter of pride. Psh. Phew. Boy. How'd you make out? Oh, keen. Just keen. I wheedled $20,000 out of Joe. Cover charge for my date with a zombie at Cypress Grove Cemetery. $20,000? Oh, Mike, you'll be careful, won't you? I'll try to be, Katie. I'll try. In this business, you got other people's troubles. You can never tell whose side you're on when you get your trouble secondhand. At 1.30, I had enough of the all-night movies, so I walked over to Canal Street and hopped a streetcar marked Cemeteries. I went to the back of the car, took the packet of money DeLacy had given me, and removed a sizable portion of it. I marked the bills with a pencil and put them back in my coat pocket. Cypress Grove. Cypress Grove. I got off the car and entered the cemetery. Just to the right and back of the Chinese mausoleum, I found what I was looking for. The door to the tomb was open. I went in. The coffin stood gaping and empty and disappointed. I kneeled to put the ransom money on the marble floor, and then I heard it. The sound of a cane or a thin club whooshing through the air. I spun around. There was death with a long stick that whipped me full across the face. Again and again, it crashed on my head, on my eyes, across my mouth. The strength leaked out of me, and I tripped headlong into a merry-go-round of huge black horses. And then I heard the door of the tomb slowly swinging shut. Michael. Oh. Come on, try, Michael. Try. Yeah. How'd you get here? I followed you. I frightened them away when they heard me coming. Did you see who they were? Oh, it was too dark. You're a doll, sir. <laughs> yeah, the ransom's gone. All right, get me out of here before you really have to bury me. She was strong, that girl. Strong enough to get me up and out of there and back to my apartment. She kissed me goodnight with a smile and then she went away. It was a million years later when the noise got inside of me and kept growing and growing until I was one big noise all over. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Some days it's very hard to tell. Very hard. This is Miss Cleo Dauphine of the Josiah de Lacy Sanctuary for Homeless Girls. Can you come down here right away? You want a testimonial? I, I think homeless girls are the best because they're... It's a shame. This concerns murder. Murder and Ezekiel de Lacy. <laughs> When I got to the Josiah de Lacy Sanctuary for Girls, I was amazed at the frivolity of the building. It was like a charming and graceful old French lady doing a discreet version of a can-can. From somewhere within the house, a music box was playing an old tune. I crossed a courtyard and entered the building. 
Sixty or seventy years ago, a ladylike girl had a dream of what her home would look like. This was it. Standing in the middle of the room was a distinguished-looking woman dressed in black and carrying a cane. Mr. Shane. I bow. I'm Cleo Dauphine. It's an honor, Miss Cleo. Oh. <sighs> Lovely place you have here. Well, thank you. We think so. It's so quiet. Are the guests at work or at play? Guests? Oh, would you care to meet them? Oh, if it's not too much trouble. Oh, not at all. Penelope? Penelope? Yes, Cleo? Mr. Shane is here. He'd like to meet you. Oh, I do want to see that young man. Penelope, this is Michael Shane. Oh, how nice. How do you do, ma'am? Mr. Shane wanted to meet the inmates of the Josiah de Lacey Sanctuary for Girls. This is my sister Penelope, Mr. Shane. Uh, we are the girls. You mean, you mean just the two of you? Just the two of us. Oh, I'm sorry to disappoint you. Oh, I'm not disappointed, Miss Dauphine. I couldn't be more delighted. Oh, you may leave now, Penelope. Must I, Cleo? Yes. Oh, you have all the fun. Please come again, Mr. Shane. It's rare that we have gentlemen calling on us. Well, that's their misfortune. Oh, Cleo, he makes me feel all fluttery, as if there were a little bird beating its wings against my heart. Really, Penelope. Goodbye, Mr. Shane. Bye. Yeah, if I were 40 years older, I think I could feel the little bird, too. Many young gentlemen did. Uh, Miss Dauphine, on the phone you said something about a murder in Ezekiel de Lacey. May we talk about that? Mr. Shane, Ezekiel de Lacey is not dead. Shall I go out and come back in again? The smell of all roses does something to my hearing. No, you heard me correctly. The body that was laid to rest in the de Lacey mausoleum was not Ezekiel's. Then whose was it? Would you care to see? Hmm? Please follow me. You'll find this most interesting. She led me upstairs and into a darkened chapel-like room. It was a pungent odor of incense. Huge Spanish candelabra stood in the four corners and cast a ghostly wavering light over a body that lay on a raised platform. It was the body of a man who had accepted death much against his will. He didn't have to be a detective to see the reason why. Right in the middle of his forehead was a neat little hole. Neat, like in bullet. In a moment, we'll return to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the purloined corpse. The whole thing was just about as easy to hang on to as a handful of smoke. There was a girl in it named Katie who could light candles in your brain. There was also Josiah DeLacy, an old, old man who might have told me some big, big lies. His son, Ezekiel, had been dead for a week. I was hired to find out what made the body lively enough to disappear from Cypress Grove Cemetery. And then there was Miss Cleo Dauphine and her sister Penelope of the Josiah DeLacy Sanctuary for Homeless Girls. And scattered somewhere in between meeting all these gay people was a beating I took in Ezekiel's tomb. And finally, looking very unhappy about the whole thing, was a dead man with a bullet hole in his forehead. Mr. Shane, I insist that this is the man who was buried in Cypress Grove. And you also say he's not Ezekiel de Lacey? Precisely. Well, the way I heard it, Miss Cleo, is that Josiah buried his son and, and seems willing to part with a hunk of cash just to see that Ezekiel enjoys a cool and untroubled rest. I detest quibbling, Mr. Shane. I knew Ezekiel very well, as well as anybody did. Yeah. Well, now, now don't surprise me too much, Miss Cleo, but tell me gently. Is Ezekiel alive? I saw him at the funeral. Well, and who do you think this body belonged to when it was breathing? I'd be very glad to tell you, Mr. Shane. The murdered man you see lying there is... Here, Shane. Drink this. Where am I? Oh, oh. You're at police headquarters, Shane, and the offer of this drink lasts five seconds. After that, it gets donated back to the police department, namely me. 
You're so good to me, LaFever. You're not hurt, Shane. Just a scratch. Well, can't fool you, can we? Did you find the body? We found Cleo Dauphine. Yeah, I figured you would. Why else would you be an inspector? Only I'm talking about the murdered body. Cleo Dauphine was dead. Shot four times. No weapon in evidence. We may not be as smart as you, Sheen, but we call that a murdered body. What do you call it? I'm talking about the one that was stolen from the tomb. Now look, maybe you are hurt worse than I thought. The department don't expect us to know more in first aid. But my brother-in-law is a nifty psychiatrist. Oh, forget it. What about Penelope? Which Penelope? Cleo's sister. Wasn't she there? What were you doing down there anyway? What possible interest could you have in the DeLacy Sanctuary for Homeless Girls? Huh? Just social work. I feel everyone should do his bit. Well, you're a real cute Irishman, aren't you, Shane? Don't you want to keep your license nice and green? Could dry up and blow away if you keep breathing hot lies on it. Now, don't crowd me, Lefebvre. I... I got an idea I can hand this thing to you all prettied up with a ribbon around it. But try real hard, huh? If you don't, it'll break my heart. Maybe yours, too. When I got out of there, the fog had rolled in from the gulf, gathered up some fresh water missed out of Lake Pontchartrain, then clumped down Market Street as heavy and definite as an elephant's foot, all of which made it a lovely evening for a walk. Now, maybe walking had helped me add up a few answers I'd missed. But then one answer drove up in a pretty blue convertible. Mike? Hey, Mike. Well, a bright ray of sunshine in an otherwise drab day. Get in, Mike. Sure. Honest Joe DeLacy fix you up with this hot rod? Mike, what's happened to you? You just vanished. I've been looking every place for you. Glad you were, doll child. I want to check a few things with you. Now, look, when you came to my office, you told me Ezekiel DeLacy had been dead for a week. You sure of that? Of course I'm sure. Ezekiel DeLacy died a day before his father hired me as a private nurse. But you don't really know if he was dead or not. I saw Ezekiel buried, Mike. I attended the funeral with his father, Josiah. Well, how many other people saw him? Mr. DeLacy and I were the only ones at the funeral. You know how much people hate that family. Well, then you never saw Ezekiel except as a corpse. Well, no, how could I? Well, don't let it worry you, Katie. But I do worry, Mike. Oh. I do. About you, Mike. Why, Katie, you're talking about the man I love. Hey, uh, why are we stopping? <laughs> We're out of gas. Come here. What can I do? <sighs> why, Katie, you wouldn't want me to walk home, would you? After a while, after the fog went back to where it came from, Katie drove me to my apartment. I gave her back the same kind of look she gave me, whatever kind that was, bitter or fond and painful farewell. Walking down the hall to my room, I couldn't quite make out whether the after image of her perfume still stuck with me or whether one of the other tenants was going on a binge of old roses. It didn't really start worrying me until I saw a light slanting through the bottom of the door. Miss Penelope, how'd you get in here? Oh, just like they do in the movies, Mr. Shane. I told the clerk I was your sister. It seems to work every time. Oh, I'm delighted. Oh, this is so exciting. Cleo will be furious when she finds out I've been talking to you alone. Cleo, but... But I'm sure there are some things you'd like to know. Just ask me. Yeah. Tell me about yourself, Miss Penelope, and about your sister, Miss Cleo. Oh, there's nothing to tell about me. But Cleo now, her story is so exciting and romantic and sad, like a novel. Well, tell me about it. I promise you won't tell Cleo? I promise. Well, 50 years ago, Cleo was hired by Josiah de Lacey as a nurse companion. Then one day, he found her in the garden with his son, Ezekiel. Oh, there, I've said it. I blush. Yes. Josiah found her in the garden with his son, Ezekiel, alone. You see, it was Josiah and Cleo who were in love. Well, what did Josiah do? As punishment, he built the home and called it a sanctuary for homeless girls. And he forced Cleo and me to live there. Uh, did you know Josiah? Oh, yes. I often visited him and Cleo. How long has it been since you've seen him? I haven't set eyes on him from the day he put us in the house until... Until the funeral. Until the funeral. We found a hiding place and we watched. 
Oh, Mr. Shane, what have you made me say? Oh, Cleo will be very angry when she finds out what I've told you. She won't find out, Miss Penelope. I'd better be leaving now, Mr. Shane. I don't want Cleo to find me alone with a gentleman in his room. But it was courtly of you to understand. And Mr. Shane... Yes? Do be careful. I'm afraid for you, Mr. Shane. There was only one place left to go after that, so I went. Katie answered my knock and let me in. She looked swooningly at me, but I wasn't in the mood. I told her to wait for me outside in the car. As I approached the glass wall of the solarium, I could see Josiah sitting there exactly as he'd sat the first time I saw him. I took a last gasp of air, opened the door. Shh. Josiah screamed. You blundering, stupid idiot! Get out of here! I'm taking a poll, Mr. DeLacy. Where do you think your son Ezekiel is? I hired you to find out. But I failed. I failed miserably. Exactly. Now get out of here. But I couldn't live with myself without knowing. <laughs> Boys, and there's always a good way out, Shane. Or you could jump right from here. I could enjoy that. And your homeless girl, Cleo Dauphine, she's been murdered. Did you know that? Serves her right. She always liked to meddle. Yeah, and whoever killed her tried to murder me. That's twice on the same case. I'm Irish and superstitious and scared. The third time might take. Now, where is your son Ezekiel, Mr. DeLacy? What makes you think I know? That gun you just took out of your pocket helps me know. Could be the same one that killed Cleo before she could tell me whose body was in her house. It is the same gun, Shane. Well, who'd you get to pull the trigger for you, nurse? I told you, he gives me strength. It's quite warm in here now. Yeah, even I can feel it. I loathe your glib tongue. I loathe everything about you. Now, don't exert yourself, Pappy. Believe me, it will take no exertion to kill you. Do you want to know where Ezekiel is? I tell you. No, I'll tell you. You're Ezekiel, aren't you? You killed your old man. <laughs> and it was Cleo who sent you that ransom note. Yes, Cleo or Penelope. They were the only ones who could have possibly known that it was my father who was buried, and not I. Only you figured that out too late, after you hired me. So you shot Cleo while I was talking to her. I'll outlive all of you. Oh, 1,000 wouldn't even get you one on that, Zeke. Yes. Yes, I killed Cleo. And now I'll kill you, Shane. Now take it easy. This won't look good on your record. T take it. In a moment, we'll be back with a thrilling climax to tonight's Michael Shane adventure. The bullets that pierced the glass punched two holes in the old man's body. They did another thing. They set up a vibration that collapsed the wall of the solarium. And standing outside with a very gentle smile and a very harsh revolver was Penelope Dauphine. I got her out of there fast, down to Katie's car. When I told Katie what had happened, she sat there and stared, her vision of 50 million bucks ripped apart by all those jagged edges. Are you sure Ezekiel's dead, Mike? Yeah, I'm sure, Darth. He's quite dead. I followed you here. I told you it would be better if you had someone to take care of you. Oh, the hot blood of youth, Miss Penelope. I apologize. And I'm glad you found out that he was really Ezekiel. I was listening. I couldn't have told you that, Mr. Shane. I gave Cleo my word of honor. I wouldn't tell anybody that. Then maybe you wouldn't mind telling me why Ezekiel killed his father. Because he hated him. He thought Josiah would never die. Ezekiel wanted his inheritance. He was getting very impatient, I imagine, and... You know what? What? I wrote the ransom note. Oh, it was so exciting. Cleo doesn't know about that. But I didn't want the money. I only did it to hurt Ezekiel. You don't look the type, Miss Penelope. Oh, Cleo was still in love with Josiah. That's why we brought his body to our nice house and I put him in our own vault. That's why those policemen couldn't find it. Maybe we better tell them now. Yes, if you say so. And now I'd like to go home, Mr. Shane. Sure, wherever you say. But why does Miss West look so unhappy? She can get another job. Yeah, she probably will. Uh, don't take it so hard, Katie. I can't believe it. All that money just waiting to be plucked. I thought this would be the one time... Why, whatever is she talking about? Well, this nurse companion racket might pay off another time, Dollface. Do I hear an offer? Now, how about dinner at uh, Galatoire's private dining room? Huh? Uh, that is, if you lend me 20 bucks, your late boss forgot to pay me. Oh, 
I'd be glad to lend it to you, Mr. Shane. I guess it can be arranged. <laughs> Here you are, Mike. Thanks. Now, let's turn on the dash light for a second. Oh, Katie, you foolish girl. What's the matter? Yes, is something wrong, Mr. Shane? Never try to pass a marked bill, Katie, especially to the fellow who marked it. You marked it? Mm-hmm. Right before you tried to blame me in the cemetery. Oh. Now you'll have to have dinner at police headquarters with no marguerite sauce. Why, you dirty, double And after all crossing... the trouble I had getting reservations at Galatoire's. Uh, will you join me, Miss Penelope? Of all the low-down, contemptible... Why, I'd be delighted, Mr. Shane. This is your director, Bill Russo, again. Our story is based on characters created by Brett Halliday. The New Adventures of Michael Shane is a Don W. Sharp production, transcribed in Hollywood and distributed exclusively by the Broadcasters Guild. <laughs> Fists were coming at me from both sides now. I was bouncing back and forth like a ping-pong ball. The room was starting to spin. I swung wildly a couple of times, got nothing but air. Then something hard smashed into the side of my head, and I went down on my knees. I tried to get up, but a size 13 shoe connected with my chin, and then all the lights went out. <laughs> Adventures of Michael Shane, private detective. Michael Shane, reckless, red-headed Irishman, is back again in his old haunts in New Orleans. This is your director, Bill Russo, inviting you to listen to another transcribed episode, which we call The Case of the Deadly Dove. Come in. Come in. It's pretty hard to hear. What's the matter, didn't you? Shh. Huh? Okay. Hey, hey, look. Why the hush-hush routine? Thought I heard a noise down the hall. Noise? So what? So maybe I was being followed. Fo now look, little man. Let's start from page one. Who would... You, Mike Shane? Yeah, who are you? They call me Wichita. Who's they? Skip it. I got a job for you, Shane. You know, that's the first thing you said that makes sense. I'll give it to you fast. I haven't got much time. Here. What's that, the key to the city? The key to a baggage locker down at the Canal Street Station. You'll find a little black suitcase in it. Take it to this address on Bienville Street in the French Quarter. It's an empty room. Leave the suitcase in the room and come back here. Well, go on. What else? That's all. You mean all I do is pick up a suitcase and take it to an empty room in the quarter? You catch on quick. There's a chance you might be followed. If so, shake them at the depot, huh? I'll wait here in your office and pay you when you come back. That sounds simple enough. It is. So simple, I'm wondering what the hook is. It's no hook. And why you don't pick up the bag yourself? Look, Shane, I got 50 bucks waiting for you. Does that answer all your questions? Yeah, I guess it does. 50 bucks just for doing what you said, huh? 50 bucks. But it's worth it to me, Shane. <laughs> Believe me. I left Wichita sitting in my desk chair and went down to the Canal Street Station. It was right. I was followed for a while, but I didn't get a decent look at the guy. Anyway, I shook him before I got to the depot. I looked up locker number 1245, the number on the key. Suitcase was in it, all right. A small one. Bienville Street, where I was supposed to leave the suitcase, was only a couple of blocks away, so I walked. I hadn't been in the French Quarter for about a month... But it hadn't changed. It never changed. I could hear one of the last chimney sweeps in existence giving his pitch. Pretty soon I spotted him carrying a bunch of straw on a rope, looking very dignified and very dirty. I was in front of a grocery store now, and almost at the address which it had given me. I stopped and looked around again to make sure I'd shaken the guy who'd been tailing me. Then all of a sudden there was something hurtling down through the air at me. I dove for the street just in time. It's a tin bucket tied to a rope. Another custom in the quarter. I looked up. Sure enough, on a third-story balcony was a worried housewife. Gee, excuse me, sir. I didn't answer you. I wanted to go, sir. <laughs> okay. What did you want? It's got some soup out of <laughs> Okay. Joe, 
The lady wants some soap powder. And Joe came bustling out of his store and plunked a box of soap powder in the bucket, which the woman hauled up to her balcony. Efficiency. Well, the rest of the trip was uneventful. I found the room. It was empty. I left the suitcase there and went back to my office. Well, what's your tie? Just about the easiest 50 I... He was still sitting in my chair. His head over to one side. There was a split-lipped grin on his battered face. Wichita had been beat up. There must have been quite a beating. Because he was very dead. In a moment, we'll return to the new adventures of Mike Shane and the case of the deadly doe. Well, maybe someday I'll learn that easy money always carries a hook. The easy money in this case was the 50 bucks a little character named Wichita offered me to go down to the depot, pick up a small suitcase, and leave it in an empty room in the quarter. Yeah, that was the easy money. But the hook was coming back to my office and finding Wichita dead. And it had happened very recently. I turned and started from my office door to take a look outside. In a hurry, Shane. Uh, Inspector Lefevre. Take a look around, Dyke. Okay. Been entertaining, Shane? Yeah, I was holding open house. He decided he wanted two lumps with his teeth. Now, look, Lefevre, this is one you couldn't pin on me with an ice pick. Am I trying? You will. Yeah. Customer yours, Shane? Why? It's Wichita, all right, Inspector. Mm -hmm. Hey, wait a minute. You know this guy? Wichita. I used to have a sort of a speaking acquaintance with him. But it was always pretty one-sided. Well, who is he? What is he? Shane, you ever have a guy named Dan Bascom? Dan Bascom? What? Name's sort of familiar, but I can't... Happened a long time ago, 31. Dan Bascom held up a bank in Baton Rouge. Big job. Almost 100 grand in currency. Well, what's that got to we do We always with... thought there was another guy in on the job with Bascom. Ed Ferris. We could never pin anything on Ed. We had enough on Bascom to send him up in 32 for 20 years. So you got a good memory, Lefevre. I still don't... There's see... only one little thing wrong with the key, Shane. We could never get Bascom to tell what he... Oh. That makes a dent, huh? Why should it, uh... Maybe this other guy, what's his name, Ed Ferris, got the dough. That I doubt. I think it's still floating around somewhere. Well, where did Wichita fit into the deal? He was an old friend of Dan Bascom's. You see, Dan got some time off for good behavior. It was released last Friday. and just sort of dropped out of sight right away. You think Wichita had the dough? I think Bascom told Wichita where to find the dough, told him to get it and bring it to him. Yeah, that's an interesting theory, Lefebvre. Where does it get you? It gets me around to you, Shane. What did Wichita want you to do? Run an errand. That's all you want to say, huh? Right now? Yeah. Okay. But I think you're making a mistake. You'll be bucking big league opposition in this deal, Shane. So? So Wichita here got hit by a pitch ball. Could happen to you. Maybe Wichita is standing too close to the plate. Maybe. Just one more thing. Yeah, I know. Don't leave town. Yeah. Inspector, you keep telling me that. I never do, do I? <laughs> A couple of minutes more, and they finished up and took Wichita away. I could hardly wait till they left, because I had just two things on my mind. One was the little black suitcase I'd taken to that room on Bienville Street. The other was what was in that suitcase and the reward there'd be for it. I sat there a few minutes after Lafayette had gone, and then I started for the door. This must have been open house day after all. Standing outside my door, the worried look on her face was a very pretty woman. She must have been in her late 30s, but she hadn't lost a thing. Mr. Shane, could I talk to you, ma'am? Ordinarily, there's nothing I'd like better, lady, but right now I'm in a hurry. Maybe you could come Please, back a little... I'm Zoe Bascom. Huh? Van Bascom's wife. Oh. Come in. Oh, thank you. Now, now what's Mr. This... Shane, where's Dan? How would I know? I don't know. I thought you might. I knew Wichita came here to see you, and I Wichita's thought... Wichita's dead. Dead? Yeah. Murdered. Then I'm right. The trouble's starting all over again. Mr. Shane, you've got to find Dan and make him give up this whole thing. Now, look, I think you better start at the beginning, Mrs. Bascom. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Shane. I just... I know I shouldn't get so upset. It's... Except it's... Just I've been waiting for 16 years. And now I'll start all over again. What'll start? I married Dan just before he was arrested. All this time I've stuck by him. All this time, 16 years. Yeah, it's a long time. Yeah. Yeah, when you love someone... Time isn't so important. Yeah. I went to see Dan so often as they let me. Each time I tried to get him to give up the money because I thought they might let him out sooner if he did. He paid the price for taking that money, Mr. Shane, 16 years out of his life. 
I wanted for us to start over again when he got out. Without that awful thing over his head. He, he wouldn't listen to me. He wouldn't ever listen to me. Now, look, I... I, 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 I haven't even seen him. I, I don't know where he is, except he's probably after that money. He'd say he'd get in touch with me later. Mr. Shane, it'll start all over again. I know it. The trouble, the fear that that money's told it with it. I, I just I can't stand that I couldn't go through it again. I just couldn't. Look, Mrs. Bascom, I'll I'll see what I can do. I'll see if I can get your husband to give up the money. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Shane. Well, I guess the thought of that woman waiting 16 years for her husband sort of rocked me back a little. And anyway, it occurred to me that she and I both wanted the same thing, to get the dough away from Bascom, although for slightly different reasons. She left after that, and I hot-footed it back to the room on Bienville Street. The suitcase was still sitting on the table where I'd left it. I started toward it, then I stopped. Don't move, mister. Don't look around. Okay. Who are you? Shane. Michael Shane. Oh, the boy Wichita hired him. Wichita? You might be Dan Bascom? Yeah, I'm Dan Bascom. The one guy you don't want to see, Shane. But I'm awfully glad to see you. What are you talking about? Got any particular prayer you're fond of? Prayer? Start on it. You're going to die pretty soon. Look, what is this? You mind telling me just why? Because I've been through too much to miss out now. To be double-crossed by some two-bit punk of a private eye. Double-crossed? I don't know what you're talking about. Open that suitcase. Huh? I said open it. Okay. What? Yeah. It's... It's empty. In a moment, we'll return to the new adventures of Mike Shane and the case of the deadly doe. It all started when a little character named Wichita offered me 50 bucks to pick up a black suitcase at the depot and leave it in an empty room on Bienville Street in the French Quarter. I did and came back to my office to collect the 50 from him. The Wichita wasn't in a position to pay off anymore. He'd been beaten to death. Inspector Lefevre came in about then and told me Wichita was a friend of Dan Bascom, who'd just been released from prison after serving 16 years for a $100,000 bank robbery back in 1931. It seems Dan had never told anyone where the dough was. Of course, about that time, I had my ideas, most of which concerned that little black suitcase. So I went back over to the room on Bienville Street. But this time, it wasn't empty. Dan Bascom was in it with a gun. Shane... You got just one chance to go on living. Tell me where that dough is. Oh, look, I tell you, I don't know anything about it, Bascom. Shane, I've waited 16 years. Five minutes more is too much. What'd you do with the dough? Oh, get smart, Bascom. If I'd taken the dough, do you think I'd have come back here to this room? Either somebody came in and emptied the suitcase after I left it here, or it was empty when I brought it. Well, matter of fact, I, I remember thinking it felt a little light when I picked it up down at the depot. My. I guess what you say adds up, Shane. It would have been a dope to come back here again if you'd taken it. Uh, you'd take a lot of convincing, Bascom. So, it turns out the one guy I thought I could trust crosses me. You mean Wichita? You think he took it? Yeah. Is that why you killed him? Huh? Wichita got knocked off a couple of hours ago. You could have done it. A couple of hours ago, I thought Wichita was my friend. Uh, I didn't kill him, but I got a pretty good idea who did. Who? Never mind, Shane. I'll handle this my way. Now, look, Bascom. Your wife came to see me just before I came over here. Zoe? Why? She wants you to forget the dough. It spells trouble to her. It always has. Ah, Zoe's a good kid, Shane, but she's been trying to tout me off that dough all these years. I've never taken her advice, and I'm sure not going to take it from you. Well, Bascom, I guess I didn't really think you would. Yeah, yeah. Zoe means well. When I wind up a couple of odds and ends and get the money, I'll get her and we'll get out of the country. And I think after a while, she'll get used to the idea of us having dough. Might even quit spelling trouble to her. Well, you're a lucky guy, Shane. Lucky? Yeah, yeah. You're going to walk out of here alive. So, start walking. 
Well, I was glad to oblige. I went downstairs and out on the sidewalk. It was just getting dark. I started walking. I was wondering what Dan Bascom was going to do next. My guess was he was going to head for Ed Ferris, the guy who'd been in on the robbery with him, but who'd beaten the rap. And then a couple of minutes later, a stocky gent fell in step beside me. Got a light, Mac? A light? Well, yeah, I think so. Hey. Know what that is in your ribs? Yeah, it's a police positive 38 with a silencer. Smart boy. What's the idea? See that car across the street with a big eye behind a wheel? Yeah, why? Let's head for it. Three of us are going to take a little ride. Where to? Oh, now, you don't want me to spoil the surprise, do you? Come on, get moving. We drove across town and pulled up beside the service entrance to an apartment house. The two muscle men hustled me up the back stairs into one of the apartments. There was a guy sitting there looking out the window. A pretty trim-looking individual with a very innocent face, except for the eyes. Those I think he must have borrowed from a rattlesnake. Here he is, Ed. Okay. Ed, huh? Ed Ferris, maybe. Maybe. Do you mind telling me why these two gentlemen's gentlemen of yours gave me the rush up here? You know why, Shane. Where is it? Where's what? The doll, the doll, the hundred grand, where is it? Funny, Ferris, I was just getting ready to ask you that. The worst you get, you're lucky. Now, let's not clown around. Ed, you want Rock on me to muscle them up? Not yet, Al. Look, Shane. I don't know where that doll is. Shane! Ed, straight! The way I got it figured, you or your trained seals here knocked off Wichita and got the dough from here. That'd be awfully hard to prove about who killed Wichita, I mean. As far as my having the dough, I haven't. But I'm going to get it because you're going to tell me where it is right now. Buck, how can I tell you if I don't know? Just to refresh your memory, Shane. Al here followed you from your office when you went down to the depot. Oh. But he lost you. I think Wichita did the thing there. The dough. But the suitcase was empty. Yeah, sure. Look, what? why don't you get Dan Bascom to tell you? I think he's looking for you. <laughs> oh, very funny. If Dan's looking for me, he doesn't tell me where the dough is. Anyway, it'll take him some time to find me. It'll be too late. I'll have the dough by then. Because like I say, you're going to tell me what you did with it. Look, for the 14th time, I don't know where... Man, you don't seem to understand. I've waited a long time to find out where that dough is. Never could get Dan to tell me. Half that dough is mine. I've waited so long, I just figure now that all of it's mine. So don't try to stall anymore. You're the one who doesn't understand. Can't you get it through your head? I don't know where the money is. Okay, Al. Rocco. Start now. Oh, I'll drive her right to the big ape. Rocco cut me under the ear and drove me back against the wall. I tried one of my own on him. He only blinked his eyes. They both came at me now, and they were one too many. This started coming at me from both sides. Pretty soon I was bouncing back and forth like a ping-pong ball. The room was starting to spin. I, I kept swinging, but was getting nothing but air. And then something hard smashed on the side of my head. I went down on my knees. I tried to get up, but a size 13 shoe connected with my chin, and all the lights went out. About two months later, it seemed like, the darkness started to fade a little. I started wishing it wouldn't, because I felt like one big bruise. Then I could make out that I was lying outside in an alley. There was someone bending over me. Mm. Still alive, huh, Shane? Am I? How can you tell, Inspector? Well, you're lucky. Sure. Well, cheer up. You might have solved the murder for me. The hard way. Yeah? Look, if I'm in line for a medal, I'll trade it for an ice bag. Who's murder? Wichita. You're carrying the same trademarks on your face he had. Only I guess you're a little more rugged than he was. Oh, three cheers for me. It was those two trained seals of Ed Ferris's. Yeah. Al and Rocco. We got a net out for him. It won't be long. We're also looking for Ed Ferris. Try his apartment. I just had a delightful evening there. We did. It's empty. But we'll get him before long. Well, it looks like that's the case, Shane. Ferris had his boys knock off Wichita trying to get Bascom's dough. They didn't get it. They tried you next. Well, then they still don't have it, Inspector. You don't have the dough? No. Are you sure? What do you want? An affidavit? I said no. Okay. Jay, like I told you, you're bucking big league competition. You're lucky you just got struck out. Drop it now while you're still breathing. 
You know, Lefebvre, for once I'm agreeing with everything you say. I am going to get out. I'm beat. I dragged myself back to my office and took a look in the mirror over the washboard. I could have sold what I saw in that mirror for four bits a pound at any meat market. I patched myself up a little and slumped down in my chair. Then it occurred to me that this was the way Wichita had been slumped over in that same chair. And I know a little of how he must have felt just before he... Then I saw it. A little shiny metal thing wedged into a crack on the inside of my desk down low. I pulled it out. It was another baggage locker key. It was like a shot in the arm. Suddenly I felt almost alive again. I went back to the depot and found locker 1247, the number on the key. Yeah, there was another suitcase in this one. I opened it just a crack, and it was full of dough. As I stared at it, I couldn't help feeling just a little sorry for Dan Bascom. Then I closed the suitcase, started out with it, but I didn't get far. Hello, Shane. Harris. Yeah, keep walking. Now, look, I... Lafeva picked up my boy, so it looks like I'll have to do my own work from now on. You know, Shane, you almost had me fooled. I didn't think anyone could take a beating like that and still not talk. Look, you won't believe this, Ferris, but I didn't know where the dough was then. Where are we going? The car outside. You're going to drive, I'm going to sit beside you. Head for Claiborne Avenue and out of town, I'll direct you. We're going out into the country. Ferris wasn't kidding. He went way out in the country. After a while, he motioned me onto a side road... Pretty soon, we pulled up in front of a little house standing all by itself in a clump of trees. There was a light in the window. We got out of the car and went into the house. And standing there in the front hey, room... you fool, why'd you bring him here? Well, well, Zoe Bascom, the you loyal fool, wife. you of all the places There's nowhere go. else for me to go, Zoe. They're looking for me in town. Anyway, it doesn't matter anymore. We've got the dough right here in this suitcase. You got the money. Right here in this suitcase, Zoe. Wait, it lays. What about Dan? Will you stop worrying about Dan? Time he figures out about us that we've got the money, we'll be long gone. Don't be too sure of that, Ed. Dan! Drop it, Ed. Drop the gun. That's fine. Now, look, Bascom. Shut up, Shane. I'll get to you later. Now, just stand there real quiet, the three of you. I got a couple of things to say before I start shooting. <laughs> In a moment, we'll be back with a thrilling climax to tonight's Michael Shane adventure. Well, there we were, the four of us. Dan Bascom with a gun in his hand and murder in his eyes. Zoe white-faced, nervously rubbing our hands together. Ed Ferris with a sickly grin and me with no grin but sick. So all this time, Zoe... It's been you and Ed all this time. No, Dan, it's not. I swear, Dan, it's not true. You got it all wrong. You got the wrong idea, Dan. Shut I... up. You're going to die, both of you. No. Dan, I know. Don't be a fool, Bascom. You don't know what Get you're... Get your head away from that gun. You don't stand up. Ed. Ed. No more, Ed, Zoe. Tough. No more boyfriend. No more Ed. Sure, it was Ed and me. Hitting me all the time. All the time just waiting to get our hands on that money. Sure, what did you think? I was waiting for you. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. You fool. Hit me. The money was going to be ours. I loved him. And you killed him, you fool, fool, fool! She stood there with her eyes blazing, and I saw his lips twitch and his fingers start to tighten on the trigger. I dove for him, but he was too quick. He clipped me with a gun barrel, and I went down. Then I heard the gun go off. I twisted my head around. Zoe was sagging slowly to the floor, but her expression never changed. Hatred. Pure, venomous hatred. Dan stared hard at her for a moment, and then he looked down at me. You lied to me, Shane. You had to dough all along. You're next. Now, oh, wait a minute, Bascom. I, I didn't have the dough. It was in another baggage locker. I guess Wichita knew he was being followed by Farris's boy, so he figured out a way to throw him off. What do you mean? He sent me after an empty suitcase as a blind. Then I guess he was going to get the real one later and bring it to you. When he saw Farris's boys coming after him in my office, he slipped the second key down into a crack in my desk. I found it there just an hour ago. So, Wichita really was on the level with me. Well, that's something to know, I guess. I had one friend. Yeah, you paid an awful big price to find that out, Bascom. Yeah, I paid big. 
Sixteen years locked up, a wife who turned rat, and this is what I got for it. A suitcase with a hundred grand. Not too hard a bargain. Yeah, it's worse than that. Better than nothing. No, it isn't, Bascom. What do you mean? What you got is nothing. Shane, you trying to tell me the dough isn't in that suitcase? Oh, it's there, all right. Take a look at it. Hey, what are you trying? Go ahead. Yeah. Take a good look. I've forgotten. You robbed that bank in 1931, Bascom. They were still using the old large size bills in those days. Well, I had forgotten about that. A couple of years later, they changed the size of the currency. Started printing smaller size bills. Uh, that stuff here, it's... You'd have just about as much luck passing Confederate, though, Bascom. He just stood there, stunned, like a pulled steer. For a moment, his guard was down. I knew this was my chance. I lunged for him, and this time I didn't miss. His gun went flying, and he crumpled over on the floor and lay still. I started for the phone to call Inspector Lefebvre, but just then he walked in the door. Bodies, bodies, all the time, bodies. Yeah. Only one of them will come to in a couple of minutes. You can get the story from him. I'll be all ears. I know. Now, look, just one more thing. Yeah. Okay, if I leave town now. This is your director, Bill Russo, again. Our story is based on characters created by Brett Halliday. The music is composed and conducted by John Duffy, and Michael Shane is portrayed by Jeff Chandler. The New Adventures of Michael Shane is a Don W. Sharp production, transcribed in Hollywood and distributed exclusively by the Broadcasters Guild. been through a lot to get to you. I'm facing a murder app because of you. I've got just five hours left to break the case. You're going to help me the hard way. So come on. Open up. Talk. The New Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Jeff Chandler. Michael Shane, reckless, red-headed Irishman, is back again in his old haunts in New Orleans. This is your director, Bill Russo, inviting you to listen to another transcribed episode, which we call The Case of the Eager Victim. Come in. Mr. Michael Shane? Yeah, that's right. Good. I was afraid it was too late to catch you here at your office. Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Janik. Claude Janik. How do you do, Mr. Janik? I hope you'll pardon the gloves. My hands... Well, there's something the matter with my hands. Yeah, sure. Uh, have a seat, Mr. Janik. Thank you. Well, uh, what can I do for you? A uh, great deal, Mr. Shane. A very great deal. Oh? Uh-huh. First, I have here a... Typewritten statement. Please read it. Yeah. This will absolve Michael Shane of any responsibility or connection with the death of... Hey, hey, wait a minute. I don't get it. Second, Mr. Shane. Here's an envelope. I'll put it here on your desk. And the envelope is a thousand dollars. A thousand dollars? Look, Janet, start from the beginning. You're leaving me way behind. The thousand dollars is for you. For me? Why? Third, Mr. Shane. This. It's a gun. Precisely. Look, will you kindly tell me what this is all about? I'm in no mood to play games. Oh, I assure you, this is no game. You will put the typewritten statement in a safe place. Then you'll take the thousand dollars. Mr. And... Janik, I want to know why you're offering me a thousand and what you want me to do for it. It's very simple. The thousand dollars is yours if you'll just take that gun and... And what? And kill me, Mr. Shane. Kill me. <laughs> In a moment, we'll return to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the eager victim. Well, I've been hired to 
do a lot of strange things in my time, but I must admit I was completely floored when a guy named Claude Janik walked into my office and offered me $1,000 if I'd take his gun and kill him. He even had a typewritten statement which was supposed to release me from any connection or responsibility for his death. Well, Mr. Shane, these are all the materials you need. The statement, the money, the gun. As to the time and place, I'll leave that up to you. Well, now, just a minute, Mr. Janik. Hmm? I don't know why you're trying to keep me along, but I can't say I care for your idea of a joke very much. Joke? I assure you this is no joke, Mr. Shane. I was never more serious in my life. You... You mean you actually are asking me to... I thought I'd made it completely clear. I want to pay you $1,000 to kill me. Get out of here. But, Mr. Shane, this statement will absolve you of any... Look, I don't know what gave you the idea of coming to me with your crackpot idea, but this... I came to you for a definite reason, Mr. Shane. What do you mean? I... Well, I've been observing you lately. I... I happen to know you're a little short of money, and so I thought Me that... being short of dough is nothing new. But you didn't observe me very closely, Mr. Janik, or you'd have known I'd throw you right out on your ear for coming to me with a pitch like that. Now, get out. Please, Mr. Shane. I... I need your help. You see, I... I don't want to go on living. There's a... There's an illness that... Uh, we won't go into that. I... I just can't bring myself look, to... Look, Mr. Janik, I'm... I'm sorry about your troubles. Really, I am. I, I think you should realize what an insane thing you're trying to do. You... You won't take the job? Of course not. I'm sorry to hear that, Mr. Shane. Well, your answer is no. For the present. For the present? But perhaps you'll change your mind... I'll just leave these things here with you. The gun, the money, the statement. Look, you're not leaving anything with me. Here, take your gun with you. And the dough and the statement. Very well, Mr. Shane. I live at the Ainsworth Arms Apartments. So if you should reconsider... I won't. Hmm. Good evening, Mr. Shane. I'll be seeing you. I doubt it. I doubt it very much, Mr. Janik. He walked out of my office, and I guess I must have sat there 15 minutes or so, wondering what makes a guy like Claude Janik tick. Of course, I couldn't help feeling a little sorry for him, but then I remembered what he wanted to hire me for, and I got mad again. Finally, I realized it was getting late, so I got up and started for the door. And then I saw it, a piece of paper lying near the door. I picked it up. It was a statement Janik had typed absolving me from any responsibility for his death. I figured he'd probably get in touch with me again to see if I'd changed my mind, so I put the statement in my desk drawer to keep for him. Then I started for the door again. This time, the telephone brought me back. Hello? Mr. Shane? Yeah, who's this? This is Gloria Hunt, Mr. Shane. Gloria Hunt? I'm sorry, but you don't know me. Well, I'm sorry too, Gloria, but maybe we could change that, huh? I hope so, Mr. Shane. I know it's late, but I'm wondering if you could come over and see me. I need your help. Gloria, you just made yourself a date. Where are you? I'm staying at the Faraday Hotel. Suppose I meet you in the lobby in, say, half an hour. I'm sure I'll recognize you. Like I said, you've got a date, sugar. You sure you don't mind coming over, Mr. Shane? You're kidding. I'll see you in 30 minutes, Gloria. Maybe 29. <laughs> 28 minutes later, I walked into the lobby of Gloria's hotel. She was sitting there alone. When she saw me, she got up to meet me. Gloria was quite a number. She looked, well, like her voice sounded. It was very nice of you to come over at this time of night, Mr. Shane. You know, I don't mind a bit. What uh, seems to be the trouble? Something of mine's been stolen, Mr. Shane. A diamond slip. Rather valuable. Oh? I discovered it when I came back to my room a while ago. I've left everything just the way it was. I want you to look around and... And we'll see if you can find any clues. Okay. Uh, now, if you'll excuse me for just a moment, I'll check in at the desk, see if I have any mail. Then we'll go up to my room. She went over to the desk and stood there a moment, talking to the clerk who'd been ogling her ever since I'd walked into the lobby. And then she motioned to me, and we went up to her room. As I say, I haven't touched anything since I discovered the clip was missing. Well, where'd you usually keep the clip? Well, I'm afraid I was a little careless with it this evening. I... I, I think I left it in my cosmetics case. Uh -huh. I, I intended to have them put it in the hotel safe, but I, I was in a hurry when I went out to dinner, and I, I think I remember just sort of uh, 
uh, tossing the clip into that case. Hmm. Or is it open when you left like it is now? Uh, the case? Why, well, uh, I, uh, I, I thought I closed it, but I... But you're not sure. I'm afraid not. Your uh, memory isn't exactly a long suit, is it, Gloria? I uh, know. I get so mad at myself sometimes, but I, I just can't seem to help it. I sort of forget things. Well, I'll poke around a little, see if I can... Oh, oh Mr. Shane. Huh? Oh, Mr. Shane, this is... Oh, this is... Very embarrassing. What is? Well, I, I put my hand into my suit pocket just now and... And I, what? Look. What? A diamond clip. Yes. My diamond clip. Well, I'll be... <laughs> like I say, Gloria, memory is not your long suit. Shane, I, I don't know what to say. I, I feel so foolish. You know something? You don't look so foolish. Oh, no, but to drag you all the way over here for, for nothing like this. Oh, I wouldn't say it was for nothing, Gloria. What do you mean? Well, I I met you, which is not nothing. Oh, well, well, maybe something could uh, well, be arranged sometime, huh? If you think you could forgive me for... I have. Well, then, maybe, huh? We'll see. I'll call you, Mike. You do that, Gloria. Good night. I headed back to my office and realized for the second time in one evening a possible job had evaporated before my eyes. First, Claude Janik, and second, Gloria. Well, just my luck, I guess. Although I really wasn't too unhappy as far as Gloria was concerned because things looked, well, a little promising in that direction. I got back to my office, pulled open the door, and started to my desk. The chair behind it was already occupied. Hello, Shane. Well, well, Inspector Lefebvre. Sit down. Thank you, Inspector. Well, it's real sweet of you to offer me a chair, considering it's my office. Uh, how's everything down at Homicide? Uh, uh, don't tell me. I know. Dead. Yeah. Well... Uh, well, what's on that mighty midget mind of yours tonight, Lefevre? Is this just a social call, or, or maybe you want to offer me a job in your department, huh? Wrong twice. Well, it's early yet. I'll sharpen up, Inspector. Wrong again, Shane. As far as you're concerned, it's not early, it's late, and it's getting later every minute. Oh, so now we're talking in riddles, huh? Well, see if I can think of a fast one. Uh, well, maybe we should go into a game of 20 questions, huh? Good idea. Here's the first one. Ever hear of a guy named Claude Janik? Claude Janik was... Yeah, what about him? I'm asking the question, Shane, but yours was a good one. I'll use it. What about him? Janet? Well, he came to see me earlier this evening. Why? Well, he said he wanted to hire me to... Uh, uh, look, you, you'd never believe it, Lefevre. It sounds like it was right out of a book. Ever see Janet before tonight? No. Or after he left here? No, again. Look, what is all this, anyway? How come you're so interested in Claude Janet all of a sudden? I'm always interested in corpses, Shane. And Janet's one of them right now. Janet's dead? Yep. Well, I'll be... Poor guy. I guess you never know. What do you mean? Oh, I, I knew Janik was sort of in a bad way, but I never thought he'd do it. Do what? Kill himself. He didn't. Janik was murdered. Murdered? All right, now let's take it again, from the beginning. When did you see Janik last? I told you, I haven't seen him since he left my office. How long have you known him? I never saw him before tonight, Look, Lefevre, a guy comes in to see me, he winds up dead. So automatically, you come busting down here and start giving me a third degree. Well, don't tell me you think I had anything to do with it. I do. Well, then you're awfully wrong, Lefevre. Just what makes you think you can drag me into the deal? For the best reason in the world, we found some fingerprints on the gun that killed Janet. And Shane, they were your fingerprints. In a moment, we'll return to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the eager victim. It all started when a guy named Claude Janet came to my office and offered me a thousand bucks to kill him. I turned him down in a hurry and he left. Then I got a call from a very nice number, Gloria Hunt, who told me a diamond clip had been stolen from her. When I got to her hotel, she discovered the diamond clip in her suit pocket. She is pretty embarrassed about the whole thing, but on her, it looked good. I, uh, left the way open for future assignments with her and then went back to my office. And there was Police Inspector Lefevre of Homicide. Get your toothbrush, Shane. We're going down to headquarters. Oh, now, just a minute, Lefevre. Look, so you found my fingerprints on the gun that killed Janik. Okay, I, 
I can tell you how they got there, the whole story. And that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm all ears. Claude Janet came in here early this evening and offered me a thousand bucks to kill him. Yeah. Oh, sure, it sounds phony, but it's the truth. That's the truth, and you're really slipping to cough up your motive like that, Shane. Motive? Oh, look, little man, I tell you, I didn't kill Janik. I turned him down in a hurry and shoved his gun back to him. That's how my prints happened to be on the gun. Very interesting. It's just one small point. What is it? How come his prints weren't on that gun, too? Because he was wearing gloves. But I'm telling you, that's how my prints wound up on the gun. He took it and the money and... Hey, hey, wait a minute. I'm waiting. Look, I can settle this thing right now. He had written out a statement releasing me from any responsibility for his death. He dropped it on the way out of here. I put it in my desk drawer, and I'm very glad he did drop it, because now maybe you'll be convinced I'm telling the truth, and... Well? Statement's gone. No. Well, I tell you, I put it right here in the drawer. Shane, the more you talk, the worse off you are. Oh, look, Lefebvre, where did Janet get killed? What time was it? His body was found out of town a little way, on a side road near South Claiborne. You know that intersection with the gas station a couple of miles out? Yeah. Well, near there. We figure he died about nine. Why? You know, I'm awfully glad to hear you say that, Inspector. Alibi? Yeah. Shane, alibis can be vague, borrowed, stolen, or bought. Yeah, but they also stand up in court if they're airtight. And this one is vacuum-packed, Lefebvre. What are you doing? Calling up a very nice young lady named Gloria Hunt, whom I just happen to be with at nine o'clock in town. Faraday Hotel. Hey, let me talk to Gloria Hunt. Who? Gloria Hunt. There's no one here by that name. Sorry. What? Oh, now, look, don't give me that. I... Sorry. Hey. hey, hey, wait a minute. Well, I'll be... Something the matter, Shane? Oh, it must be a new clerk or something. Or maybe Gloria went out for the evening. At midnight? Or maybe... Or maybe there is no Gloria. Hmm? Now, look, there is a Gloria, and she's my alibi, and I'm going to find her and prove it to you, but... But what? Well, it'll... It'll take a little time. It... Give me 24 hours, and I guarantee you... I'll... No deal, Shane. But Lefebvre... Look, you're my number one suspect right now. If you can clear yourself or show me somebody who looks better in the suspect chair than you do, okay. Well, that's what I'm trying to do, but I can't do it just like that. I, I need time. I'll give you 12 hours. Tw oh, have a heart, Inspector. 12 hours. Look, make it 18 and I'll... 12. Okay. 12 hours. It's midnight now. That gives you until noon. And Shane, that'll be it. One way or another. Okay, okay. One thing more. What is it? New Orleans is a pretty big city. So what? So don't get lost. Look, for the fifth time, there's nobody named Gloria Hunt staying at this hotel. But I tell you... Are you the guy that phoned a little while ago asking for it? Yeah. Well, you take a lot of convincing, but I told you then I there was know, nobody... But, well, maybe Gloria Hunt isn't the name she's registered under. Look, I just oh, described it to you a minute ago. Right. Doesn't the description ring a bell with you? It rings nothing. Now, look, for the last okay. time, I don't... Right, boy. Okay. I turned around and walked out of the hotel. Obviously, the clerk was lying. He'd probably been paid for it. Somehow, Gloria had found out that Janet had left that statement in my office, and her whole story about the stolen diamond clip was probably just a pretext to get me out of my office so she could have someone remove the statement. Maneuvering me into a spot where I'd be depending on her for my alibi was smart, too. All of which meant I had to find Gloria in a hurry. I didn't have much time. My next stop was the Ainsworth Arms Apartments, where Claude Janet had told me he lived. It was a very ritzy-looking place, complete with an elevator operator who, luckily for me, was still on duty. And luckier still was a talkative gent. Oh, too bad about Mr. Janik. Too bad. Yeah. Nice guy, huh? Yeah, he sure was nice to me. You, uh, saw him earlier this evening? Mm-hmm, yeah. Took him up to his apartment about five, guess it was. Yeah, five straight up. I remember because he got in the elevator, then he told me to wait while he had them put the package in the apartment house safe. Package? Mm-hmm, yeah. Money. Huh? Told me there was money in it. Wanted to put it in the safe. Oh, is it, uh, is it still there? Ah, uh, no. Well, Mr. Janik took it with him when he went out again. About eight it was. Eight? Are you sure about that time? Uh, uh no. Just a guess. Wasn't paying much attention. Uh, it's probably a little earlier than that. He was in my office right around eight. Uh, like I say, just a guess. Look, uh, did Mr. Janik have any particular girlfriend? <laughs> if he did, he kept her pretty well undercover. Hmm. Didn't have any regular visitors here. Well, let's see... Mm-hmm, yeah. Who? Oh. Well, lately there's been a guy come to see him several times. A nasty-looking gent named uh, Landry. Landry? Not Jim Landry. Uh-huh, yeah. 
Know him? Yeah, he runs a joint across town. Well, thanks a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh... Well, at least I got one lead. Jim Landry, who owned the Blue Parrot. I found him in his office alone, a deck of cards in his hand. What do you want, Shane? Oh, little game of solitaire, huh? Yeah. I've been sitting here playing solitaire all evening. Oh? Maybe you don't hear me. I say, what do you want? A couple of answers. About Claude Janik. A fresh out of answers. You owe you any toll, Andrew? You got a big nose, Shane. Yeah. You were a friend of Janik's, Landry. I didn't used to like him at all, Shane. Why not? He beat me out of something that was mine once. Money? <clears throat> a girl, maybe. Like I say, you got a big nose, Shane. Look, you say you didn't used to like Janik. That's right. I like him fine now. He's dead. I know. I'm not doing so well this game, Shane. I can't seem to concentrate with you here. Yeah? Let's try the red nine on the black ten. Thanks. It's okay. See you around, Lent. Well, about then I was running out of leads fast. But then I got to thinking about that bull-neck clerk at Gloria's Hotel. I went back there and hung around outside. Finally, it started getting light, and around 6 a.m., a guy came up and relieved the clerk. He yawned and started for the door, and just as he got outside, I called him. Hey, you and... Hey, what? Oh, it's you again. Yeah, it's me again, and this time... Now look, put him... You look. Sit. You were lying when you said there was never any Gloria Hunt. Now, you're crazy. She paid you to lie. Now, now open get up. Get your hands off of me, Okay, we'll do it the hard way. Oh. Come on, now, give it. Hey, I don't know. Okay? Oh, lay off, will you? Lay off. All right, let's have it, then. Okay. After you left, she told me to forget all about it. She gave me 20 bucks, and then she left. Where'd she go? I don't know. Look, I'm gonna... I tell you, I don't know. I'm giving it to you straight. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You like that guy? Always gotta be tough. Everybody gotta be tough. Huh? You're a fever. You're real tough, aren't you, Shane? Look, did you hear what that clerk said? Yeah. That ought to prove it's a Gloria Hunt. I'm telling the truth. That ought to... That's a fast, Shane. So there is a doll called Gloria Hunt. To me, that's not proof of anything yet. Not until you find her. Oh, but and I... And you're running out of time. Less than six hours, Shane. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure you won't mind if I excuse myself and keep on looking. Not at all. But, Shane... Yeah, I know. Don't get lost. And I might as well have gotten lost for all the progress I'd made. I'd covered everybody, looked every place I could think of, and I still hadn't... And then I stopped. Oh, there was one place I hadn't looked yet. In Janik's apartment. I went back over to the Ainsworth Arms, and with some fast talk and a faster ten-buck bill, I got the elevator operator to let me in the back door of Janik's apartment. I wasn't at all sure what I was looking for, but I looked anyway. For about an hour. I was just about to give up when something caught my eye. It was with some other papers in Janik's desk, a receipt from a jewelry store for a diamond clip. Yeah, possibly, just possibly, that clip of Gloria's. On the receipt was written the address where the clip had been delivered. An apartment house on the other side of town. I copied down the address, and then I called the fever. It wasn't in, but I left the message and beat it over to the apartment. Sure, it was a long shot, but when the door opened, I knew the long shot had paid off. Shane! Yeah, Gloria, and I'm coming in. Get out of here! It's too late, Gloria. Yeah, now. Well, Mike, finding me was a big mistake. Look, Angel, I've been through a lot to get to you. I'm facing a murder rap because of you. It was still a mistake to find me. When you barge into people's apartments, you're sort of careless about looking behind doors, aren't you, Mike? Looking behind doors? What are you talking... In a moment, we'll be back with a thrilling climax to tonight's Michael Shane adventure. Well, I finally found Gloria Hunt. Just in time to get hit over the head by someone standing behind me. And then after a while, I started coming out of it. I could see someone bending over me. Feeling better, Shane? Hey, I... Hey, am I dreaming? No, you're not dreaming, Mike. Yeah, but you're the guy who came to my office and tried to hire me to kill him. You, you're the dead man, Claude Janik. <laughs> yeah, 
Uh, right the first time, Shane, but wrong the second. Yes, I'm the one who came to see you, all right. But I'm not Claude Janik. Yeah, but... Uh, yeah. You're beginning to get it, huh? Yeah, I'm beginning to get it. You posed as Janik to me. The whole story about wanting to hire me to kill you was just an excuse to get my fingerprints on the gun you later used to kill the real Claude Janik with. Bright boy. That's why you wore gloves, so that the only prints on the murder gun would be mine. You have it all figured out. Well, I'm too bad it's too late. Uh, mind telling me why you killed him? I don't mind, Mike. I finally got Janik to settle some money on me. Nice, hard cash. That's what I've been waiting for. Mm-hmm. And then maybe you got Janik to drive you out into the country. You had him parked near a spot where your friend here was hiding. Your friend kills Janik, and the two of you drive away. Does it fit together that way by any chance? Good, Mike. Good. But you might be a little more polite. My friend here's name happens to be Tom. So happy to know you. So you and Tom now live happily ever after on Janik's dough, huh? That's the general idea, Shane. But that doesn't interest you anymore. Because it's time for you to leave the party. Right now. The gun in his hand moved up a little until it was staring me in the eye. His fingers started tightening on the trigger and then... Thanks. Take care of the girl. The fever. Oh, how, how did you back door? Better late than never, huh? Yeah, yeah, any later than it might as well have been never. Well, now, that's gratitude. Gratitude, yeah. Guess who just solved your case? It'll be solved when I hear the story, Shane. Well, I think if you talk real pretty to that girl Sergeant Dykes just took out of the squad car, you can persuade her to spill the whole story into those shell-like ears of yours. I'll sure try. Yeah, I know you will. Oh, uh, just one thing more, Lafever. What is it? Okay if I get lost now? This is your director, Bill Russo, again. Our story is based on characters created by Brett Halliday and written by Bob Wright. The music is composed and conducted by John Duffy, and Michael Shane is portrayed by Jeff Chandler. The New Adventures of Michael Shane is a Don W. Sharp production transcribed in Hollywood and distributed exclusively by the Broadcasters Guild. dark except for a ray of moonlight coming through the window. I started reaching around for the light switch. Then I saw something glinting in the air. It was a knife blade. It was headed straight for my throat. The New Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Jeff Chandler. Michael Shane, reckless, red-headed Irishman, is back again in his old haunts in New Orleans. This is your director, Bill Russo, inviting you to listen to another transcribed episode, which we call The Case of the Mail Order Murders. Who is it? Shane, Mike Shane. Oh, Mr. Shane, come in quickly, please. Yeah. Hey, look, what's all... Did this? anyone follow you here to my apartment, Mr. Shane? Follow me? Well, not that I know of. What's this all about and why the hocus pocus routine? I can't afford to take any chances. Oh? Can you afford to tell me what it's all about? My name is Kinsella. William Kinsella. Yeah, I know. You told me that over the phone. You're sure no one followed you here? Sure enough. Now, you're going to let me in on I what's... I want to go... hire you, Mr. Shane. Well, well, that's the first thing you've said that makes sense. What do you want me to do? Protect me. Well, from what? I... Don't know. You don't know. Now, now, let's not start the double talk again. Oh, please, but... Mr. Shea. I... Well, to tell the truth, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Yeah, I can see that. But what of? I tell you, I don't know. Sure, it sounds insane, but... But here, Mr. Shea. I received this through the mail this afternoon. Yeah. Four names at the top of the page. Yes. William Kinsella, Ellen Dad, Joshua Jaffet, and Tom Swigers. Yes. Now, read what's written underneath the names, Mr. Shea. Those who have sinned will be punished. It may come swiftly or slowly or by an unknown hand, but punishment is inevitable, and the punishment is death. Hmm. Yes. Yes, you see now why I'm terrified. It's a death note, Mr. Shane. 
And a death note. And my name is at the top of the list. In a moment, we'll return to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the mail-order murders. Well, it had started out as a pretty routine day. I'd helped an elderly lady find a necklace which turned out to be mislaid instead of stolen, and I'd spent the afternoon at a pretty stuffy wedding reception guarding the gifts. But then in the evening, a jittery little guy named Kinsella called me over to his apartment and showed me a death note he'd just gotten, listing his name with three others. One look at Kinsella's face told me he thought the guy who'd sent the note meant business. Mr. Shade, you've got to protect me. Money's no object. First, I... Uh, now, now, just a minute, Mr. Kinsella. Let's slow down a little. Uh, have you any idea who might have sent the note? None. Not at all, Mr. Shane. It's a complete and horrible mystery to me. Hmm. Sounds like some kind of fanatic or crank. Those who have sinned will be punished. Yes, it does sound like some sort of fanatic, but... But who? This is the first notes you've gotten? No, there have been others, but I never paid much attention before because the notes were vague. But this note mentions death, and it lists names. Yeah. I wonder if the boy who wrote the note is after you himself or if he's thinking of sending someone. What do you mean? Well, the note says death may come by an unknown hand. But that's the terrible part of this whole thing. I don't know who sent the threat. I don't know who's after me, and I most certainly don't know why. The uh, note says something about those who have sinned. That's ridiculous. There's nothing, absolutely nothing in my past that would possibly warrant such... Yeah, yeah. Well, what do these friends of yours say about it? Friends? What friends? Well, the other names on the list here. Let's see. Uh, Ellen Dad, Joshua Jaffet, Tom Swagger. They're no friends of mine. Well, acquaintances, then. You don't understand, Mr. Shane. I don't even know these people. Huh? I've never heard of any of them. Their names mean nothing to me. You sure about that, Mr. Kinsella? Absolutely. Well, it sort of complicates things. I thought maybe if I could find something to connect you with these other three, some link between you, we might have something to go on. But Mr. I... Shane, please stay here with me and protect me at least long enough for me to wind up my affairs so that I can leave New Orleans if necessary. Well, I... I don't know what your usual rate of pay is per day, but I'll double it. You know, you're getting more convincing by the moment, Mr. Kinsella. I have plenty of room for you here. Okay. I'll go home and pick up a toothbrush and be back here in an hour. I went outside and down the street. I was thinking about how terrified Kinsella seemed to be about the whole thing. I was wondering if maybe he knew a little more about why someone wanted to kill him than he'd told me. And then about half a block away from Kinsella's apartment, I spotted what was undoubtedly one of the last of its kind in existence. An organ grinder man. He was a stocky, barrel-chested gent. And the hand organ he was cranking sounded as if it was protesting against overwork. On his shoulder perched a little monkey dressed in a red corduroy suit and a green hat with a feather. And the whole sight took me back about 20 years. So I fished around in my pocket for a coin and waited for him. Hello. Mr. Oh, oh, sorry. I didn't mean to scare you. Well, I... Uh, I guess you didn't see me. Sort of a dark night. Yes, a darker night. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, I haven't seen an organ grinder since I was a kid, practically. So? There's not many of us left now. No, I guess not. You're working kind of late tonight, huh? Night, day, makes no difference. Yeah, yeah I guess you're right. Hey, it's a monkey you got there. He's a fine monkey. Pepe. You want to see Pepe do dance? No, I'm afraid I haven't the time. Uh... Name is uh, Demetrius. Uh, Demetrius. Some other time. Huh? Here's a little something. You talk to Pepe. He catch. Okay. Hey, he could play shortstop on a few teams I know of. Where'd you get Must it? go now. Thanks, mister. Good night. Demetrius started cranking the hand organ again and moved on down the street. Pepe turned around, stared at me a moment, and then delicately stuck out his tongue. <laughs> Such gratitude. I went to my room, picked up my things, and went back to Kinsella's apartment. He showed me to my new room. I suggested he lock his door and also his window because it was a ground floor apartment. Then we both turned in. I guess it was a little after midnight when something woke me up. I couldn't tell just what it was, but I remembered vaguely hearing some kind of sound. I got out of bed and went out in the living room. Turned on the lights. Nothing there. Then I went to Kinsella's bedroom door. Mr. Kinsella? Mr. Kinsella? 
Hey, Kinsella. It's Shane. Open the door. What's the matter, Shane? You had me worried for a minute. I guess I was sound asleep. What is it? I don't know, something woke me up. A, a slight noise. I thought I'd better check to make sure you're okay. Oh, yes, I'm all right. Matter of fact, I was having a very pleasant dream. I could hear some sort of strange music. It seemed like it was right under my window. Music? Yes, uh, like, a, uh, like a calliope. I, I could hear... A calliope? Oh, sort of. Hey, wait a minute. Could it have been a, a hand organ? What? Yes. Yes, that's what it was. I, I, I dreamt I... Maybe the music was in a dream. Oh, Demetrius really does work late. Huh? What are you talking about? Skipper. Well, let's turn in again. Nothing happened the rest of the night except that I had a long dream about perching on a guy's shoulder dressed in a red corduroy suit while people tossed nickels at me. Yeah, it might be an easier way to make a living at that. The next morning, bright and early, I told Kinsella to lock himself in for the day. Then I went down to police headquarters and in the door marked homicide. Hello, Shane. Good morning, Inspector. How's the mastermind of the homicide bureau these days? Thanks. You looking for a job, Shane, or you want to borrow some dough? No. As you sometimes say, LaFever, wrong twice. I already have a job. Matter of fact, that's what I came down to talk to you about. I'm all... Years. I know. Talk, funny man. I've been hired by a guy named Kinsella who received what looks like a crank note. He was taking the whole thing very seriously. So? So the note has four names on it, Kinsella. Ellen Dant, Joshua Jaffet, and Tom Swaggart. May not be anything to it, but I just thought I'd drop in and let you know. Let's have it again. Have what again? The list. William Kinsella, Ellen Dan, Joshua Jaffet, and Tom Swigert. Yeah. Why, do you know any of them? Uh, how about Ellen Dan? Kinsella said her name meant nothing to him. Or me. How about Joshua Jaffet? Mm-mm. And I've never heard of your client, Kinsella. Only one we have a line on is this Tom Swigert. Swigert's his last name on the list. What about him? Shane, do you ever hear of the gouge killing a couple years back? The gouge killing? No. What was that? Well... There was a rich old gent named Daniel Gouds who used to live on the island of Capri in the Mediterranean. One day he turned up dead with quite a few thousand of his dollars missing. This guy, Tom Swaggart, was on the island at the time. He was questioned about the killing, but was released later for lack of evidence. Hmm. Do you think this note Kinsella got has anything to do with the Gouds killing? I don't know. Yet. Do you suppose maybe there's some connection between Swaggart and the rest of the names on the list, then? That'd be a guess, Shane, and right now I'm not in a guessing mood. Of course, the whole thing could be some crackpot's idea of a joke. It might. You don't think so, huh? No. Nope. Hey, incidentally, how come this Tom Swigert's the only guy on the list you know anything about? Is he a friend of yours or something? Not exactly a friend right now. He's sort of a special project of mine. What do you mean? We found Swigert down near the waterfront last night. Had a knife in his back. Very dead. <laughs> In a moment, we'll return to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the mail-order murders. It all started when a guy named Kinsella hired me to protect him from an unknown killer who'd sent him a death threat. On the note were listed four names. Kinsella, Ellen Dant, Joshua Jaffet, and Tom Swiger. Kinsella said he didn't know any of the other three. So the next morning, I wasn't sure just how seriously to take the note when I went down to police headquarters to tell Inspector Lefebvre about it. But Lefebvre took it very seriously, and with good reason. He told me that the last man on the list, Tom Swigert, had been murdered the night before. So, like I say, Shane, whoever wrote that note means business. You know, Lefebvre, it'd be interesting if it turned out that the reason Swigert was killed had something to do with that gouge killing. I don't feel like playing guessing games. Well, maybe we'll find out before long, huh? Shane... You're a real nice boy. Lefebvre, there's only one reason you ever say those sweet things to me. That's when you want me to keep out of something. Yeah. Why? Because whoever wrote that note wasn't kidding. He's vicious and deadly. He's already killed once, and there are three more names on his list. So? So if you get mixed up in it and get in his way, you can get burned bad. Thanks for the advice, Lefebvre. No charge. Tell you what, I'll carry my little fire extinguisher with me full time. You do that, Shane. Just one more thing. Oh, no, Lefebvre. You're not going to give me that don't leave town routine again. I was going to suggest that you do. That evening, I decided to pay a call on Ellen Dent. His name was right under Kinsella's on the death list. I looked up her address and went over. 
Ellen lived in an expensive-looking apartment, and she was a very smooth-looking creature. She wasn't very impressed when I told her about the note Kinsella had gotten. Mr. Shane, I've never heard of this man, Kinsella. Why should I be concerned about his getting threatening notes? I got one of them, too. But I think it's probably somebody's feeble idea of a joke. Well, not much of a joke, Miss Dancy. Kinsella says he doesn't know you. That makes it mutual, then, as I've been trying to tell you. How about a gent named Joshua Jack? I'm afraid I don't know him, either. Or Tom Swigert? Really, Mr. Shane? That's just as well you didn't know Swigert, I guess. He got himself killed last night. Oh? But that doesn't concern you. No, it doesn't. Now, if you'll excuse me. Sure, just one more thing, Mr. Ant. Ever happen to hear of a rich old guy named Daniel Gouge? Gouge? Yeah, I used to live on the island of Capri. Really, Mr. Shane? Running around asking people about names they've never heard of before. Haven't you anything better to do? Not right now, Ellen, but maybe I'll think of something. See you around. My next stop was at the home of Joshua Jaffet over on the other side of town. He was a tall, thin guy with thick glasses, a sharp nose, and a sharper tongue. He kept the nose buried in an enormous stamp album. Mr. Shane, must you stand in my light? I can't even see these stamps, let alone get them in the right places. I'm sorry. Is that better? A little. Quite a collection you got there. One of the best. You seem to specialize in stamps from the Mediterranean. Area. Any law against that? Not that I know of. Uh, ever done much traveling around there? None. Now, where did I put that Malta step? Now, now, look here, Shane. I'm looking. This is all foolishness. Complete, utter foolishness. Just because I got a crackpot note from some pants, so there's no reason for you to come around bothering me with your silly petting. I've told you I don't know any of the people on the list. Now, if you can... Well, maybe I... Mr. Just... Shane, will you stop standing in my life? I got out of Joshua's light and out of his house. But outside, it occurred to me friend Joshua had been just a little too quick to say no when I asked him if he'd ever been in the Mediterranean. So I went across the street and waited in the dark. I didn't know exactly what I was waiting for, but I waited anyway. Then, about ten minutes later, I heard someone coming down the street. Yeah, it was my old friend Demetrius, the organ grinder man. Hello, Demetrius. Uh, oh, you see you again. Yeah. yeah. You really get around, don't you? You, you maybe follow me, mister? Me? <laughs> no, matter of fact, I was beginning to wonder if it wasn't the other way around. I don't know what you talk about. Oh, no, no. Of course not. Uh... Where do you usually hang out around town? The, the street they call the San Luis. You uh, been in this country long, Demetrius? No, not so long, mister. Where do you come from? Uh, it's a long way from here. Sunny land, blue water. It sounds like the Mediterranean. Yes, it's a beautiful place. That's what they tell me, Demetrius. Good night, mister. Demetrius disappeared around the corner. I stood there a while longer across the street and up a little way from Jaffet's house. It was about ten minutes later that a dark-colored coupe turned the corner and eased to a stop in front of the house. Someone got out and headed for the door. I couldn't see very much, but it looked like a woman. Then as she opened the door, the light from the hall outlined her face. It was Ellen Dant. Yeah, the girl who said she'd never heard of Joshua Jaffet. She closed the door behind her, but not more than two minutes later, she came flying out again and jumped into her car. I started to cross the street toward her. Hey! Hey, wait a minute! Ellen! Hey! Ah, but I was too late. I crossed the street and walked in the open front door of Jaffet's house. There was no one in sight. I started down the hall, and when I got to the library, I stopped. Yeah, there was Jaffet, all right. Sitting at his desk, his nose still buried in the stamp album. Like Tom Swigert, he had a knife in his back. And also, like Swigert, Jaffet was dead. I stood there a minute or two looking at the charming sight in front of me, and then I went over and picked up a telephone. Calling me, Shane? Lefebvre. Looks like the boy we're after is quite a knife artist, huh? Yeah, but I'm not so sure he's a boy. You know, the more I think about it, Lefebvre, the more it looks like these killings are tied up with the one over in Capri two years ago. Mm-hmm. You found out any more about what really happened over there? A little, not much. This rich old guy, Gouge, lived alone, except for one combination servant and secretary. 
Looks like now there were several in on the killing. Maybe it was a hired job. Mm. Shane, I told you once to get out of this deal. Now I'm telling you twice. I think you're biting off a lot more than you can chew. Oh, forget, Inspector. I have a real strong jaw. Mm -hmm. Just be sure you don't lead with it. The Thieves' boys arrived about then and went to work. I left, and I went straight to Ellen Dance's apartment. Because it looked to me like this case was going to wind up real fast, and I couldn't think of a better place to wind it up than at her apartment. I didn't even bother to knock because the door was unlocked. I pushed it open with my foot and waited. Nothing happened. I went in. The room was dark except for a ray of moonlight coming through the window. I started reaching around for a light switch. Then I saw something glinting in the air. It was a knife blade that was coming down at me fast. I lunged to one side and the blade ripped down through my coat sleeve. I tried to grab it, but I was off balance. And then the knife came down through the air again. And this time it was headed straight for my throat. We'll be back in a moment with a thrilling climax to tonight's Michael Shane adventure. Well, there I was in Ellen Dance's apartment, in the dark, with a knife coming down at my throat. I managed to get one hand up just in time to grab the knife blade. It cut into my palm, but I held on and grabbed the killer's wrist with my other hand. It was a small wrist, but strong. The knife started twisting up at me, so I put everything I had into one wrench and dove for the floor, twisting the killer's wrist as I fell. Suddenly, the knife went skittering across the floor. I jumped to my feet just as the door slammed. I went out in the hall, but whoever it was had been too fast for me. There was no one in sight out on the street when I got there. So oh, I gave up the chase and headed for Kinsella's apartment. And I wasn't in a very pleasant mood. Look, Kinsella, I'm getting awfully tired of this whole deal. But, Mr. Shane, you... you lied to me when you said you didn't know what this is all about. Go. Oh. All right, Mr. Shane. It's true. I can't lie to you. But you apparently know a lot of the story already. I might as well tell you the rest of it. Spill it. I was Daniel Gouger's secretary in Capri. He was murdered for his money. I found out who the killer was. I've been running away ever since. The killer has been following me and has had someone else after me. Someone I don't know. Yeah? Why didn't you tell the police who the killer was? I... I know I should have done that long ago, but I... Oh, I don't expect anyone to understand, but... It was because of the way I felt about the killer. I, I couldn't help myself. I see. Just one more question. Did Daniel Gouge have any particular girlfriend? Yes, Mr. Shane. Okay. We're going to set a little trap. Here's a pencil. I want you to write a note to Gouger's girlfriend, Ellen Dan. Mr. Shane. Tell her you'll turn her in unless she meets you on the corner in front of my office at midnight with some dough. But I couldn't do that. Look, I'll be there with you. But I wasn't thinking of myself. I, I just... Look, you want to go on this way forever? No, but... Write it. Very well. What are you going to do with it? Going to use it as bait. Hmm. You're not exactly the world's best penman, are you? Well, I'm sorry. It's because I'm nervous and upset, I guess. I'm having a hard time forming the letters. Yeah. I'll write another note. Ah, never mind. I think I won't be able to read this one all right. Okay, Kinsella, stay here in your apartment until quarter of twelve. Then take a cab to my office and meet me on the corner in front. I think maybe we'll get this whole thing wound up. I put the note in my pocket and left. I went over to St. Louis Street and hung around until Demetrius, the monkey organ man, came along. I made a little conversation with him and invited him to the party in front of my office. Then I called the Fever's office and left an invitation for him, too. I was hoping it would be quite a gathering. Kinsella was the first to arrive, right on the dot at midnight. Mr. Shane. Yeah, hey, you're right on time, Kinsella. Yes, I've been riding around in the cab for a few minutes, waiting until 12. Has she shown up? Not yet. We'll just stand here in the shadows and wait. Uh, Mr. Shane, would it be all right if I sort of kept out of sight when she comes? I just would rather not see her after all that's happened and, well, because of the way I feel about her. Yeah, I think that'd be okay, Kinsella. Oh, I'd appreciate it very much. It isn't easy for me to do this... Uh, Mr. Shane, someone's coming. Relax, it isn't Ellen. Shane? Hello, Lefevre. I got your message. Now, what's this all about? Just giving a little party, Lefevre. I know you'd never forgive yourself if you missed it. Mr. Shane, who's this? A Lefevre, a friend of mine. Lefevre, this is Mr. Kinsella, my client. Hello? I'm afraid I don't understand this, Mr. Shane. I thought just you and I were to be... Uh, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, here he comes. Here who comes? The guest of honor. 
Guy named Demetrius. Why, it's an organ grinder. Mm hmm. Oh, Mr. Shane, do you think that he is working for Ellen? Well, we'll soon find out. Hello, Demetrius. Hello, Mr. This supposed to be the floor show, Shane? You never can tell, the favor. Mr. Shane, will you kindly explain Mr. this is... Mr. Oh, what's the matter, Demetrius? Who is this man with you? He's my client, Mr. Kinsella. Why? He... He's the one, mister. He's the one. Huh? Yes, he's the one I saw leave his apartment the night the first man was killed. Yes, this is Kinsella. Let the, let's have that again. Why? The man's insane. Yes, I saw him. And then when the second man was killed, I was near his house. I looked through the window. I saw this Kinsella stab him to death. I tell you, he's crazy. And then tonight, when you were at the woman's apartment, mister, this Kinsella was there too. He attacked you. Oh, you Kinsella's got a gun. I see it, my people. I see it. Oh. Well... I think that'll keep our friend Kinsella on ice until your voice and cut him away, Lefebvre. Yeah. So Kinsella was the knife artist, huh? Sure looks that way. Now, if we only had the girl, we'd be She's able... been in jail for an hour, Shane. We picked it up. Oh? Did she get a story out of her? Yeah. From what she said, it looks like she, Jaffet, and Swaggart hired a guy to kill Gouge over on Capri. The three of them then decided to cross the killer. They took the dough and left in a hurry. So now it turns out that Kinsella here was the killer, and he's been looking for them ever since. That sounds logical. He put his own name on top of the death list to take suspicion off of him. Well, all I can say is you're longer on luck than you are on brain, Shane. Oh? Uh-huh. Arranging this little trap to pick up the wrong girl. Bloody lucky for you this guy Demetrius spilled what he'd seen and broke the case for you. I guess you're right, Lafayette. Yeah, maybe next time you'll remember to keep out of these things. I'll try to, sir. Uh, me, sir. Oh, yeah, Demetrius. I'd almost forgotten you were here. Thanks. Thanks a lot for all your help. That's all right, Demetrius. Uh, here's a little something for your trouble. No, no. Over here. Thank you, mister. Thank you. Uh, hmm? Demetrius... Uh... Didn't see that dough you held out to him. No. He's blind. Mm Mm-hmm. Demetrius is blind. Shane, like you say, Lefebvre, it's lucky he broke the case for me, isn't it? Good night, genius. This is your director, Bill Russo, again. Our story is based on characters created by Brett Halliday and written by Bob Wright. The music is composed and conducted by John Duffy, and Michael Shane is portrayed by Jeff Chan. The New Adventures of Michael Shane is a Don W. Char production, transcribed in Hollywood and distributed exclusively by the Broadcasters Guild. Next week, you'll hear Michael Shane in another thrilling adventure from mysterious and colorful New Orleans. Okay, Shane. Get the picture. A guy in front of you with a thirty-eight, a guy in back with a rifle, and you with nothing. If wishing will make it so, you better start wishing to be somewhere else fast, because... your director, Bill Russo, inviting you to listen to Michael Shane, that reckless, red-headed Irishman back at his old haunts in New Orleans, in another transcribed episode. We call it The Case of the Model Murder. Wait of my compliments to the chef, the shrimp superb. Look, maybe I'm talking out of turn, Mr. Franklin. After all, you're hiring me, but 20 a day is mighty short wages for some of the things I get involved in. And I've learned that the phony cases usually have the biggest hospital bills. Phony, Mr. Shane? Yeah. I get a message that you want to see me urgently. Okay, I come dashing down here, expecting you to be tearing your hair or dying from a leaky artery. So what do I find? You find me in a seafood bar enjoying New Orleans' most succulent river shrimp. And sipping excellent dry Manhattan. That's right. Then you, you give me a story about a girl, Marianne Chevney. I have to find her and bring her to her home by Friday midnight or she loses eight million bucks. Is that too complicated? No, Mr. Franklin, it's too simple. Instead of giving me any details here, you go on chewing your shrimp. And sipping my Manhattan. <laughs> Waiter, one more of the same. Dry. Are you sure you won't join me, Mr. Shevney? Look, look, this picture you gave me, is it the only one you have? 
In the most recent, yes. It was taken a few weeks before Marianne ran away from home seven years ago. Oh. She never got along with her father. Is it? What about this Friday business? Why Friday after seven years? Simply because Friday at midnight, Marianne will be 25. Uh-huh. So she's got to return home by then or she doesn't get her money. Mm, brilliant. Wait, another order of shrimp, please. You're sure giving me a lot of time. This is Thursday. I've got one whole day. Uh, Marianne's father was your partner, half-owner of Chevney Franklin Importers, huh? That's right. Chevney yeah. died over three weeks ago. Why the sudden concern now? Oh, I haven't been idle. I've been running ads for the girl in the papers. Yeah, you've been a busy little bee, you have. Mr. Shane. All right, what happens to the eight million if Marianne Chevney doesn't get home in time? It goes into the business. But you're the business now. That's right. Don't look so perplexed. It's quite simple, really. Yeah, something simple. You're hiring me to find her so that you can lose $8 million. Precisely, Mr. Shane. Wait up. Another dry Manhattan. We'll return in a moment to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the model murder. From the minute I walked into the seafood bar at the Carlton Manor Hotel and sat down opposite Franklin of Chevney Franklin Importers, I knew I was walking into something with more angles and, of course, in advanced geometry. My first impulse after hearing his story was to tell Mr. Franklin to go peddle his shrimp. Only I suddenly remembered that the only jingle I could raise in my pockets was the sound of my car keys rattling around. It seems his partner, Chevney, had died some three weeks before, and Eight million bucks he couldn't take with him was waiting for his errant daughter, Marianne, who'd run away from home seven years ago when she was 18. I was supposed to find the girl and bring her to her late father's house before Friday midnight, tomorrow night. Well, I took another look at the photo of the girl. The words Harrison Halstead Model Agency were stamped on the back. At least she'd worked there seven years ago. I decided to give it a whirl. The receptionist was a sugar blonde with a cooperative look in her eyes. Well, I sure would like to help you, Mr. Shane, but I really don't know any Miss Chevney. Well, you handle a lot of models here. Oh, that's right. This photograph help you any? Uh-huh. Pretty. No, I'm afraid not. Taken seven years ago. I just bet you'd go for something a little older. And you'd have a good bet. The boss around? Well, yes, Mr. Shane, but I don't know... Miss Winters, I want you... Oh. Yes, sir? Mr. Shane's looking for a girl by the name of Chevney, Mr. Halston. Sorry, I can't help you. Oh, this photograph. Hmm? No. What do you want with her? Well, she's got $8 million coming to her. Sorry, Mr. Shane. Well, that's okay. Miss Winters, get Miller on the phone, will you? He said he'll be ready at 2 this afternoon. Yes, sir. He recognized the photo. Did he, Mr. Shane? You're a real good kid. Company girl, loyal. <laughs> Thank you. Follow the rules. Uh-huh. Look, I'm just trying to help a penniless girl get eight million bucks. But well, take one of our cards, Mr. Shane. You just might want to come back. Thanks. Uh, I don't have eight million, but... You uh, don't need eight million. How much? Just enough for a rail steak and baked potato. It's a deal. <laughs> Miss Winters struck me as a girl with the wrong name. There's nothing chilly in her attitude. As for this Halstead character, he was one of those guys with a monogram complex. Everywhere you looked, you found H.H. staring you in the face. Harrison Halstead. On his tie, on the pocket of his shirt. Even the cigarette lighter on the reception desk had the same two H's sort of leaning against one another. And the agency card Miss Winters had given me, they were there too. As I waited for the elevator, I turned the card over... Handwriting was nice and firm. Mady Carter, 2614 Mount York Avenue, might be able to help you. I thought, Shane, how would you get along without that winning personality of yours? Mady Carter's place was a little bungalow in a court. There was a light on behind curtains. I rang the bell. Yes? Miss Carter? What do you want? I'd like to talk to you. What do you want? I'm looking for Marianne Chevney. I don't know anybody by that name. Miss Winters at the Halstead Agency. I can't, me... I can't. I don't know her. She isn't here. Shh. Easy. 
Gee, you better lower the volume. What'll the neighbors think? Coming. Thanks. Now, look, Miss Carter, I'm not trying to do anything but find Miss Shevney so I can give her $8 million. She doesn't want... Well, well, you see, it doesn't pay to keep secrets. Where is she? I don't know. Well, how do you know she doesn't want the money? She told me. Oh, you spoke to her. No, no. Why don't you leave me alone? I don't know anything. Look, all I want... Uh, never mind, Miss Carter. Maybe I got a bum steer. Sorry I bothered you. I suppose I could have broken her down if I'd kept at it. But I suddenly found what I came for. There was an envelope face down on the desk. From where I was standing, I was able to read the return address on the flap. Big as life it was. The initials MC, apartment 5, and the address 318 East 54th Street, New York City. MC, Marion Chevney. As I drove back to town, I began to get a familiar feeling... Maybe I don't have eyes behind my head, but I do have a little spot between my shoulder blades that's got a special talent. If somebody's following me, it begins to itch. It had bothered me a little right after I left the Halstead Agency, but I didn't pay much attention to it. And right now, it was giving me the squirms in high gear, and I decided to do something about it. I pulled off the main road onto a side street, but quick. I parked, doused the lights, and waited. Cars kept going by, and... And I spotted a maroon job with one light dimmer than the other coming around the block for the second time. This time it went about a hundred yards past me and then it parked. I waited. Nobody got out of the car. The spot between my shoulders stopped itching. I knew I was on solid ground. I got out of the car and started up the street. I saw the guy behind the wheel of the maroon job looking straight ahead as if he had nothing better to do than just sit there. I pulled the door open and slid into the front seat. What's doing, champ? Nice tail job. No? Bro job. Well, you're not so bad yourself, spotting it. New Orleans does that for me. There's a field of the city. You must be from out of town. Yeah. Working? Yeah. Jonathan Franklin? Never heard of him. Franklin and Chevney importers. Bananas, I think. I hate bananas. Who is it? Well, you're doing all the talking, champ. This is a tough town for strangers. Not so tough. You're not so tough either. <laughs> all right, nice hey. tie you got. Slips up nice and easy. You can't talk, champ, but you can sure listen. That's a very pretty color you're turning. Now, let's see. Yeah, shoulder holster, 45 automatic. <laughs> okay, you're going to breathe now, but don't overdo it. And take a tip. I don't like being followed, and strangers in town ought to be courteous. You're a pretty tough boy, Shane. No, no, I'm the easygoingest guy in the world. I just don't like being tailed. Remember, mind your manners when you're in a strange city, champ. Franklin was in the dining room of the hotel, carving up some rare roast beef with Yorkshire pudding on the side. I dropped into a chair on the other side of his table and told him what I'd found out. As usual, he got real interested. New York, eh? Yeah? Will you join me, Mr. Shane? You're yeah. real worried about getting Marianne Shevney back here before tomorrow night, aren't you? Oh, you can't rush things, my boy. Ah, this case smells clear across the river. Don't you trust me, Mr. Franklin? Yeah, one moment, Mr. Shane. Wait up. Yes, sir? Bring me a phone, please. Uh, you were saying... I said somebody's been telling me. I'd like to know why. You're implying, Mr. Shane, that because I don't trust you, I've hired someone to watch you? In a nutshell. Now, that is not true. But the fact that someone is following you is very disconcerting. Your telephone, Mr. Franklin? Yes. Oh, thank you, waiter. You pardon me, Mr. Shane. Uh, travel desk, please. Hello? This is Jonathan Franklin speaking. Will you arrange for a charter plane with the New Orleans Charter Service, please? In the name of Michael Shane. Yes. Uh. In about uh, an hour. It's now 8.30. The plane is to go to New York and leave here at 9.30. Thank you. Well, you're full of surprises, Mr. Franklin. And I've got another one for you. Yeah? If you succeed in bringing Marianne back here before midnight tomorrow, there's a $1,000 bonus for you. Sometimes, Mr. Franklin, your conversation is positively brilliant. <laughs> Chartered plane to New York and a $1,000 jackpot at the end of the rainbow. 
I felt like a captain of industry as the plane got the right away from the airport tower and circled in for a landing. New York, great little city. It was four o'clock in the morning when the taxi pulled up in front of 518 East 54th Street. I told the cabbie to wait. What's money to me? Took the stairs of the brownstone two at a time. Apartment five was at the end of the hall on the first floor. I knocked. Nothing happened. I knocked again. Nobody could sleep like that. Then I tried the door. Locked. Apparently, Mary Ann was a dirty stay out late. Across the hall, the door to apartment number four said manager. I walked over and started knocking again. Well, what is it? What is it? I'm sorry to get you out of bed all the time, but I'd like you to open the door to apartment five. Are you crazy waking a body at four in the morning? Look, I'm a private detective. I'm looking for the girl who has that apartment. I want to get in, so I'll be there when she gets home. Private detective? <laughs> I'm sorry. If it was a police, it'd be... Does just... this give me the necessary rank? Five dollars. All right, make it ten. Well, <laughs> why don't you tell me who was a private detective in the first place? Come on. Hey, light switch in there. There. Yeah. Make yourself comfortable. Thanks. Here's your pound of flesh. Now, you won't tell her that I let you... What's the matter with you? Hey, over there, on the floor in the hall. First, I saw a lot of blonde hair. And then I saw there was a girl attached to it. She probably would have been real pretty without that bullet hole in her forehead. We'll return in a moment to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the model murder. A glutton by the name of Jonathan Franklin had waved an ice-cold scent in front of my nose, but strangely enough, it still had a strong odor. My assignment was to find Mary Ann Shevney and get her back to her late dad's home so she could collect eight million bucks according to the terms of her inheritance. Well, I picked up the trail at the Harrison Halstead Model Agency, where Miss Shevney had once worked. Mr. H.H. and his secretary, Miss Winters, acted like I was after atomic secrets. And as I left, Miss Winters shoved a card in my hand with the name and address of Mady Carter. Well, Miss Carter had the willies bad, but I picked up the information that the girl I was looking for was in New York. Franklin stopped eating roast beef long enough to charter a plane for me. I arrived at the end of the trail just in time to find my quarry still warm, but with a bullet in her head. Oh, my police. We'll have to call the police. Yeah, but not before I make a phone call long distance. Oh, you won't be long now, will you? Uh, it's only because they, they get real mad. If you don't tell Long me. distance. Uh, I want you to get me Mr. Jonathan Franklin at the yeah. Carlton Manor in New Orleans. Oh, you, Collect. Oh, Michael Shane call. at this end. Uh, That's right. Uh, this is uh, Circle 65970. Yeah, my reputation... You know this will be in the papers, don't you? Be police all over the place and reporters. Yeah, yeah, and her blood stains a nice carpet, yeah, too. I feel real for sorry for you. Yeah. Hello? Well, don't be uh, hello, Mr. Franklin. Yes, yes, what is it, please? Well, don't take don't your don't earmuffs don't off. Don't you might like to hear now, this. Son, oh, what is it, Shane? Well, just a second, Mr. Franklin. Well, look, look, old timer. Don't network. you have a telephone in your own apartment? Yes. Well, I never thought of that. Well, think of it. Well, Shane? The gal is dead. Now, what do you want me to do? Come on home. You've done a good job. You're not sorry? No. Should I be? Well, what about the one grand bonus? I guess that's cold turkey, huh? We'll talk about it when you get back. Yeah, yeah. Cold turkey, did you say? Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned it. That's an excellent thought. With a glass of cold milk, of course. Goodbye, Mr. Shane. I had a little time before the cops had come, so I started moseying around the apartment. First thing that caught my eye was a cigarette lighter on an end table. It looked familiar, very familiar. And all of a sudden, I knew why. There was a monogram on it. Yeah, two H's sort of leaning against each other. I got the long-distance operator again and put in a call to Mr. Halstead, also collect. There is no answer. Are you sure you got the right guy? Harrison Halstead's residence in New Orleans, Orange, 240. Thanks, operator. Shall I try later? I didn't know how, but it was pretty obvious that Halstead was in this thing up to his ears. I kept on wandering around the living room, and then I found it. There was a letter on the table in a girl's handwriting. The date was just two days ago, and the letter started with the words, Dear Matey. I didn't have to read the signature to know it was Mary Ann. 
I took a good look at the girl on the floor. Her hair was blonde, only there was about a sixteenth of an inch of dark brunette showing at the hairline. I got real smart then. I finally figured it out. This girl was Mady Carter, and the frightened girl back in New Orleans was really Mary Ann Chevney. Only somebody else had apparently made the same mistake, and it was my guess he was hightailing it back to New Orleans to correct his error. I made a quick call to Homicide to pay my respects and then headed for the airport. Luckily, the plane was ready to go when I got there. Oh, Shane, you had the girl in your hands and then you waltzed off with a dream. One thing was clear. Mary Ann Chevney had plenty to worry about. It took me just ten minutes from the time I landed back in New Orleans to get to her place. The door to Mary Ann's bungalow was locked and there was no answer to my banging. I started around the house trying to get a look-see inside. Nothing. Nobody home. When I got around to the rear and peeked in the bedroom, I saw why. The place was empty. Either she decided to run or else she'd been taken on a trip without a return ticket. I scrambled over to Carlton Manor and guess what? Yeah, Jonathan Franklin was eating. It seems you made a mistake, Mr. Shane. How do you know? The papers. Wasn't Mary Ann who was killed in New York. It was a girl by the name of Carter, Madeline Carter. You still want me to find Mary Ann? Oh, of course. Let's see. Three now. You only have nine hours left. Ooh, uh, will you have some lunch? Bouillabaisse. No, thanks. Don't you ever find time to eat? Yeah. Yeah, but I'm peculiar. I only eat three meals a day. Marianne Shevney's life was in danger, and I wanted to get to her while she was still hale and hearty. I drove over to Halstead's agency. Miss Winters still had that cooperative look. Well, hi there. Hi, where's your boss? Out. Been in today? Well, I know. As a matter of fact, he hadn't. Did you try to reach him at home? Yes, I did. He wasn't there. Oh, is something wrong? Something's very wrong, sweetheart. Look, that note you slipped me last night. Not the kind I usually write. Matey Carter, you knew I was looking for Marianne Chevney. Well, I said Matey Carter might be a help. She's a friend of Miss Chevney's. You didn't know there was a switch? Switch? Matey Carter was in New York. She was killed last night. Killed? Halstead could have taken a plane up there last night, couldn't he? Well, I, I don't know. As far as you know, he could have, couldn't he? Well, yes. I haven't spoken to him since last night. Tell me, is he a bachelor? Yeah. Lives alone? Uh-huh. In town or in the country? Both. Oh, he has a country place. Where? Well, I'll tell you in a minute. You want me to look it up? You bet I do, sweetheart. If I'm not too late, it might make the difference between a long and wealthy life or a 45 slug to Mary Ann Chevney. It took me almost an hour to drive out to where Halstead had his beach home. The place had a real subtropical flavor, bordering on the gulf and surrounded by a mass of lush undergrowth and stubby cypress trees. I didn't bother to announce myself. I just barged in. She'd been here all right. There was a woman's jacket over a chair in the big paneled living room and her purse half open on the floor. I went to the back door and opened it and looked out. <laughs> Bounced off a stone and I caught a glint of the bullet as it wind off on its ricochet. It had come from the left. I ducked back into the house. He had shells to burn, whoever he was. It was no sense my perching like a sitting duck, so I started toward the front. The living room had been empty a moment before, but now there was a man in it, a man with a gun. Halstead. Stop where you are, Mr. Shane, and raise your hand. Where's Marianne? It's none of your business. I said raise your hand. Now, look, Halstead, don't be coy about this thing. There's a guy out there with a gun, a big gun, and he's got big ideas. So have I. Move back against the wall. Look, who's working for who around You've here? You've been sticking your nose in where it doesn't belong, Shane. I told you yesterday that if there was anything about Marianne Chevney you ought to concern yourself with. What did you do with her? Let's just say she's in protective custody. Yours? As I said, that's none of your business. But... Hello, champ. What's uh... doing? Still telling me, huh? Yeah. And this time, no necktie. Very bad taste. Huh? Drop that rifle. I don't think so. You ought to practice more, you mess. Oh, this is real cute. Champ is in the kitchen with a rifle, and you're in here with a pistol, Halstead. You both have a grudge against me, only you can't stop worrying about each other. Shane, who is that man in the kitchen? I don't know. I haven't figured it out yet, but I think he's after Marianne, too. Aren't you, Champ? Could be. But right now, I'd get more places. <laughs> Missed again. Just stick your head in that doorway once more. Now, Mr. Shane, I'll give you just three seconds to tell me what you want. I told you. I want the truth, now. What difference does it make what I want with the girl if you're already... All right, Shane, I warned you. We'll be back in just a moment with Mike Shane and the thrilling climax to our story. It 
it was a second or two before I realized Halstead had fired at the laddie with the rifle, not me. But I wasn't inclined to administer first aid to champ lying in the kitchen doorway because from the look on Halstead's face, he was getting ready for a repeat performance. And then I got a shock. Like when the shower suddenly turned from hot to cold. Mary Ann, the real Mary Ann, stepped into the room and went over to Halstead. I figured it was time to call a halt and settle who was who. Hello, Mary Ann. You... You killed Mady. No, the champ in the kitchen, it was his work. Why don't you leave me alone, all of you? All I've been trying to do is bring you back to your father's home by midnight tonight so you can inherit the eight million he left you. Marianne and I were married last night, Shane. What? So now the matter of her inheritance is my business. So why don't you leave us alone? I will if Marianne or Mrs. Halstead will go back to her father's house. But why, Mr. Shane? Why should I go back there? Well, if the eight million doesn't mean anything to you, the thousand I stand to collect means plenty to me. I knew it was the right time, six o'clock, when I walked into the dining room of the Carlton Manor. Jonathan Franklin was having breast of guinea hen under glass and a white wine. Well, won't you sit down? I'll have the way to get you. No, no, thanks. Yeah. You look calm and relaxed, Mr. Shane. Success. Yes. Splendid. And Mary Ann. I found her. And her husband. Her husband? That's right. Oh, your boy is down at headquarters, Mr. Franklin. Headquarters? My boy? Yes, the champ. He talked when he came to. He got a little overeager after he trailed me to Halstead's beach house, and Halstead winged him. Oh. The way I figured, it wasn't a question of Marianne getting back to her father's home before her 25th birthday. No? This wine is delicious. 1929, so turn. No, it was a question of whether or not she'd reach her 25th birthday. And that's why you had me searching for her, to find her so you could have her killed before she did. Now, you're not going to spoil my dinner. You know, there's an old saying, Mr. Franklin, the foolish person eats himself into the grave. You, you say he talked? Yes. He told us why he'd been following me. So that if I found Marianne, he could kill her. He told us how he was sent to New York before I left. Oh, I should have guessed that, Mr. Franklin. It only takes ten minutes to get to the airport from here. Why make the charter for an hour later? You have a point, and there was only one person besides myself and Marianne who knew the address of Mady Carter in New York. Yeah. I should have thought of that, I suppose. You uh, finished with your dinner, Mr. Franklin? Yeah. Because if you are, there are some men waiting for you in the lobby. Homicide detail. You're spoiling my digestion, Mr. Shane. Doesn't matter, Mr. Franklin. From now on, you'll be eating crow. Hearty appetite. <laughs> Mike, what I can't understand is why Mr. Franklin was so eager to get his partner's money. He must have made the same amount himself. After all, eight million dollars. That's enough bait for anybody, sweetheart. With his appetite, maybe he needs 16 million to keep in groceries. Especially with prices the way they are today. <laughs> oh, Mike. Sugar, you're cute. Now, I eat your steak. And will you have a red wine served with it? Waiter, a sparkling burgundy. Domestic. Year of 1948. This is your director, Bill Russo, again. Our story is based on characters created by Brett Halliday. The music is composed and conducted by John Duffy, and Michael Shane is portrayed by Jeff Chandler. The New Adventures of Michael Shane is a Don W. Sharp production, transcribed in Hollywood and distributed exclusively by the Broadcasters Guild. Next week, you'll hear Michael Shane in another thrilling adventure from the mysterious and colorful New Orleans. in his hand didn't waver, and his pale blue eyes stared at me, unblinking, cold, and deadly. Then I saw his fingers start to tighten on the trigger, and I knew that in one more second my last case was due to be closed. The New Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Jeff Chandler. 
Michael Shane, reckless, red-headed Irishman, is back again in his old haunts in New Orleans. This is your director, Bill Russo, inviting you to listen to another transcribed episode, which we call The Case of the Constant Companion. is forgiven. Molly. <laughs> These personals. Ah, don't keep on waiting, George. Uh-uh. Right below it. Molly have left town, George. Man, that settles that. Yeah, let's see. Where the man says rain. Rain. <laughs> I should live so long. Hello. Huh? You might shame. Yeah, I... And here you come in. Sign in your office door, Susanna, right, did? Yeah. Well, have a seat. I want to hire you, Shane. Well, you know, it so happens I'm very available right now, Mr. Just Rill. call me Shorty. Okay, Shorty. What's the job? I want you to sort of take me under your wing, Shane. Take you under my wing? You're little enough, I guess, but I don't get it. What do you mean? Call it protection. Call it keeping me undercover. Call it anything you like. I see. Huh? Why? Why are you so anxious to keep undercover? Shane, lots of times movie stars like the travel incognito, they call it. Just pretend I'm a movie star. Very funny. You know, Shorty, I seem to detect a slight odor about this deal. And don't breathe. So part of your job is keeping me out of sight. The other part is finding a guy for me and taking me to him. They get Lasky's his name. Oh, is he a friend of yours? He used to be. Now, look, you're not... As soon as you take me to him, I'll be okay. Your job is done. Look, Shorty, the smell's getting worse by the minute. You still haven't told me why you want to keep out of sight. Shame. Two hundred bucks should answer a lot of questions, shouldn't it? Uh, You said two hundred bucks. I said two hundred bucks. Yeah. Yeah, I think two hundred would answer quite a few questions. For now, anyway. Yeah, two hundred. Don't worry, Shane. You'll earn every penny of it. In a moment, we'll be back to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the Constant Companion. Well, maybe someday I'll learn there's no such thing as easy money. I guess I forgot that the morning a little guy appropriately named Shorty laid 200 big bucks on my desk. According to Shorty, all I had to do was keep him out of sight and find a character named Big Ed Lasky for him. Of course, there was something about Shorty that chilled me a little. Maybe it was those very pale blue eyes of his or the thin-lipped mouth. But at the moment, the 200 was talking awfully loud, so I took the job. Okay, Shane. I'll give you a list of places Big Ed used to hang out. I'll wait here in your office while you see if you can locate him. Oh, just a minute. Hello? Well, we have Inspector Lefevre. How's everything down at Homicide? Dead. Oh, my, we're sharp this morning, aren't we? Well, what's on your tiny mind, Lefevre? At the moment, you. Oh, that's really sweet of you. You call me up to tell me not to leave town, or or maybe I'm suddenly chief suspect in a nice, juicy murder? Wrong twice. Just passing the word along, Shane. We're alerting everybody right down the line. Yeah, what about? There's a killer on the loose. Oh? Yeah, broke out of the penitentiary last night, a little guy. Well, thanks for the... Uh, what'd you say? He's a little guy, about 5'2", pale blue eyes, thin-lipped, heavy voice. Uh, yeah, yeah. Look, Inspector... His name is Shorty Crawford. Say it again. I said his name is Shorty. What's the matter, can't you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I heard you all right. Well, just passing the word along. Keep your eyes open for him, Shane. He's dangerous. I... I can believe it. Uh, Inspector... Yeah? Uh, skip it. I'll, I'll see you later. Well, as a matter of fact, yeah. Uh, so now you know about me. So now I know about you. Yeah, just as well, I guess. Now I'll have to change the plan a little. The plan? Yeah. Instead of waiting here in your office while you look for Big Ed, I'll come with you. Only we'll still have to keep out of sight while we're looking for him. Now look, Shorty, I just quit the job. Shane, 
I've been convicted of murder and sent up for life. I broke out, so now I'm on borrowed time. I'd have nothing to lose if I had to kill someone. Oh, look, I tell you, you're Also, not... I got a gun in my pocket that's been pointed at your wishbone ever since I've been into your office. It's going to stay pointed at you till we find Big Ed. It's going to go off the second you try to pull a fast one on me, so don't talk about quitting the job, Shane. Because believe me, it'd be the last job you ever have. <laughs> That left me nothing to say. After dark, we headed for a bar Shorty told me used to be a hangout of Big Ed's. Shorty had his hat pulled low over his eyes and left it that way as we went inside. The two of us walked up to the bar and Shorty stood with his face turned away. What'll it be, Mac? A uh, little information. Information? You want information? I got a desk down at the depot. We sell drinks here. What'll it be? You seen Big Ed lately? Who? Big Ed Lasky. You been around here lately? Like I said, what'll it be, bud? Now, about Big Look, Ed... Look, you've been out of circulation a while, Mac. He ain't been around for more than a year. Now, you want a drink, or don't you? Uh, never mind. Thanks. That's all right. Well, what next, Shorty? He's lying, Shane. Huh? The bartender was lying. How do you know? Look. Look over there. The booth near the wall. You see that doll sitting alone? Yeah, I... I see it. Not bad. It's Big Ed's girl. Oh. Look, she don't see us. We'll walk over the other side of the bar. Come on. What are you going to do? I'm going to slide into the booth next to hers. You sit down with her and see what you can find out about Big Ed. Oh, but I... I and remember, Shane. I'll be right in the next booth, so don't try anything. Okay, okay. We'll split up here. Okay, go on over. Hello, are you. Mind if I join? Yeah, a matter of fact, I do mind. Well, I'll join you anyway. Who are you, smart boy? Name is Shane. Mike Shane. So what do you want? The answer is no. Oh, don't get me wrong. Uh... Doris, I'm spoken for, Rover boy, so move on, huh? Oh, now look, sweetheart, I'm not trying to muscle in on Big Ed. I... What about Big Ed? Uh, it rings a bell, huh? Is he around anywhere? No. I see. You know, this booth was nice and comfortable before you got here. Let's make it comfortable again. Okay, sugar, okay. I'll see you around. I doubt it. I got up and started for the front door, but then Shorty caught my eye and motioned me to the side door. I guess he didn't want to walk in front of Doris's booth. Once we were outside, I turned to Shorty, but he just motioned me to start walking. We were near Jackson Square, so we walked over. The park was deserted. I sat down on one of the benches, and Shorty sat on another that backed up to mine. There we were, head to head. It was very cozy. Nice girl, Doris. Yeah. She's anything like Big Ed. She is. Uh, Big Ed's around somewhere that's a cinch. It's also a cinch. New Orleans is a big city. Where do we go next? I'm thinking. You say... Big Ed used to be a friend of yours. I worked for him once. Long time ago, huh? Before I went to the pen. Why are you so hot to me? What happens when we find it? Your job's over then. No, I, I mean... What... Your job's over then. Yeah. <sighs> well, it's a sense we're not going to find him tonight. How about escorting me back to my room so I can get a little shut-eye, huh? Maybe in the morning... Uh, we're gonna... Huh? There's not going to be any shut-eye. Are you kidding? No. And sleep after you find Big Ed for me, not before. You know, you can't get away with this for very long, Shorty. What do you mean? Look, you're an escaped killer. There's a dragnet out for you. So? So they'll get you sooner or later. After I found Big Ed, Shane, I won't care so much. Oh? Huh? Well, then think this one over. You're watching me like a hawk, aren't you, Shorty? Like a hawk, huh? Yeah, well, I'm going to be watching you like a hawk, too. I'm going to be waiting. Just waiting. Waiting for what? Sooner or later, you're going to get sleepy. You can't stay awake forever. One of these times, you're going to realize you're real tired. Your head's going to start nodding. Hey, you're going to drop your guard for a second. Just a second. Just long enough for me to jump you. I'll, I'll be waiting for that second, Shorty. Waiting. You through, Shane? Yeah. Just... Remember it, yeah. Well, do we 
Sit on these benches all night? No. I'll go back to your office. Okay. Coin a phrase, you're the boss. It's a long walk, you know. Uh, there's a taxi cruising down the next block. Call it. Yeah, man's getting a little more sensible. Taxi! Hey, taxi! Taxi! He heard you. Now, look. When he pulls up, you get in first. I follow you. Okay. Tell a driver to keep moving. We'll give him the address later. You got it? Yeah, I got it. Chain. I know. No tricks. Yeah. Yep. Okay, driver, get moving. Where to? Just get moving. I'll give you the address later. Okay. So long, shorty. Chain, stop! Chain, I hit the street, bounced to my feet, and hightailed it into the park. I figured Shorty wouldn't risk a shot from the cab, and I was banking on getting to the bushes before he could get the driver to stop. But just as I reached the bushes, a rugged-looking hand shot out and around my neck. Just a minute, Shorty. Hey, hey, let go of me, will you? I got a message for you from Big Ed. Look, I'm in a hurry. Let... You're looking for Big Ed. He doesn't want you to find him. It's a bullet for you if you do. Take your hands off me or... Forget I... about Big Ed, Shane. Maybe this will convince you. Oh! <laughs> In a moment, we'll be back to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the Constant Companion. It all started when a character named Shorty offered me 200 bucks to hide him out and find someone called Big Ed Lasky for him. While Shorty was in my office, Police Inspector Lefevre telephoned to tell me there was a killer on the loose. There was no doubt about the description he gave me. It was Shorty, all right. The little guy probably told me what would happen to me if I didn't go through with the deal. So we started out. And Shorty had that gun in his pocket trained on me full time. We didn't have any luck at the first bar we tried, but we did talk to Doris, Big Ed's girlfriend. And then later in the taxi, I figured I saw my chance. So just as the taxi pulled away, I opened the other door, dove out, and headed for the park. Only I didn't get far before a big baboon grabbed me, told me to forget about finding Big Ed. To emphasize his point, he hit me over the head. When I came to, I could see someone bending over me. It was short. Did you hear me, Shane? Mm. Yeah, yeah. You get this. There's only one thing that's keeping you alive, and that's the fact I want to get the big head bad. Otherwise, I'd plug you right now. Yeah, it couldn't make me feel much worse than I do. What happened? Oh, guy grabbed me, told me to forget big head, and he slugged me. Uh, probably one of big head's boys. Okay, Shane, this time nothing happens to you. But if you ever try to pull anything again, you're dead but quick. I'll go back to your office, and this time... We'll walk. Well, we finally got back to my office. and I was really beat. I slumped down on my chair and hoped I could catch a nap until morning. Shorty had other ideas. He didn't want me to get any sleep. Every time I dozed off, he'd nudge me. So, finally, I gave up. Just sat there for about ten cigarettes, waiting for daylight. And then at nine o'clock, we grabbed some breakfast, picked up a newspaper, and headed back to the park. We used the same seating arrangement as before. I was on one park bench, and Shorty was on another that backed up to mine. That morning sun hitting me was all I needed. I could barely keep my eyes open. Shorty seemed to be having the same kind of trouble. Read the headlines to me, Shane. Shane. Huh? You said read the headlines to me. Oh, okay. Escape killer still at large. Giant manhunt on for Shorty Crawford. Police dragged out of... That's enough. Yeah. All seems sort of far away. Far away from here. Hmm? Well, it's sun. Feels good, huh? Yeah, yeah. You know... You're not such a bad guy, Shane. Mm-hmm. It's 
Matter of fact, I... What did you say? Skip it. Hmm? Yeah. All of a sudden, I was wide awake. It was like somebody had just turned off a waterfall. The silence was deafening. I tried to see Shorty out of the corner of my eye. I didn't want to move my head, but I couldn't see his face. Couldn't tell whether he was asleep or not. I leaned forward, slow, very slowly, and then I started turning my head around. Finally, I could see his face. His head was slumped over on his chest, and he was dozing. I tensed up to dive at him, and then... Oh! Oh! Oh. Well, Shane, you were all set to grab me, weren't you? Yeah, I was all set. Good thing that car horn brought me out of it. Yeah. Shane! Hey, Shane! Hey, there's a guy getting out of that car. He's heading this way. I, I see him. Shane! Okay, Shane. Be a good boy. Real good. Yeah. Hey, Shane, you rooted in that park bench or something. I've been yelling. I know, Luffy. I also hug. I know that, too. Sour mood this morning, huh? Yeah. Who's your friend? Huh? I said, who's your friend on the bench behind you? Well, uh, I don't know, Inspector. Oh, well, that's my mistake. I thought I saw you talking to him when I got out of the car. Well, no. Well, what are you doing sitting in the park anyway? Business that bad for you? Man, well, it's not good right now. How about you? Oh, it's about the same. We're still after Shorty Crawford. No sign of him, huh? No, none yet. I got a hunch we're getting closer all the time. Well, that's good. Yeah. We'll nab him before long. Uh, what's the story on him, people? All I know is he was convicted of murder. Well, Shorty used to work for a guy named Big Ed Lasky. Oh? So an enemy of Big Ed's, Tom Dixon, wound up dead one day. Case was that Shorty killed Dixon. A few of the boys thought that Big Ed had hired Shorty to kill the guy, but nothing could be proved. And Big Ed had an alibi for himself as far as the actual killing was concerned, so Shorty was convicted. Oh. Well, like I told you before, Shane, keep your eyes open. Yeah. Uh, you do likewise, huh, Lefebvre? I always try to, Shane. See you later. You were getting on the thin ice there for a minute, Shane. Don't get conversational like that again. So that's your story, huh, Shorty? Big Ed hired you to kill a guy he didn't like, Tom Dixon. But maybe Big Ed didn't pay you for the job. Is that why you're trying to find him now? To collect? You can add it up that way if you want to, Shane. You might as well. I doubt if I could sell you my side of the story. You couldn't sell me anything, Shorty. That's what I thought. So I'm not wasting my time. Come on. Back to your office. <laughs> All the way back to the office, I was cussing out in a fever to myself. First, for honking his horn and waking Shorty just when I was going to grab him, and second, for standing there talking to me and not spotting Shorty. We walked into my office just in time for me to pick up the phone. Hello. Fever, Shane. Oh, you're a big help. Don't worry. I spotted Shorty sitting on the bench behind you. you well, now you tell me. Why didn't you... I had a hunch he had a gun under his arm pointed at you. I didn't want you to collect the slug. Look, is he still there in your office with you? Yeah, I... Stall him. We'll be there in 60 seconds. Who was it, Shane? Why, it was my landlady. What? She... My landlady. She forgot to say... You're lying. Look, I tell you, I'm... Let's get out of here. Oh, look, Shorty, I'm tired. Quiet. Look, you think I'm as fresh as a daisy? I've been awake for 24 hours longer than you have, and I'm still on my feet. Now get on yours. We're getting out of here. Well, why? I like it here. We're leaving. Now, let... Hey, wait a minute. Huh? No, Shorty, Shut up. Siren. You can't, so that's it. So you've been real smart, Shane. So you pulled a fast one. Now look, Shorty, you... Okay, Shane. So maybe they'll get me. But you'll go first. In a moment, we'll be back to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the Constant Companion. And Shorty's hand didn't wave. And his pale blue eyes stared at me, unblinking, cold and deadly. Then I saw his fingers start to tighten on the trigger. I knew that in one more second, my last case was due to be closed. Okay, Shane. It's payoff time for you. Shorty, I tell you, I didn't tip off anyone. Save it. You're on your way out, Shane, as a bright. Who's that? How would I know? Okay. I'm going over against the wall. 
Tell her whatever it is to come in. If it's a cops, I'll start shooting. Go ahead. Yeah. Come in. Hello, Shane. Oh, Big Ed's girlfriend, Doris. That's right. I got a message for you, Shane. Uh, look, uh, Big Ed already sent me a message last night with a blackjack. He hadn't heard about Shorty breaking out of the pen then, Shane. Didn't know why you were looking for him. Now I figure Shorty's hired you to find him. He's willing to give you 500 bucks to forget it. And if you... Too late, Doris. Shorty! Yes. Yeah. yeah, right behind you. Look, Shorty, you, you got him. You're going to take us to Big Ed, Doris. No, no, Shorty. Please, Shorty. You... You're going to take us to Big Ed. And right now. Go on, get moving. The three of us went down the back stairs and out the side door. Doris's face was the color of paste. I kept wondering what had happened to that siren we'd heard up in my office. But then, just as we were getting into Doris's car, I spotted a cop across the street giving a guy a ticket. So that was what the siren was about. Doris slid in behind the wheel. I got in front with her, and Shorty was in the back seat. I could hardly keep my eyes open. One look at Shorty told me he was almost ready to fall, too. Nobody said anything as she drove out to the edge of town and pulled up in front of a little house that was off by itself. We went up the path. Doris hesitated a minute, but Shorty prodded her with the gun, so she opened the door and went in. I was next in line. Shorty was bringing up the rear. Ed, I... Doris, tried... what's the matter with you? Why don't you bring Shane out here? Ed, I didn't hey, want... Hey, hey, you're the baboon who slug me in the park last Doris, night. you stupid. Hello, Ed. Shorty. Yeah. Don't move, Ed. Look, Shorty, Shut I... Shut up. Well, Ed... Finally got to you, didn't I? Look, Shorty, let's make a deal, huh? Too late for deals, Ed. Too late for anything. Shorty! I'll get to you in a minute, Doris. Okay, Ed. I'm going to kill you, you know that. No, Shorty, no. But first... Say it. Go ahead. Say it. Say what? What I broke out of the pen to hear you say. What I've been dragging this private eye all over to find you for, so you could say it. Say it. Uh, about about Tom Dixon. The guy that convicted me of killing. Spill it. You didn't kill him, Shorty. I did. What? Shorty, you... Yeah, go ahead, Ed. Spill some more. Talk. I killed Dixon. Doris faked an alibi for me. I... We framed you. Shorty, I didn't want Shut to have nothing. Shorty, you, you're innocent. Yeah. Nobody believes that, Shane. I tried to tell them before, but they had too good a case against me. Yeah, but... You don't uh, understand. You can't understand why I'd bust out of the pen. Risk my neck just to hear Big Ed squeal. Huh? Sure, I understand it. But look, Shorty, if you're innocent, we can... I told you. I told you nobody believed my story. Oh, it's different now. I just heard Ed confess. I tell you, it's too late. The only thing left to do is kill these two rats. One by one. No, I... No, Shorty, no. Just kill him, and it'll be all over. Then I can rest. Kill him first, then rest. I was so groggy from lack of sleep, it took me a couple of seconds to figure out what had happened. Then it hit me. Shorty was on the verge of falling. Yeah, the strain of the last few days had finally caught up with him. He was practically out on his feet. The gun in his hand started sagging, but my reflexes were sagging, too, and Big Ed beat me to the punch. He dove at Shorty and grabbed the gun. Oh, okay. Get back, Shane. Now, Shorty, we play it the other way. I threw it away. My chance to kill you. I threw it away. You'll never get another, Shorty. And you'll be next, Shane. You know too much about me now. Oh, look, Shut up! Okay, Shorty, here it is. The slug caught Shorty in the shoulder and spun him around. I dove at Ed, and before he could bring the gun around to me, my fist connected. Ed crumpled off. I looked around for Doris. She was nowhere in sight. I went to the door and pulled it open. Hello, Shane. Oh, Inspector Lefevre. You're a little late, aren't you? Maybe. Hey, a girl just ran out yeah. of here. She's in the squad car. Oh. Messy in here, isn't it? Yeah. Sure, he'll be okay, though. It's just a shoulder wound. 
Well, we'll get him back to jail. No, no, no. no. Wrong guy, my friend. Huh? There, there's your boy, Big Ed Lasky. Come again? Go to frame. Shorty's innocent. Now, that's real interesting, Shane. You got any proof? Mm-hmm. I heard Big Ed confess. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll fill you on the details later. Right now, this couch looks awful. Yeah, well, Shane, of... there's still a couple of things. Yeah, yeah, they, they can keep, Inspector. Look, I've been without sleep for two whole days. Shane, I've Go got... Go away, that... little man. Shane, I... Later, later. Uh, just, just one more thing with me. What is it? <sighs> Shane! <laughs> This is your director, Bill Russo, again. Our story is based on characters created by Brett Halliday and is written by Bob Wright. The music is composed and conducted by John Duffy, and Michael Shane is portrayed by Jeff Chandler. The New Adventures of Michael Shane is a Don W. Sharp production, transcribed in Hollywood and distributed exclusively by the Broadcasters Guild. the door softly closed behind me. Without turning around, I knew it had been a trap. Then I heard another sound. A gun was slowly being cocked. And I realized that this was the end of the line. Payoff time. Yeah, little Mike had finally solved the case. The hard way. Adventures of Michael Shane, private detective, starring Jeff Chandler. Michael Shane, reckless, red-headed Irishman, is back again in his old haunts in New Orleans. This is your director, Bill Russo, inviting you to listen to another transcribed episode, which we call The Case of the Corresponding Courts. Have a seat, Mr. Lima. Oh, thank you, Mr. Shane. It was good of you to wait for me in your office this evening to see me. Oh, you sounded pretty upset over the phone. Oh, I am, senor, I am. It is all so bewildering, I do not know what to do, where to turn. Then the thought occurred to me that perhaps someone like you could help me. Well, you're not the only one who's bewildered, Lima. Uh, senor? I'm in the dark, too. You still haven't told me what this is all about. All you said over the phone was you wanted to see me right away. Ah, oh, but of course. You must excuse me, senor Shane. It is just that I have been so upset. Mm-hmm. You see... I flew up from Havana this morning. Oh, is that your home down there? Yes, it is. I have extensive holdings in and around Havana and have lived there for a little more than two years now. You up here in New Orleans on a vacation? Oh, no, indeed, senor. I came up because of my friend Julian. His last letter sounded so urgent, I felt I must... Look, Lamer, do me a big favor, will you? Why, of course, senor. What is it? Start from the beginning. I'm way behind. Oh, but of course, senor. Now, you live in Havana. Yes. You have a friend here in New Orleans named Julian. Yes. What about him? I have not seen Julian since I went to Havana. And then I have not heard from him. And then suddenly yesterday I received a letter from him saying he was in danger. He wanted me to come up here right away. Uh-huh. Is he in danger? Julian? Well, that's what we're talking about, isn't it? Oh, of course, senor. Uh, now, remember, I received this letter from Julian only yesterday. You said that once. Uh, when you... I arrived here, I went at once to Julian's address. And, senor Shane, it is impossible. I cannot believe it. Can't believe what? Senor, they told me Julian has been dead. For two years. In a moment, we'll return to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the corresponding corpse. Well, I like to think I've heard just about everything. When a little character named Lima waltzed into my office from Havana and told me he'd just gotten a letter from a man who'd been dead for two years... I must admit it rocked me back a little. Judging from the expression on Lima's face, the whole experience had rocked him. 
And plenty. I tell you, it is not possible Julian is dead, Mr. Shane. There must be some mistake. Well, look, Lane, well, maybe somebody else wrote that letter to you. No, no, no. Julian was my friend. I knew his handwriting like I know my own. And the things he said in his letter proved to me beyond all doubt that it was Julian who was writing. Mm. Well, in that case, it looks like your friend's alive now. But, but no, senor. They tell me he's dead. Well, now, look, he can't be both. Well, I know it sounds insane, senor. But it is impossible Julian is dead. And yet, they tell me it is impossible for him to be alive. Just a minute. Uh, now, that is where you come in, Senor Shane. Me? Yes. I want to hire you to try and find Julian, if he, uh, as I still hope, is alive. And uh, and if he is uh, dead, then I want you to find out that, too. Uh, here is my telephone number. I don't know. It looks like a pretty crazy assignment. Uh, <clears throat> for a hundred dollars. I'd find the job not half so crazy. Uh-huh. Okay, give me the address where Julian used to live, then drop in here at the office tomorrow. I may have something for you. Of course, I wasn't nearly as sure of that as I sounded. The next morning, I went to the address Lehman had given me, the place where his friend Julian had lived. It was a little ramshackle two-story building near the waterfront. On the first floor were two shops, and up above them were a few furnished rooms. One of the shops had a sign over the door which read, Yi Fung, Tropical Fish. Not a very nice thing to say about yourself. I went in, and a chubby little gent with horn-rimmed glasses and a broad grin waddled up to me. Ah, so, good morning. You'd like buy some fine tropical fish? Uh, no, what I want is a little tropical information. Yes, I have many good guppies. See, all thanks to left, guppies. Yeah. Yeah, lots of guppies. Now, uh... Yes, everybody buy guppies. Uh, not quite. Now, look, a guy named Julian used to live up over the shop. Yes, you like guppies? Well, I haven't anything against them, but about this Julian... Yes, uh, yes, giant ancestor. Yeah, how long ago? Yes, you like buy some guppies? No, I don't like to buy some guppies. How long ago did Julian die? One, two years ago. What happened to him? Yes, uh, do not know. One day they tell me he is dead. Ah, so... Mister, you sure... No you... guppies! <laughs> The king of the guppies bowed me gracefully to the door and out. The shop next door also had a sign out front. This one read, A. Valdane, Passport Service. Inside, a tall, thin gent sitting on a high stool greeted me as I stepped through the door. Come in, my friend, come in. A. Valdane at your service. Perhaps a little passport information? Not today. Expert passport photos, too reasonable. Uh Uh-uh. What I want is... Information. uh... Oh, how's your... The walls, my friend. You're the first man who, to my knowledge, has ever walked out of the place next door without a bowl full of guppies. <laughs> you know, Seltzer, for a moment it looked like Yi Fung was going to keep his record intact. Well, you probably heard what or who I was talking about then, the, the guy named Julian. <laughs> you too, hmm? What do you mean? There was a loony little guy in here yesterday claiming Julian was alive. Oh, Lima. Look, did you know Julian very well? No, only slightly. He lived in one of the rooms upstairs. That's about all I knew about him. And there's no doubt about his death, huh? Not as far as I know. How did Julian die? Well, Julian was quite a water lover. He used to go out on a little boat a lot. One night, a storm came up out in the Gulf. The next morning, they found Julian's boat floating upside down. No Julian. No Julian ever since. Did uh, anyone actually see him drown? Who's running around during storms watching people drown? Yeah, you got a point there. Look, did you know any of Julian's friends who he ran around with? Anything like Well, like I say, I didn't know him very well. He had a girl whose name was Celeste. They used to hang out at Maxim's Bar a lot. Okay, anyone else? Not that I can... No, no, no. Wait. I, I did see Julian talking to the professor a couple of times. The professor? You mean the old drifter over on Exchange Street? Yes, that's the one. Character who knows just about everyone. We'll gladly tell you all about them for the price of a drink. Mm-hmm. Oh, thanks, Valtain. <laughs> I headed for Maxim's Bar, where Valdane had said Celeste and Julian used to spend some time. On the way, I got the feeling I was being followed, but I couldn't spot anyone. I don't know, maybe it was just my imagination. When I got to Maxim's, I asked a bartender about Celeste. Found out she dropped in almost every day. So I sat down at a table and waited. About an hour later, a girl who answered the bartender's description of Celeste came in and sat down. I eased over to her table. Hello. Hello. Can I join you? Why not? Thanks. You, uh, used to be Julian's girlfriend, huh? Yeah. 
All right, go ahead. Have your fun. Well, I'm afraid I don't get it. What are you trying to do? Make me feel like a big heel or something? Yeah, hey, look, Celeste. Sure, I play up to the boys now, you and the others. A girl's got to to get along. Well, I was Julian's girl. Don't you forget that. Sure, I was his girlfriend. What do you think I've been trying to forget for two years? Him, Julian. Now, you come along and throw his name up to me. And... Look, Celeste, I'm not trying to make you feel like a heel, and I'm sorry if mentioning his name's made you feel bad. Julian's not alive now. Are you kidding of course he's not alive. He's been dead for two years. That's all I wanted to know, Celeste. Thanks. I was beginning to think Valdane knew what he was talking about when he said Lima was slightly off his trolley for thinking Julian was still alive. But I still had that other lead Valdane had given me, the professor over on Exchange Street. I found the professor at his usual corner, sitting on a packing crate, holding forth to a few bewildered floaters. He was a scarecrow of a man, dressed as always in a dilapidated cutaway coat, open-toed shoes that weren't designed that way, and a wing collar with no tie. And so I say, gentlemen, that the curse of our age, our civilization, is our mechanistic, high-speed, materialistic approach. Aesthetics is a forgotten word. The love of beauty for its own sake has paled before the ruthless march Hello, of... Hello, Professor. Mr. Shane, how do you do, sir? Indeed, it's been quite some time since you last visited this humble thoroughfare. Yeah, still educating the masses, huh? Yeah, yes, trying in my own feeble way to impart some small yearning for the higher things into the unfortunate souls. A, a discouraging task, to be sure. Uh, look, could I talk to you a minute? Certainly, certainly. We will discuss this subject further at some later date, gentlemen. I must now grant a private audience to my friend here. Will you join me on this humble crate, Mr. Shane? Uh, or shall we adjourn to more comfortable surroundings where we may, uh, perchance, uh, partake of some small but cheering... Uh, uh, I want your answers to make sense. We stay here. I question greatly the merits of your decision, but will yield temporarily to your puritanism. What is it you want? You remember a guy named Julian? Julian? Of course I do. A charming scoundrel and a generous one. In the old days, he used frequently to purchase cheering libations for me in return for small but useful bits of information which I was able to deliver. Yeah, yeah. Look, what did Julian do for a living anyway, Professor? Mr. Shane, it was not what Julian did for a living. It was whom he did. Oh, I see. Julian was quite a boy to work all the angles, huh? His talents along those lines were tremendous. Uh, he had a small but efficient organization and based a very successful career on assorted projects such as blackmail, connivery, forgery, and an entire line of bunco enterprises, which showed Julian to be a man of great imagination. Hmm. Any of Julian's old outfits still around? I have heard one of them is. Uh, I don't know. And Julian? My dear sir, Julian died two years ago. Yeah. You don't have any reason for thinking otherwise? Certainly not. Okay, Professor, thanks. Not at all, Mr. Shane. I'm always glad to help, even if at some discomfort to myself. What do you mean? Well, simply that I suffer from a peculiar condition of the throat. Excessive conversation, uh, particularly when helpful information is involved, uh, dries out the delicate membranes and causes... Yeah, it. yeah. Okay, Professor, here you are. I accept your voluntary contribution, sir, not merely for myself, but in the name of all disconsolate and thirsty humanity. And I thank you. So now I was fresh out of Leeds. I'd gotten nowhere. Lima was waiting for me in my office, and when I told him that as far as I was concerned, the case was closed, his face fell a mile. But, Senor Shane, you cannot mean that you, you, will not help me anymore. Look, Lima, Julian died two years ago. So a couple of days ago, you, you say you got a letter which you think was written by him. I do not think. I know. Yeah, yeah. L look, there's something I don't quite get about you. You say you and Julian were friends. Yet from what I hear, Julian was quite an unsavory character. Blackmail, bunco, etc. I, uh, well, perhaps Julian was a little weak where money was concerned. But he was always a good friend to me. And there's another angle about this that interests me too, Lima. You told me you suddenly acquired some holdings in Cuba a couple of years ago. And Julian was a blackmailer. What are you talking about? You, uh, got those holdings legitimately, I'm sure. Well, of course I did. Mr. Shane, I'm not hiding you to make foolish insinuations about me, but to find Julian. You're absolutely right. And I'm telling you, Julian's dead. No, no, please. You must keep looking. Look, it's no use, Lima. Please, Mr. Shane. Please, I beg of you. Money is no objection with me. You, you must keep on looking for Julian. You sure have a lot of faith that he's alive. Okay, I'll take one more crack at it. 
I went back to the waterfront and into Val Dane's passport place. I was hoping there might be some other lead he could give me, something he'd forgotten before. He just laughed at me. So I left. And then as I was walking along the sidewalk, a little character sidled up to me. Shane? Huh? Yeah, who are you? You're looking for Julian, Shane? Julian? I was, but no more. Why? Why no more? Because it's sort of silly to look for a dead man. You're wrong, Shane. Julian's alive. What? I'm telling you, Julian's alive. I saw him with my own eyes. Only yesterday. In a moment, we'll return to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the corresponding corpse. <laughs> It all started when a little guy named Lima from Havana told me he'd gotten a letter from a friend of his, Julian, here in New Orleans, saying he was in trouble and asking Lima to come up. When Lima arrived in New Orleans, they told him Julian had been dead for two years. He didn't believe it, so he hired me to find Julian. I went to the address where Julian used to live, a two-story building with two shops downstairs and some rooms upstairs. Yi Fang, who sold tropical fish, said Julian was dead. So did a gent named Valdane, who ran a passport service next door. Celeste, Julian's girlfriend, and the character called the professor were also unanimous that Julian was dead. So there I was, walking along the sidewalk, ready to give the whole thing up when a little guy sidled up to me fast. I'm giving it to you straight, Shane. Julian's alive. Look, how, who are you anyway? What's your angle? Well, just call me Joey and put it down on a pallet, Julian's. Now, I heard it around you've been looking for him. So I thought that maybe there might be something in it for him. Uh, and for me, of course, I could tell you where to find him. Look, there'll be plenty in it for both of you if I find him. Well... Okay, I'll take a chance. When I bumped into Julian yesterday, he wrote his address down on a piece of paper for me. Here it is. Okay, thanks. Incidentally, have you by any chance been following me around the last day or two? Me? No. Why? I'll skip it. Thanks for the information. I took the piece of paper and compared it with a sample of Julian's handwriting Lima had given me. It matched. I headed for the address on the piece of paper. And again, on the way over, I had the feeling I was being followed. But like before, I couldn't spot anyone. Julian's address turned out to be just a block away from the place where he used to live. The door to the room was ajar, so I pushed it the rest of the way open and went in. Yeah, there was someone in the room, all right. But it wasn't Julian. Uh, What are you doing here? Well, Julian's girlfriend, Celeste. So maybe Julian isn't as dead as you tried to make me think before, huh? I don't know what Come you're on, talking about. Come on, quit stalling. I... Come on. All right. But I was telling you the truth before. I I didn't know then that Julian was alive. Just an hour ago, he called me and told me to meet him here. I came right over. He was here, Julian, my Julian. Where is he now? Well, he said he had some things to do, that he'd meet me later at Maxim's bar. Why do you want to know these things? Who are you? And it doesn't what do you... matter who I am. You've already told me what I want to know. Just one more thing. What size guy is Julian? Why... He's short. A short guy, huh? Okay, Celeste. Thanks a lot. And all of a sudden, the trail had gotten very hot. I went down the stairs and outside, and as I started down the sidewalk, I was thinking about what Celeste had told me, that Julian was a short guy. I started checking off the people I'd been running around with lately. The professor and Valdane, both tall men. And Lima, Yi Fang, King of the Guppies, and Joey, the guy who'd slipped Julian's new address in my hand a little while ago, they were all short guys. And then I remembered my feeling about being followed. So I decided to find out who it was. I turned a corner, slipped into an alley, and waited. I waited 15 minutes, but nobody came along. So I finally gave up and went into the store next door and over to the payphone. Lima, this is Shane. Well, looks like you were right after all. Yeah, yeah, about Julian being alive. Now, now, look, calm down, will you? Look, meet me at my office in 15 minutes, and I'll tell you all about it. I went outside and continued down the street. As I approached Julian's old address, I spotted Yi Fong and Valdane both lounging around in front of their shops. Ah, so happy gentlemen maybe would like to buy some fine... Oh, so is you. Well, you don't sound very happy about it. I do not like people who do not like fine guppies. Look, I told you I've got nothing against guppies. I just... 
Oh, skip. Still running around looking for dead men, Shane? Yeah, Valdane. Only suddenly one of them isn't so dead anymore. Julian? <laughs> Don't tell me he's come to life. Don't be too surprised if he did. I'd be very surprised. You know, you sound awfully sure about him being dead. Do I? Well, I didn't kill Julian, if that's what you mean. Didn't know him well enough. Matter of fact, if you're really interested, I wasn't even around when he died. Oh? For the last couple of years, up until a few weeks ago, I've been sort of a, a guest of the state, shall we say. Penitentiary, huh? Well, if you want to put it crudely, yes. Well, I'll tell Julian hello for you when I see him, Valdane. That may be before long. Fifteen minutes later, I pulled up in front of my office. I climbed the stairs and went in. I was expecting that Lima would be waiting for me, but he was nowhere in sight. Then I spotted it on my desk. A little slip of paper. I picked it up and read it. Shane, I've learned that you are looking for me and I want to talk to you. Come to my old address at once and wait for me there. Julian. Yeah, Julian, at last. I slipped the note in my pocket and waited a while for Lima, but he didn't show up. So about 9 p.m., I went over to Julian's old address. Both Yi Fong and Valdane's places were closed for the night. I went up the rickety outside stairway, in the door, and down the hall to the door at the end. Julian's old room. He told me to wait for him. That meant he wouldn't be there yet. The door was unlocked. I opened it and went in. The room looked lived in. Not like it had been vacant for two years. Then I heard the door softly close behind me. Without turning around, I knew it had been a trap. Then I heard another sound. A gun was slowly being cocked. And I realized this was the end of the line. Payoff time. Yeah, little Mike had finally solved the case the hard way. In a moment, we'll be back with a thrilling climax to tonight's Michael Shane adventure. Well, there I was in Julian's old room with a gun at my back and a pretty strong hunch as to who was holding that gun. One look over my shoulder told me my hunch was right. Hello, Shane. You can turn around now. Hello, Valdez. So you're my boy, hmm? I'm afraid it's the other way around, my friend. You're my boy. Yeah. Well, it was beginning to add up to you, Valdez, once I got all the figures together. Huh? Just what were the figures, Shane? Figure one. Lima suddenly comes into extensive holdings in Cuba two years ago. Now, just suppose it hadn't been quite legal that he'd hired someone like Julian, for example, to help him. Maybe a little forgery to help him acquire those holdings. Well, well. You added the first column of figures very accurately. Thanks. So then maybe Lima starts getting blackmailed by the guy who'd done the forgery for him. What Lima never knew was that Julian had a few boys working for him. That it was one of those boys who'd done the forgery, not Julian. A boy named Valdain. You're a little sharper than I thought, Shane. I hadn't figured you'd tumble to that. Well, you very obligingly tipped me off to it a little while ago. I did? Mm-hmm. You told me you'd been in jail for the last couple of years. You just got out a couple of weeks ago. Lima told me he hadn't heard from Julian for two years until he got that letter a few days ago. So it added up that the letter supposedly from Julian was actually written by you, just as you'd written the other blackmail notes before you went to prison. Well, I can see I did the right thing when I decided to put you out of the way, Shane. You were getting too close to me. That was pretty neat, too, Valdane, the way you... And you're getting too close to me now. Get back, Shane. The way you hired Joey to tell me Julian was alive. And you even got Celeste to help you. Yes. Yes, I've been keeping her consoled in the absence of Julian. She very obligingly left that note in your office telling you to come here. Well, that's just about the story, Shane. You stalled all you're going to. Well, it was worth a try. Incidentally, was it you who was following me while I made the rounds looking for Julian? No, it was I. Lima. Hey. Drop that gun, Valdez. Drop it. Now. Lima, how'd you know to come here? Very simple. When you telephoned me to meet you at your office, I went there and found the note signed Julian, telling you to come here. I came over right away, and I've been waiting in the next room. Oh, look, Lima, Julian really is dead. I know that, senor. Huh? I, I killed him two years ago. You what? Lima. Don't move, Valdez. <laughs> I thought Julian was the one who had done the forgery for me and was blackmailing me. I did not know there were men working for him. I killed him and the blackmail note stopped. Then when I got another one last week in the same handwriting, I realized it had not been Julian after all. 
I came to New Orleans. You hired me to find Julian and then followed me, huh? Yes. I hope that in your investigation you would uncover a member of Julian's organization, the real blackmailer. And you did? It is Valde. Lima, I, I, I won't blackmail you anymore. I, I swear. It, it is too I... late for that, Valde. It is too late for you to do anything but die. I started trying to circle around toward Lima, but I never got there. Valdane dove at him about then, but too late. The slug caught Valdane in midair and flopped him down on the floor. He lay still. Lima stood there for maybe 30 seconds, alternately looking down at Valdane and then up at me. There was a faint suggestion of a smile on his face. Not a very pretty smile. Then finally he turned to me and took a step toward me. So? Now look, Lima. You are next, Senor Shane. Your job is done. And mine will shortly be finished also. Now, wait a minute. I will not wait. It will be not. I... Who is making noise and frightening guppies, please? Get back. I should get away from you. Thanks, you bum. Thanks a lot. I do not understand, please. What is commotion all about? You know, you just did me a big favor, Yifang. You took Lima's eyes off me just long enough for me to clip him. But I do How'd not... How'd you happen to come barging up here anyway? I live back of shop downstairs. Suddenly, I hear big noise from upstairs. I do not like guppies to be frightened. I run up to see what causes big noise. You got here just in time to stop another big noise, too. I have become very enraged when guppies are frightened. Well, you know something? I'm glad you do. Look, Yifang, do me a favor, huh? Sell me about a dozen of those guppies of yours first thing in the morning. Ah, so very happy to hear, Sam. You finally decide you like guppies. Oh, you converted me, brother. Here, from now on, I'm an ardent guppy fan. Believe me. This is your director, Bill Russo, again. Our story is based on characters created by Brett Halliday and written by Bob Reif. The music is composed and conducted by John Duffy, and Michael Shane is portrayed by Jeff Chant. The New Adventures of Michael Shane is a Don W. Sharp production transcribed in Hollywood and distributed exclusively by the Broadcasters Guild.